All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Sorry for the technical um, errors, we're ready. And I would like to call the August 6, 2020 school board meeting to order. Can we all rise and say the pledge to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, right, thank you. So before we adopt tonight's, uh, make a motion to adopt tonight's agenda, I wanted to make a couple of notes. There were two carry-in items on the consent agenda that were sent over to you earlier today, so just wanna make sure all the board members have received that. And then in addition, um, due to the amount of community comments we have and anticipation for our conversation, we're gonna go ahead and table the parent annual survey until September, and also we're gonna remove the approval of agreement with. Um, the office assistance. So can I have a motion to adopt tonight's agenda with the removal of those two items? Uh, Christine, thank you very much. Is there a second? Oh, Lisa, thank you. Um, uh, we will move to a roll call vote. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. We have an agenda this evening. Um, and we're gonna start off tonight's meeting with community comments. And so um, as the board continues to operate under Minnesota Statute 13D.02, um, to one, um, we wanted to acknowledge that we're still meeting virtually to accommodate um, every, all of our presenters, as well as in, in addition, everybody in the boardroom here, we have presenters, we have an AV team, um, we have a few board, um, well, me board member, Dr. Peterson, Carrie, um, and also we have two uh, sign language interpreters. So just wanted to acknowledge our AV team for putting this together and um, we're gonna continue. Um, today's meeting uh, with our community comments. We wanted to do this virtually because this also gives the community an opportunity to provide their feedback to us virtually rather than in, in the pandemic coming to the DSC to voice their opinion during community comments. So um, we wanted to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to everybody who has sent in their comments over the past couple of days. Um, the emails that have been sent to our, our board email account were roughly about 300. And then in addition, we have about 150 community comments. So. Um, we will we we're going to stay with our typical our normal practices of how we operate our community comments and um, we are going to have carrie read those comments that were submitted by google form or that were emailed directly to carrie so um carrie would you like to start with community comments right. thank you madam chair as madam chair said we have received nearly 200 community comments as of late this afternoon submitted via email to me and submitted through a form on the website as Madam Chair explained, in the interest of everyone's time, we have grouped the emails together when they were similar in content, and we are showing slides on the screen for those topics for which we had submissions from multiple community members. Our first subject tonight um, are thank yous. We did receive some of those. Um, there were several comments that were primarily thank yous to the board. Uh, here's one example. Lisa Lewis of Minnetonka says, I just wanted to say that as a teacher and a parent, I appreciate all the work that you are doing to ensure that all students, staff, and families are safe and are learning well. I appreciate your work and your support of us as teachers, as this is not an easy task. Please know that despite any negativity you may experience now or in the future, that we appreciate the difficulty of your task and we thank you. Jessica Thule um, from Wyzetta submitted a similar comment. The next topic is HVAC, air quality, and environmental concerns. We had several comments around those issues. First of all, Catherine Gimsey of Chanhassen says, can you please provide a detailed report of each school building's HVAC system, including the age of the systems at each school? Please provide detailed information about improvements that have been made at each building in preparation for teaching and learning during the pandemic how the district plans to meet the guidelines regarding HVAC ventilation and filtration set by the CDC, 
and how you can ensure the safety of students and teachers gathering in rooms with no windows or windows that don't open. Will teachers be provided high quality portable air filtration systems in situations where they can't open their windows or have no windows? During the winter season, will all teachers have access to portable air filtration systems in their rooms? Erica Gregor of Loretto says, I am at the Minnewashta building, I teach second grade. My classroom does not have air conditioning. Will that be taken into consideration when thinking of an environment that will make it difficult to wear masks and will also lack proper airflow during the first few weeks of school? Rhonda Van Bergen submitted a comment similar to the one that I just read. The next subject is personal protective devices. Mary Leaf of Minneapolis asks, regarding masks and face shields, my daughter is an epidemiologist with the Massachusetts Department of Health. I asked her about the effectiveness of wearing a face shield. She said a face shield alone is not effective. It must be worn with a mask for adequate protection. The shields are meant to keep your eyes and the exterior of the mask from contamination as people tend to touch their masks while wearing them and then touch their eyes. Maggie Schmidt of Minnetonka says, concern about masks for my five-year-old kindergartner. It seems it will limit their ability to participate and see the facial expressions of others, which is key for this age. Shields or dividers would be better. Concern about no counselors at Groveland, especially during this time. Concern if a child has a temperature. Are they given a COVID test at school or can the parent come and get them and take them to the doctor? Do they wear masks on the playground? My child overheats easily and gets frequent bloody noses, so concern with masks on the playground. The next topic is full e-learning support. Jeff Hafner of Deep Haven says, options for 2020, 2021. I cannot currently support a full opening or a hybrid opening of our schools, and I believe that we keep kids safest when we keep them at learning online. I believe the arguments for getting students back into school buildings are based on the wrong metrics and do not take into account the actual risks of viral infection and spread. Students and teachers will get sick in full or hybrid scenarios, and those infections will increase the level of sickness in our community. This puts the district at greater risk of requiring an emergency response rather than a planned one. Any social gains that may be at the root of a full or a hybrid plan will be quickly lost if students are sent home unexpectedly. Keeping our district buildings empty would allow small and targeted group learning such as special ed, tutoring, labs, etc. Our community does not need another issue over which to be divided. Widely opening schools to some forces, others to choose between their forces others to choose between their personal safety and their learning opportunities. The following people submitted similar comments to that. Anthony Allenen of Minnetrista, Yvette Webster of Minneapolis, Mark, excuse me, Mike Anderson, Jeremy Frank of Minnetonka, Eric Beal of Excelsior, Carrie Harmon of Minnetonka, Oscar Hafnar Orange, Allison DeGrood, Jessica Kuhn, and Lacey Hladke. The next subject is full e-learning concerns or suggestions. Kristen Viger of Excelsior says, Thank you for carefully considering what school will look like for the children in the Minnetonka School District this coming year. As a family, we have decided it is in our best interest to choose a full-time e-learning track for the coming school year. It is not because we are scared of getting sick, but that we can better control potential disruptions to our children's daily schedules and learning by providing them with a constant known daily plan. I know that Minnetonka is committed to providing the e-learning track for those families who opt for this route but I want to make sure that the e-learning that is provided to students utilizes the best tools and teachers available. Our experience with e-learning last spring was a band-aid and simply a time filler. My children were often spending more time and effort trying to get their finger to write answers on a scanned image of a worksheet than they were using their brains to actually solve problems and learn. The technology and learning management software that Minnetonka currently utilizes was not meant to deliver education full time and the ability of the teachers to use the technology and teach in that manner varied greatly depending on the individual. Each school across the district provided their students a very different experience and each classroom within those schools operated differently. I understand the challenges behind a quick fix in the spring, but some schools just seem to do it better than others and that needs to be fixed going forward. 
I strongly urge the district to invest in a vetted online learning system and employ teachers experienced in this method of teaching in order to offer a valuable and quality experience for all students. The district should totally rethink the way lessons are delivered. All students of the same grade level or course level district-wide should be receiving a lesson together and teachers and support staff should act as tutors to support the learning separately. There is no need to be piecing out the overall lessons in a small classroom fashion in an online learning environment. It is redundant and inefficient. There are other online learning academies that do this full time. And if Minnetonka cannot provide the same or better level of education we can get elsewhere, I am prepared to move my children to a different district who can provide a more effective learning experience. Chelsea Jordan of Chanhassen and Janet of Minnetonka submitted similar statements. The next subject, fully open option concern. Shelley Fredrickson of Shorewood says, Dr. Osterholm, our nation's leading coronavirus expert from the University of Minnesota, stated on August 3rd, 2020, that the virus is very widespread and will next threaten the Midwestern state's ability to contain its spread, similar to the situation recently seen in the Southern states. My question for the board, why open schools and spend the money and resources to only then have to close soon after? Look to St. Louis Park school plan where they have decided to adopt a remote learning plan and then reassess in October. Like Osterholm said in his news conference, the virus will spread like wildfire if people get together. Social distancing plans and plans to wear masks are part of the possible school opening plans, but you cannot expect kids to follow them and therefore risk the spread of the virus. Please consider full remote learning until a vaccine is available and then return to full in-person learning. Many parents and educators and children in our district have underlying health conditions. It would be sad to see deaths in our district. Thank you. Jessica Orange of Deep Haven and Seth and Laura Boyd submitted similar comments. The next subject, fully open option support. Ellen Bednar says, I do hope you consider a full on in school option for the parents who desire this for their children, please. While the teachers did an A plus effort and job last school year, once we went completely online, the format and medium makes it especially hard for students with special needs to learn at their most optimal and best potential. Also, those students who are in Spanish, Chinese immersion would benefit tremendously from in class versus virtual in my opinion. Thank you sincerely for the kind consideration. Similar comments were submitted by Karen Hroma of Minnetonka, Shu Wang, Minnetonka, Christine Edelfson, Minnetonka, Alexander Zubkoff, Excelsior, Jill Knight of Minnetonka, Todd Simning of Chanhassen, Erica Deed of Excelsior, Sarah Weiss, Minnetonka, and Cole Waller of Minnetonka. The next subject is hybrid support or suggestions. Ben Snyder of Chanhassen says, we should really focus on ensuring that younger children are in school as often as possible. Younger kids, K-5, are impossible to teach remotely for homes with two full-time working parents. They're also the most vulnerable in terms of their long-term educational needs being neglected and negatively impacted via remote learning. Thank you. Andy Potter of Maple Grove says, after reading through all the plans, I strongly believe that option five with the adjusted schedule for elementary is the best option for the following reasons. For starters, this plan works. How do I know? I know because I have lived this plan on a smaller scale while teaching a summer program of a small group of students three days a week at the Excelsior Methodist Church for the past five weeks. Just like option five, we have two different groups of students, morning and afternoon. We take all safety precautions, masks, regularly sanitizing, distancing, and the students have continued to show up week after week, even though it is not the same as it has been in past summers, meaning they can't play as much or interact as much. Secondly, the face-to-face -face interaction is much needed for students and staff, and there's been no better rush of dopamine this summer than hearing six and seven year olds say Mr. Potter because they are as excited to see me as I am to see them. Translation, this option will be a much needed boost to the mental well-being of both students and staff. 
Third, the adjusted hours of 7.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. for the elementary groups of students will give teachers enough time to teach the core subjects in person and will require that we make those three hours more meaningful than they have ever been, which is a challenge we are up to. In addition, the shortened amount of time also provides less of an opportunity for primary students to begin to tune out or get antsy. But above all else, and I cannot stress this enough, this is the one option, the only option out of all of them that has actually been tested during the pandemic and has proven to work. Unlike e-learning this summer, we have not had a single parent complain or take issue with the instruction we are providing, the attention the students are getting, the safety measures we have in place, and the quality of what we are providing. Avantika Sharma of Minnetonka says, option four, hybrid B, option for our kids. K3 are least at risk and need to be with teachers and a proper educational system. Kindergartners are new to the school system and need to be there full time to get the exposure and adjustment and learning. They need the motivation and socializing every day to get accustomed to school. K3 are the youngest kids and learn better at school rather than in front of iPads. If the base is strong at learning, they'll be just fine in the years to come. If the base is weak, they will always lack behind in the higher grades. Teachers help for a strong base, which no parent or e-learning can sitting at home. Doctors too recommend not more than one hour of screen time for kids these ages, and with iPad education, it's not good for their eyes. It really strains the retina of the eye badly at that age. Seeing the age groups and the least risk students, it is the best option to have K3 start full time. Rest assured, we are sure whatever the school decides will be at the best interest of students and parents. We have full trust in that. Allie Lee O'Halloran of Minnetonka says, first, a thank you to all who worked on these models. I do think priority should be in getting elementary and special ed students back to physical school. For older students, I'd like to propose consideration of dividing the middle schools and the high school into sections in areas that are easier to clean, such as the cafeteria, the port, gyms, the auditorium, etc. Not for in-person classes, but for rotating class, not involving the full class. Meetings such that members of the school community have a socially safe way to see their teachers and their peers. This might be considered optional as no schooling goes on, it is more of a mental health check-in and a way to reiterate that we are still a school community. My hope is that this reduces the number of students congregating outside of classrooms in the community if there is a known mechanism for minimal interaction, albeit still distanced. Thank you. Similar comments were received from Valerie in Excelsior, Alyssa DeGiff of Minnetonka, James Duffy of Chanhassen, Caleb Schultz of Minnetonka, Genevieve robillard Najus, Minneapolis, Mary Sweetman of Minnetonka, and Amy Ballou of Deep Haven. The next subject, hybrid concern, questions, or suggestions. Michelle Johnson of Deep Haven says, I am very appreciative for the hard work put in by those who explored each of these options. I am very concerned, however, about option seven and the slant toward more in-school days for immersion for grades four and five. My son is going into fourth grade English at Deep Haven. I can assure you that English parents will be enraged should this become a reality. It could be considered discriminatory actually against ELL students who typically enroll in English. Thank you for your consideration. Stacy Lemmer of Minnetonka says, question one, in hybrid classrooms, how will different school age kids in one family be coordinated to minimize differences in one child being at school on one day and the other child being in school a different day. Obviously, it is easier on a parent's schedule if both kids are in school on the same day. I also appreciate this may be a scheduling nightmare for the school. Question two, within the elementary grades and the hybrid models, how will you split up which children attend which day? By last name? My concern is that my child may be separated from friends, which could also have an isolation effect. Josh Hakridi of Eden Prairie says, will siblings attending the same school be given the same scheduled days if there is a hybrid attendance option implemented? Maya Krampf of Maple Grove says, 
I prefer the scenarios where the youngest group is in school full time, but I am asking in case a different option is chosen. When will we find out which days our specific student will be in school versus at home? Will the split be based on last name? Will there be any flexibility to switch days? Many families, ours included, are trying to plan to have an at-home learning pod of a couple of students in the district so that we can hire a tutor together and split the cost on days when the kids are remote. Ideally, we'd have some flexibility to switch school days so that our days match others in the same pod and have a few weeks notice on the days of the week that our kids will be in the classroom to have time to hire a tutor and set up a pod. Are there any plans around helping to work this out for families that have both parents working full time? Mark Broughton shared his concern about two of the hybrid options. He says, there are two plans that call for grades four and five or grades three, four and five to set up classrooms at both middle schools and the high school. Elementary classrooms look a lot different from a middle school or a high school classroom. Desks. Where are the students going to keep their folders, notebooks, crayons, markers, scissors, pencils, rulers, etc.? The desks at the middle school and the high school don't open. They can't be carrying their school supplies back and forth from home every day in their backpacks. The size of the desks aren't appropriate. I would need to pack up two thirds to three quarters of my classroom. I need to pack up my three file cabinets, my desk, as I have many things in my desk that I use every day, two five-shelf bookshelves that have teaching resources, construction paper, art supplies, three bookshelves of books, my classroom library, as there won't be appropriate books in the media centers at the high school or the middle schools for my students to read, various supplies that are needed daily that I store in my cabinets, math manipulates, bulletin board displays, and a few other things I'm sure I'm missing. To pack and unpack takes time. I would assume the district would give us time and pay us for this. 60 to 100 classrooms would have to move. Who's going to move the 60 to 100 classrooms from building to building? Will teachers in my building move into my classroom? What will that cost? We rely on our secretaries for many things throughout the day. How will their roles change? If middle school kids and high school kids are going to use the classrooms one day a week, we would be sharing the room. What would happen to all my classroom stuff as well as the stuff from the other teacher? Where would the kids play during recess time? I believe there is some room at the middle schools, but no equipment. I'm not sure where they would go at the high school. Andrea Bloomberg of Minnetonka says, will option five take into account religious education requirements? Will there be an option to select a specific session to accommodate required religious education that normally would take place after regular school dismissal, but would not fit into a second session scenario? Jody Wallstrom of Excelsior says, under option five, will all children in a family, no matter the school age, be placed in the same split scenario, morning or afternoon? In other words, if one child in a family is at an elementary school and another from the same family is at the middle school, will they both be put in the same time slot? Under option five, you imply for elementary children, there will be three hours with their teacher and one to three hours for specialists, intervention, special education, HP time. Does that mean that children with an IEP will stay at school beyond their three hour time period with their teacher? It is our belief that option five is the most sensible and well balanced for all learning types and makes the most consideration for teachers and staff and their families. Jane Friedrich of Deephaven says, I have several questions regarding the proposed hybrid models. It states that students will only be able to ask questions when they are live and in person in school. How is this feasible for high school students? When I read through the different plans, some have students only in school once a week. Are students really supposed to go a week without having their questions answered? How does that promote learning? It is not feasible for students to wait a week for their questions to be answered. They will fall behind very fast. I also have a general question regarding grading expectations with the online and hybrid models. Will expectations be the same as in person? Knowing that students may not get answers to their questions in a timely fashion. My last question, will the board be working with MDE to reevaluate the arts and physical education requirements for graduation? With a potential year of not being able to take these classes, 
assumptions based on using gyms, et cetera, for classrooms, and or not being able to do some of the arts courses that require in-person participation, such as ceramics, dark room, et cetera. How will students be able to meet these requirements? Similar comments were received from Ken Schindler of Minnetonka, Heather Dodds of Minnetonka, Amanda Persinger of Eden Prairie, and Linda Bosacker of Excelsior. The next subject is language immersion concerns or suggestions. Ken Schindler of Minnetonka says, thank you for developing hybrid plans that recognize the need for younger students to be in school. Our daughter will be entering first grade Chinese immersion, distance learning Chinese curriculum at her age is not a viable option for her education. Further, I would voice my concern for all working families that a split day is not feasible with work requirements and transportation needs. Given the opportunity, we will choose for our daughter to be in school in person. The available option for e-learning places the burden of this decision on the parents, as it should be. Thank you for your dedication to our students. Similar comments were received from Jen Weingarten of Excelsior, Rebecca Gutenkoff of Eden Prairie, Lisa Keithley of Deep Haven, Kim Schreiber of Excelsior, Jenny Thompson of Excelsior, and Jennifer Asol Lyons of Excelsior. The next topic is special education. Kathy Schulenberg of Excelsior says, first, thank you to all the wonderful teams that put their time and energy into making these recommendations for the board to review. These are amazing and so much work involved. As a special education para at the high school and a parent of two special education kiddos entering into the ninth grade, I would like more consideration for the group of kids that are not just in one classroom the entire day at the high school. Specifically, the kids who take a portion of their classes with general ed, but require a para during these classes and or a co-taught class with more assistance. In addition, these kids may not be able to stay home alone as most high school students can. It may be impossible on e-learning days to help these kids if parents are not able to assist. Thanks for your time and your consideration. I look forward to the best scenario chosen by the board this Thursday. Similar comments were received from Josh Johnson of Deep Haven and Christine Edlifson of Minnetonka. A question regarding AP and IB. Nina Arleth asks, this question regards AP and IB students. Will these classes still be open to the students taking them? I have heard that there will be general only. A question regarding momentum and the trades program. Maxwell Kodrowski says, what is your plan regarding high school students enrolled in classes in the new Momentum Trades program who will lose the hands-on appeal of the classes if they transition to online learning? Many students do not have access to metal and woodworking tools outside of the school classrooms. A question regarding MAST. Donia Schulman of Shorewood asks, if high school students opted for an e-learning method of learning for the fall, would they be able to utilize the MASS system if it's offered as an in-person method? A similar question was submitted by Winter Oliolf of Minnetonka. <clears throat> the next subject is Vantage. Rachel Bolio says, how will the Vantage program be handled regardless of what option is approved? Can you attend Vantage in person if you elect to have your child do online instruction for their other classes? Is there an online learning option for Vantage? The next topic is switching from or to e-learning during the school year. Valerie Gron of Excelsior asks, are we allowed to start the year as e-learning and then transition to a hybrid or an in-person option if we decide we are comfortable doing so? If we choose e-learning to start the year, how long are we locked into that decision? When could we change our choice? Thank you. Jennifer Frankman of Excelsior asks, Number one, is the plan selected on Thursday by the board going to be set in stone for the entire year, or will the district continue to evaluate throughout the year and adjust the plan? For example, if a vaccine is released in, no in November or cases drop dramatically. Question two, if we have more than one student at home, can we pick virtual for one student, our middle schooler, and whatever option is selected for the other, our third grader? Similar comments were received from Aaron Bix of Minnetonka, Amy Grady of Eden Prairie, Dan Hun of Eden Prairie, Matthew Batten of Chanhassen, 
Michelle Lee of Excelsior, Rebecca Gutenkoff, Eden Prairie, Nicole Smarillo, Eden Prairie, Jackie Ona Jew, Eden Prairie, and Chad Herman. <clears throat> a question about open enrollment. Sarah Swedland of Chanhassen asks, will students not currently enrolled in Minnetonka be able to open enroll for the fall once our plan is announced? For example, could students from Minneapolis enroll at Minnetonka for the year if our learning model is more desirable than what their district is offering? Questions regarding staffing. Julia Sieper of Chanhassen asks, how will the district ensure that there are enough substitutes for each of the different unions and roles, such as teachers, paras, office staff, nurses, nutritional staff, bus drivers, etc.? If we begin the year with an in-person portion of learning, what are the considerations for going to 100% remote learning besides county data? Will it be based upon filling substitute positions, rates of infection? Ann Anderson of Eden Prairie says, Will paras be given an iPad for school use in order to have the apps needed to help students? If nine students and one teacher are allowed in each classroom, where do paras fit into those numbers? Lois Coyle of Eden Prairie says, how are teachers simultaneously teaching online and in-person? If you have both e-learners who choose to remain at home and in-person learners who are following the chosen option. Lucy Holland of Chanhassen says, I appreciate how difficult this is and we plan to support whatever conclusion is reached. However, I have slight concerns over the option of having younger children in school, but only nine per class. Specifically, who will teach them as the original 20 to 30 children per original teacher will not work? Will it be a para, special hire? Will they be unqualified but supervised by the classroom teacher? Or will they be redeployed? I would like transparency here. A similar comment was submitted by Dawn Johnson. The next subject is employee concerns. Karen Hansen of Minnetonka asks, is there a plan so that teachers, paras, et cetera, are not going to have to use their basic leave or their sick time if a class has to quarantine or they get COVID? Kind of like an emergency unemployment. Many staff do not have that much sick time and may possibly need several times of weeks out due to exposure. What if you have symptoms and have to wait several days for the results? Also, we were so short on subs for teachers and paras. Is there a plan to address this? Thank you for your consideration. A similar comment was submitted by Jeff Mandel of Golden Valley. A question regarding mental health. Nancy McGovern of Minnetonka says, I would like you to consider the mental health of the high school students. They have been through a lot this year. Juniors missed prom and going to friends grad parties. They are anxious about applying to colleges that they cannot visit. They need to interact in person with their peers at least every other day. Similar comments were received from Valerie in Excelsior, Lindsay Boynton in Deep Haven, Amy Rook, and Colleen Lakovich. A question regarding childcare. Maria Crosby of Mound says, I am a teacher in another district expected to go back full time every day in the fall. My husband is also working full time. That being said, will there be an option to do Explorers Club on days off in a hybrid model or possibly after school? Lindsay Jordan of Excelsior says, thank you for all the thought that went into these plans. I would like to better understand what flexibility will be provided for families of young elementary students that have two parents working away from the home during the school day. These children may be in childcare settings during the workday if not attending school in person and may not have sufficient help watching the clock, logging in and out of live streams or meetings throughout the day. Particularly for options two and three, how will those students who are away from home during the school day be successful in these models? I am concerned there will be a performance gap between kids with a stay-at-home parent and those that have parents working outside the home. Question on transportation. Derek Score of Excelsior says, I have not seen, or maybe I missed it, anywhere addressing the transportation of the kids to and from school in any in-classroom options. They talk about limiting the number of kids in a classroom and staying six feet apart. How is that going to work on a bus? They talk about taking temperatures before entering the school. Again, are they going to do that before getting on the bus? 
or are there not going to be buses? And we need to be aware of that. A parking question. Magna McSpeeden of, of Eden Prairie says, I am wondering about parking passes at the high school if there are in school days, particularly for seniors who are open enrolled. How will that be implemented and distributed? I am assuming you would not be requiring students to carpool, can't social distance. Will seniors get priority and will the fee be eliminated or at least significantly less? Thank you. Question regarding volunteers from Kevin Wright of Minnetonka. Please consider whether the school district can harness the capacity of parent or community volunteers to help complete extra work that would be needed to keep the schools open more. For example, if the schools need more labor to clean facilities after hours, it may be possible to assemble a team of volunteers to help clean the buildings to augment the cleaning crews. Volunteers could work under the direction of the district's existing employees. A question regarding the school calendar from Rebecca Adams of Spring Park. She says, would there be any changes to the school calendar? For example, parent-teacher conferences, MEA, teacher planning days, as a result of the option decided upon. The next subject is regarding health and safety. Jody Wallstrom of Excelsior says, it is so important to us for our children to have an in-school experience yet not while, comp not while compromising the health and safety of staff, children, and families in our community. In our opinion, the biggest challenge lies at the elementary school level. It is not realistic to believe that these students will naturally maintain social distancing, keep a mask on without touching their face for three plus hours, or not have instances where close interaction is necessary with their teachers. Additionally, at the elementary level, we believe hands-on learning is critical. They need the structure and the interaction with their peers. Elementary school is so much more than general academics. We also need to consider mental health across the board. How are we helping our young children understand this pandemic and this unnatural school environment, especially our new kindergartners? Is distance learning a challenge for some students to a point they may be silently suffering? At the same time, how are we supporting our teachers, paras, aides, and general staff? They were faced with an incredible challenge last spring, and while all seven plans are comprehensive, none mention the consideration of stress and mental health. Lois Coyle of Eden Prairie asks, what is protocol if a student or staff member is identified with COVID in a school? Who gets tested? Do we move to e-learning, and if so, for how long? Does that mean students may be toggling back and forth between e-learning and in-school learning throughout the school year? Who is enforcing students to ensure masks and distancing are adhered to? How are we holding everyone to those standards? Jennifer Mickelson of Minnetonka asks, can you tell us how it will be handled if our in-school learning and there is a new case? Will students, peer groups, teachers, staff members be told to quarantine for 14 days? Will the teacher and the staffers get paid if at home? I feel that is very important. If a child is sent home for quarantine, that too could be tough if parents work full time, like myself. Similar comments were submitted by Anita Britton, Maggie Walenta, Brandon Dickens Shorewood. And I have a few more. Jamie. And you also have the email from um, Jackie that says two more. I have an email from her that says additional 19. Perfect, and then one that says two more. And I think the additional 19 may be this. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. I just need to open that quickly. And I think the title is, yeah. oh, I. Yeah, okay. All right. I will continue in just a minute here. Okay. <clears throat> additional questions. First of all, Alam Abduwali of Eden Prairie asks, how do the goals create an anti-racist environment at the Minnetonka schools? How is anti-racism achieved by the goals? How are the experiences and suggestions of BIPOC represented within these goals? A question from Frank Zimmerman of Chanhassen. He says, I found it interesting that these seven plans were not communicated to everyone who pays taxes to support the Minnetonka School District. Doesn't every taxpayer have the right to review the options and provide feedback regarding the potential impact on their community and their lives? 
This decision will impact thousands of people in multiple communities, and many will have no opportunity to provide input. Not taking all available steps to share this information keeps the majority of the school district's taxpayer community in the dark and uninformed. If the board can't properly inform the parties affected by a decision of this magnitude, then shouldn't the decision be delayed until such action can be taken? This vote should be postponed. Why the rush? Yes, it is a crisis, but that shouldn't eliminate the majority of the school district's taxpayers, their right to review the proposals prior to the vote, and reach out to the board with comments. Doesn't the board have a responsibility to inform all parties affected by this decision? I understand the board's passion for moving quickly, and no doubt these are unusual circumstances, but nothing should eliminate the fact that every school district taxpayer should have the right to review these plans and make comments before the board votes. These unusual circumstances dictate that these plans should be reviewed by the many, not the few, prior to a final decision. Just my humble opinion as a taxpayer and a former teacher. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. A comment received from Sonia Labs of Minnetonka. As a teacher in the district and as someone who participated in working on one of the plans set before you, I have a few concerns. Number one, several of the hybrid models rely on a division of 50% of students, but few of the classrooms, at least at the high school, actually have enough square footage to host that many students with six feet social distancing requirements. About one third to one quarter of students would need to choose completely online education to make the hybrids viable at 50% capacity. Question two, some plans for middle school students include following their normal seven period day with a short passing time. Does this reflect best practices for students streaming at home? Is there a better way to structure time so we reduce screen time for students and still increase productivity? Also, is there adequate time between classes in any of the models for thorough disinfecting of spaces? Question three, will you consider reopening registration for high school students to opt for existing Tonka online courses and allow for a shifting of teaching assignments? This too might alleviate some of the numbers. Question four, regardless of the model that is chosen, we should be prepared with a detailed district-wide plan to educate staff, students, and families on the best practices for learning in whatever space they may be utilizing, including hygiene, communicating and working with others, ergonomics, especially those working from home, wellness, and academic achievement and integrity. A question from Amanda Sander of Eden Prairie. Will after school clubs and activities other than sports be allowed to continue? <clears throat> question from Emma Turner of Chanhassen. As a para with the DCD program, I want to know how we are to deal with classrooms that are far too small for the number of children and adults that use them and that have no access to a bathroom just for those children. We are located in two rooms that are essentially offices. They are not classrooms and social distancing is not possible. We also have no access to cleaning facilities, which we are in dire need of if we are to prevent the spread of the virus. The children and adults will need to wash their hands multiple times an hour due to the children's oral sensory issues. We also deal with potty training a number of children, which includes changing diapers, yet we have no access to a bathroom that is purely for this program's use. Other people outside of the DCD program can use it. There are classrooms in the building that have their own bathroom, but those rooms are being used by classes that don't require bathrooms, and the bathrooms themselves are being used as storage rooms. How are we to keep the kids in the program and the adults in the rest of the building safe with all the bodily fluids we deal with on a daily basis? What PPE is going to be provided for us especially for those of us who have children who drool and need wiping on a regular basis? And how is the bathroom going to be cleaned in a timely manner? A question from Noah Hansen of Excelsior. <clears throat> Many private daycares and schools are adding kindergarten programs to provide parents more certainty in their child's education. Given the complexities and the importance of in-person education for kindergartners, especially in immersion, Many parents are strongly considering or planning on withdrawing their kids from immersion programs and public school enrollment. Can the board provide any certainty on in-person attendance for these critical programs? 
We do not understand how immersion programs can be successful in a remote environment or in-person part-time. From a child development perspective, should parents of these children withdraw their kids for alternative programs with a commitment to in-person attendance? A question from Caleb Brandt of Deep Haven. I appreciate the opportunity to provide feedback on the school options for the fall. My son is in high school and will be a junior. During the online portion of school last year, his grades went down significantly in a few classes. He has ADHD, so being fully present in an online setting can be a challenge. He did make it to his classes for the most part, but I think it was a challenge to perform to the best of his abilities. Part of this was teacher fit, which is very important for him. Part of this was simply not having the face-to-face -face contact with the teacher so they can get to know what he can do and can challenge him to do it. Furthermore, I think he enjoys the stimulation of being in a classroom, learning from great teachers and from students. He seems to have lost that joy with online learning, and it seems that energy was difficult to replicate in online classes. Online learning, like it was done in the spring, just doesn't fit his learning needs well. For this fall, I hope a, a safe hybrid option will be viable. From the hybrid choices presented, I would like him to be at school two days per week and learning online three days. I think this is the hybrid A 50-50 plan, not the one to nine plan. If school must be all or mostly online, I would like to have the opportunity to work with his counselor to get a new teacher. If I find that his online teacher is a bad fit for his needs. Another option I would like to see if our kids go all or mostly online is pass fail grading. I don't want pass fail to provide an option just to tune out, but I also don't want my son's grades, which really count now, to slip because the material delivery is not optimal for my son's learning needs. Thank you for your time and attention to giving our students the safest, most effective learning environment. A comment from Shelley Wee of Minnetonka. Dear Minnetonka school board members, I have the deepest respect for you to take on a tough task to decide a school plan for the new year. Thank you in advance for your thoughtfulness and your empathy while you make this decision. My request is to allow parents to choose a virtual format at the beginning of the school year while still having the ability to opt back into an alternative plan should school reopening be proven safe for the kids and the staff or should there be improvement in the community spread. The COVID situation is fluid. We still don't understand the virus and its full impact. As new information, treatment, or vaccines emerge, we all need to replan and adapt together. I hope we don't lock parents out of options based on the information at this time. I understand there are challenges in planning, but at the very least, please consider to allow special needs kids with some flexibility. They might have higher health risks, but also are the population who need the most academic help. It is a really difficult choice for their parents without knowing how the reopening plan chosen by the board might translate to additional risks for these kids. I am also concerned about students with special needs who may not be able to adhere to social distancing rules. For example, due to ADHD, lack of executive or cognitive function, etc. What is special precaution for these kids for their own safety and others' safety? Many kids require paraprofessionals' help in school. What is the plan to keep paras socially distanced and still be effective? Question received from Karen Gotts of Chanhassen. I teach at MME and I would like to encourage the school board to consider selecting separate hybrid models for each age level based on what would work best for each group. For middle school, here are my thoughts. Number one, I like hybrid A or E if we are okay with 50% in school at a time, social distancing would not be guaranteed. Number two, hybrid D offers in-person times that are too short with barely any time for cleaning in between groups. <clears throat> but I like the idea of dividing the middle schools into three groups rather than two or four, especially if we are required to follow the six foot separation guidelines. Number three, Another possibility I would like to offer is to divide the school into three groups, but have each group in school for a full day once per week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The same group would always be in school on the same day each week for consistent schedules. 
Monday and Friday would be distance learning days and the buildings could be used for elementary classes and additional in-person school for special education if needed. One week would follow the A-day schedule and the next week would follow the B-day schedule. I am a music teacher and would have the A and B day classes. So for example, during the A-day week, I would be sure to meet online with my B-day classes and vice versa. Another possibility would be to run a slightly shorter schedule so that students were finished in school one hour early. For that remaining hour, teachers would be able to check for messages from the students at home and have some time to answer questions or give help as needed. <clears throat> a question from, I, the first name is cut off, last name is McHugh of Excelsior. I am a parent and a teacher in the district. I teach RSK and I am very excited at the thought of returning to school with these students as I know they learn best in person. As you consider your options, I hope you will think carefully about the unique safety, equipment, PPE, extra para support, hours of exposure, class size, cleaning and sanitizing needs, and learning concerns of teachers and students in RSK and kindergarten. Please consider the following as you make a safe and developmentally appropriate plan for this age level. Number one, it is virtually impossible for teachers to social distance <clears throat> with these students as they are not independent. They need help with everything, such as zipping coats, tying shoes, backpacks, scissors, pencils, lunches, etc. Number two, full-time para support will be more important than ever to keep students learning while social distancing. They can sit for maybe 15 to 20 minutes at a time at best and learn through play, collaborating, interacting, building, creating, climbing. A full day of social distancing will be mentally and physically difficult and exhausting for them. I believe a shorter amount of time at school each day would allow for quality instruction and engaged learning without frustration and allow for non-social distanced, age-appropriate free play at home. We will also need to spend time and money to create a similar hands-on experience in an individual way. For example, creating individual supply kits, learning centers, and choice time play kits. As a parent of a senior, my only hope is that they somehow get some safety in person social and learning school time as a class as it will be their last year. Thank you so much. A question from Kirsten Hoyard of Victoria. Thank you for all your work and consideration during this process. I know the situation is very complex and an ideal solution is not possible. Thank you for being willing to make the best choice for our students, staff, and families. My first question is, how frequently will we change plans based on health data? Assuming we start in a hybrid model, will we stay the course until numbers reach the limit of closing or opening fully schools? My second question is, in a hybrid model, Will all students in a household be attending schools on the same days of the week? How will families in different building levels work their schedules? Thank you. A question from Emily Butcher of Chanhassen. Hello, wonderful Minnetonka School Board. First, I want to thank you for putting in so much time and effort and including the community in these back to school discussions. This is a very hard position to be in, regardless of the decisions that will be made. We have two Tonka grads and one incoming eighth grader at MMW. When we were talking about all of the possibilities of what back to school could look like, my daughter really only had one thing that mattered to her. She said she just wanted to be able to meet her teachers in person and make a one-on-one -on -one connection with them even for just a couple of minutes before e-learning commenced. She said that knowing her teachers going into the situation in March really made a difference and just didn't want to feel so disconnected from her eighth grade teachers who she doesn't know yet. So here is my question. If we go back primarily to distance learning, would it be possible to use a parent-teacher conference style format in order for the students who want to, to sign up to have a quick meet and greet with their teachers? Maybe by even using the same process as you would to sign up for the five minute parent-teacher conference, but spread out over several days in order to socially distance the meet and greet. Thank you so much, you are also appreciated. A question from Jenny Prisabilla of Eden Prairie. Depending on what the final decision is for how we will proceed this fall, I am wondering what the plan is for having the students meet their new teachers. I know part of why the spring was a little easier is that the teachers already knew the personalities of their students. 
Would it be possible to have a type of conference meeting with the teachers prior to the start of class in order for them to get at least a small sense of who their students are? This may be harder with the middle school students, but I think it is very important for the elementary school students. Question from Emma Turner in Chanhassen. <clears throat> Actually, I apologize, that is a duplicate, so I will not read that again. <clears throat> Question from Mr. Gibbs of Orono. I teach at the high school and I would like to speak about my concerns with some of the re reopening plans as they apply to the high school. Like all of you, my first priority is the health and safety of my students, staff, and the broader community. With this in mind, I am concerned that the hybrid plans 6, 3, 5, and of course the full opening plan, number one, will not be able to sustain a nine student to one teacher ratio. My current brick and mortar class sizes for the fall are 31, 33, 31, and 29. My next priority is, of course, the quality of instruction that teachers can provide in any of these given scenarios. For instance, in the hybrid plans where students alternate days and times based on alphabetical order, teachers would be teaching from the front of the room, masked, while students spread out as much as possible. The benefits of being in the classroom together would be limited as students could not meet in small groups or work together in close conversation. I would not be able to circulate the room to check for understanding. Students would not be able to closely socialize and learn from one another. Meanwhile, I would be recorded for live streaming purposes so that students who opt out of in-person instruction can witness my lesson. It seems I could be more effective in a Google Meet where I can interact with students rather than have students see only me and vaguely hear me through my mask and not be able to interrupt with questions or participate in groups, albeit virtual ones. As well as the quality of instruction, we also must consider the quantity of instruction. In the hybrid scenarios where students alternate days, students will only receive half of the instruction and the curriculum they would receive if attending class virtually. Teachers can actually cover more ground in an online scenario which is especially important for students who are taking AP and IB classes that require external assessments and exams. Again, I am speaking as a high school teacher and understand that the online experience is likely different for elementary and middle school students. We all await the time when we can safely return to the classroom and that day will come soon. Until then, let's make sure that we give students safety quality and quantity through a smart and reasonable reopening plan. I don't envy the decision you have to make, and I thank you for your time. A comment from Justin Simcoe of Chaska. Over the last several months of the last school year, students and staff had to navigate various learning management systems and platforms. Do you or are you going to declare a preferred learned management system for the next school year? should you differentiate where developmentally appropriate. Additionally, virtual conferencing remains a critical component of distance or remote learning. Should you declare a preferred platform? What will happen when some platforms return to regular fee schedules? Who is going to incur that cost? How will you help students, staff, and families access broadband internet that either do not have it or have access to it financially? What school schedules may need to be modified to reduce student mobility during the day and mitigate the risk? For instance, should you have teachers travel to classrooms for specials or electives instead of having the students move? What supply chain challenges exist for getting PPE devices? Will you need to expedite ordering today to have your inventory in place for the start of the 2020-2021 school year? How are you going to screen the children and the staff every day for illness or symptoms? Are the classrooms going to be cleaned between each class, especially high touch areas? Is the school district going to enforce that students wear masks? What if they have a medical reason that they can't wear a mask? What happens then? How are you going to enforce social distancing when it comes to busing and or parent pickup? Lastly, how are you going to protect not only my child, but the other children of our district? A comment from Sarah Kurachek of Eden Prairie. The first word in the Minnetonka Public Schools motto is innovate. Tonight or soon after, you will have the opportunity to show how innovative the Minnetonka Public Schools can be. 
you will choose one of seven plans for our children's 2020-2021 school year. The one plan you must not choose for the entire district is the online only plan, although this may serve as an option to accommodate certain families. This plan is not innovative. It is far too focused on avoiding the risks associated with contracting COVID-19, and it ignores other well-documented but less headline-making risks of keeping children out of school. When reviewing the remaining plans, I urge you to take a critical look at our community. The positive rates of COVID-19 in our district's zip codes are low, as reported by the Star Tribune. I submit the rates only include known cases of COVID-19. Please don't look at the data in a vacuum. Notice the absence of news stories. Despite the foreboding reports of mass congregations occurring on Lake Minnetonka over the 4th of July holiday, despite daycares and other businesses remaining open, and despite the many camps, sporting activities, and continued operations of our own community education programming, we have not seen outbreaks like many other areas of the country. I also urge you to take a look at the risks facing our children, as I alluded to above. There are serious detrimental mental health effects. Abuse is on the rise. The academic rigor that our district is so well known for is waning. There are, of course, other considerations, but these two major points support a liberal school reopening plan. This should include reasonable efforts at stemming COVID-19 transmission. But that brings me back to the district's motto. Be innovative. Bring the classroom and the lunchrooms outside, and when, you, when outside, take off the masks. Open the windows. Call on your volunteer base to support mitigation efforts, such as wiping down tables and helping with social distancing. We are all making sacrifices with our time and our efforts. Don't make our children sacrifice any more than they already have. Reopen the schools. A comment from Ursula Speedling of Minnetonka. As a Minnetonka resident, a parent, and a teacher in the Minnetonka schools, I deeply appreciate all of the time spent on these seven options. The board faces a difficult decision if they are trying to make everyone happy. If we put the safety of students, their families, staff, their families, and our community at the forefront of that decision, it is easy. E-learning for everyone is the safest at this time. We must not put anyone at risk. It's a pandemic and cases are rising. Once the numbers start going down significantly, then the option of returning to classrooms is more realistic. I also have a few questions about in-person learning. Will the classes actually be only nine students? This number is in multiple options. Do we really have the capabilities to live stream teachers teaching? Are we expecting young children using the streaming that day to sit on their iPads all day? What happens when connectivity becomes an issue? And there are privacy issues. Would we allow this many parents to sit in our classrooms all day, every day? What about reserved teachers? Will they be comfortable with live streaming? Will we have enough reserved teachers? Lastly, we need to consider, can children have normal, healthy, social and emotional experiences at school in an environment strictly adhering to safety protocols? Thank you for taking the time to think about the different options and the impact each will have on the health, social, emotional and physical and well-being of our students and staff during this unprecedented time in our history. A comment from either Ms. or Mr. Goodspeed Gross of Chaska. I am a teacher at MMW. Another teacher in my building shared this concern with me and I am sharing it with you. Quote, the temperature checks by staff and teachers at school worry me. Bloomington schools where I live is not doing this and I personally think it could put more adult staff at risk since many young carriers are asymptomatic. I would certainly not be comfortable doing this task. Bloomington's plan also states that school-wide temperature checks at school are not recommended by the CDC or the MDH. Also, other than one version, I don't see where symptomatic kids are supposed to wait for pickup besides the nurse's office, which seems to put more kids and staff in that small place at risk. I have concerns about the hybrid options that double the amount of kids in the building at a time over other hybrid plans. Yes, they are there for a shorter amount of time, but so many more chances of exposure there and to not socially distance. I am for improving on what we started virtually and being more cautious in general. So I just wanted to say that as it heads into the final weeks." End quote. 
A comment from Josh Pratt of Shorewood. If the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, then I would say we have a lot for which to be afraid. Regardless of your position on the COVID-19 virus and the governmental and societal response, it seems evident that many decisions are being made out of fear. Since March, there has been much information presented by the government and the media, often without context. There has also been an ever-changing narrative to what the ultimate goal of our response to this virus is. At this point, there is no clear end in sight, and it seems as though we are putting our children in the middle. As with anything new, there is a lot to learn, and new information can sway opinion. I do not believe that children are immune to the virus, nor do I believe that transmission is impossible or even unlikely in a school setting. What is clear through evidence, though, is that COVID-19 is highly unlikely to manifest itself with severe illness and especially death in children. My family moved to the Minnetonka district just before our oldest daughter started kindergarten. One of the primary reasons for coming was that so both of my children would receive a world-class education. And that is exactly what they had been receiving up until the spring of 2020 when distance learning started. My wife and I both work full time and while we have been blessed to be able to maintain our employment, it is not a blessing to my children's education. There is simply no way to monitor and assist with online learning of two elementary students while working full time. As a side note, neither, of, neither one of us speaks Spanish. It is clear that with any form of hybrid, learning will suffer. As of late, there has been a lot of reporting about schools and positive test results within a school. The narrative has been that sending kids back is dangerous and irresponsible and that people are not taking this virus seriously enough. I take personal offense to the idea that I am not responsible or educated enough to make wise decisions for my own children. As a parent, you are constantly faced with choices for both you and your children, and those, cho those choices often involve a certain amount of risk. There has always been risk taken by sending kids to school, and in this case, the benefits continue to outweigh the risks. In the outbreaks of COVID that have been publicized, there is no context about the actual manifestations of the virus. With the number of asymptomatic people, especially children, contracting COVID, it is unlike any pandemic we have experienced. I would also like to address the argument being made about children spreading the disease to others. At this point, we don't have enough data to fully understand the extent, but I think it is likely for kids to be able to transmit the virus. Some data would suggest that it is transmitted from children at lower serum levels, but nevertheless, it is transmitted. And that is what I would like the board to consider. People are capable of making decisions for themselves. I understand the risk from COVID as well as can be understood at this time. And I have also seen the actual consequences of my children not being in school. I have also seen the benefit they have received in going to a YMCA day camp with other children after having gone through the distance learning. When I stack up the known consequences of distance learning against the risk of a return to school, my choice is clear. For that reason, I implore you to select option one, fully open for returning to school in September. All options have a distance learning component for anyone who chooses that the risk is too great for their child or their family. It is that simple. You have given the choice for people to protect themselves by staying at home if that is what they choose to do. I am simply asking that you give me and other families the option to go back to school. Please do not take that choice away from us. Thank you for your time and consideration. A comment from Tom Venkat, Ven, I'm sorry, Venkatesh of Chanhassen. Many of you have likely seen photos from North Spalding High School in Georgia, which showed students crammed together in hallways, few of them wearing masks. I do not, I, I'm sorry, I want to ensure that what happened in North Spalding High School does not happen in Minnetonka. As an MHS student myself, I know there are many hallways in MHS that act as choke points for student traffic. On normal days, these hallways are packed with moving, not congregating, student traffic. If the school board adopts a hybrid or in-person learning proposal, I want to make sure that the traffic in these choke points will be reduced significantly. The district has, thankfully, taken many precautions that North Paulding High School did not, such as mandating mask usage, discouraging students from congregating, and making most hallways one-way use only. The only problem with all of these precautions is that they do not actually decrease the overall volume of traffic in the hallways. In other words, the density of student traffic is the exact same. 
It seems to me it would be very hard to practice social distancing in those choke point stretches of hallway, even if the district adopts a hybrid plan that would have half or one third of students attending school daily. What is the district trying to do to fix this problem? Very thank you. Thank I did you. receive some more in my email. Do you oh. want me to read those um, also or should we? Were they after six o'clock? Yes. So um, we will respond to those comments, okay. but just in, in um, light of the time limit for community comments, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna move okay. on. So okay. just forward them to, to me. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you for reading all of those, and um, thank you to everybody who submitted their comments. And as I mentioned early, earlier, thank you to those who submitted their um, co comments and feedback to the board directly as well. Um, we anticipate we're gonna be ad addressing these questions in our presentations, during our discussions, and then also in addition, the district um, plans to send out a FAQ document once a plan is adopted. So we greatly appre appreciate your comments and questions. The comments that were submitted earlier, I believe it was in um, up until one o'clock today, have already been forwarded to the board, so we did get a chance to read those also in advance. Um, but thank you, Carrie, for taking um, in reading all of them. So um, we will move on to our next agenda item, which is the presentation of options for 2021. Dr. Peterson. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, thank you for the opportunity to introduce these uh, options. I do wanna make a comment on the comments. Uh, these are all very helpful to us. The questions that are asked and the opinions are taken seriously. Uh, we've received, of course, a lot of comments over the last two or three weeks as people have been exposed to various parts of the plans. And, uh, you know, I'm just anxious to answer all of them, obviously, but uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, have to also get done in the district, including getting these plans out to people. Uh, so I, I think what we'll try to do is answer all the questions raised if they're not answered by the plan that goes out. So, uh, and you, I'd ask that you maybe be patient with us that we can get those answered in the next couple of weeks. It's uh, quite a volume and uh, as I said, it's not that we're not doing anything else. So I appreciate that. Uh, so I wanna start this item out by thanking the teams that uh, developed the options for the board to consider. Uh, and I wanna thank the teams that provided feedback uh, and their critiques and suggestions. So these plans have been massaged quite a bit by parents and uh, staff members already uh, before uh, people uh, had a chance to see them and, and weigh in on questions. So many of the things have been thought of. Obviously, there are things that people are asking about that were not thought of yet or uh, they didn't get included anyway. So we had about uh, 600 people involved in developing and shaping the plans for the options that have been shared. And uh, we deeply appreciate all of the uh, parents and uh, uh, staff who have participated in that process. We also, uh, uh, as I said earlier, thank the parents who have asked questions, provided recommendations, and helped us make uh, the options stronger through their input. Uh, and we'll continue to follow up. So I especially want to thank the leaders of the seven teams who are going to present an overview of their options tonight. So the plan is to enter, uh, for me to introduce each uh, chair and then they will cover their plans. And so we'll go through in the order in which the options are numbered. We'll start with Pete Dimmitt, who's our, element, or excuse me, our middle school principal at East and he led uh, team number one, which is the open, uh, wide open plan. So Mr. Dimmitt, would you start? Mr. Dimmitt, you're still muted. All right, can people see my presentation? Mike, yes. Mike, Andy. Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so everybody's uh, read through uh, option number one. The format we tried to lay this option out in 
was a format where we described it by school level, K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. And for each level, we described what the classroom model for instruction would look like, what online instruction would look like, what social distancing strategies would look like, uh, general COVID safety procedures and protocols, um, procedures for how we would handle meetings in the school, and then the logistical implications um, of each model. When you, when you distill all of that down, this is what I consider to be the seven greatest challenges of implementing a model like this. And so again, you know, the first thing I want to emphasize and, and remind people of is this model is a model where everybody goes back to school. So this is a model where as a district, we've met the criteria uh, laid out by the state to be able to bring all the school students back to school. So uh, all the students that want to be in school are in school and there is no um, expectation of six foot social distancing. The expectation is that we uh, create as much separation as is feasible, uh, but we're not held to the standard of social distancing kids in this model. So uh, when you think about what the greatest challenges of this model are, number one is how are we gonna ensure social distancing during the critical non-classroom times? And these are mostly the transition times. It's the transition time from the cars or buses in the morning into their first hour class, um, the transition time between classes during the day, the transition time uh, from their last hour class to the car, to the bus, and then the transition time midday when the students are having lunches. Uh, some of the suggestions that had been laid out uh, would look like us um, trying to implement a model where students would be in pods and the student pod would stay in a room and the teachers would rotate through the rooms. That is not a feasible um, model at all at either at the middle school level or the high school level. So it's unavoidable in our model that students will need to be transitioning uh, between classes, transitioning uh, to get their lunch and transitioning um, to and from transportation at the beginning of, and the end of the day. And so how do we do that in a way that doesn't, um, you know, doesn't become that video that we've seen from the Georgia high school where the kids are all crowded in the hall and there's, there's, they're hanging out and they're not um, making any attempt to social distance. Uh, the second biggest challenge is how do we account for the increased staff supervision needs that would happen to need to be in place to execute this model. And, and by that, I mean, this model would require us to stagger our passing times, to stagger our end of the day um, release, to stagger our beginning of the day entrance into the school. And, it, and that staggering means you're gonna have some kids that will be the very first kids into the classroom and, and while others will be uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes behind them in getting into the classroom. So that's gonna require that we have an adult in each of those classrooms uh, as the kids again are gonna be co coming directly from their car or bus uh, to the classroom. They won't be stopping in the hallways. They won't be hanging at their locker. They won't be congregating in the media center or in the cafeteria. And so how do we put together the supervision plan so that there's an adult in each of those classrooms supervising as the kids are, are, um, are entering the room and, and hanging out in the room until, until everybody is in that room for their first hour class or for their second hour class. Uh, thirdly, how do we create a viable plan for systemic bi-daily uh, student health monitoring? And so um, again, the, the what is going to be the point that we're going to do that temperature jack check? Um, it, the, logistically, the most easy point to do it would be as the kids come into the classroom door at the classroom door. You know, the downside of that is that if they uh, are running a temperature or are uh, showing uh, signs of COVID, you know, if we don't catch them until they're at the classroom door, um, how many potentially how many other people have they infected at that point? versus doing the check at the uh, as they get out of the car or as they get off the bus. Um, doing the check uh, the latter way as they're getting out of the car or as they're getting out of the bus um, deals with that, that uh, 
desire to catch it uh, early before they um, have the possibility to infect any other students. Uh, but the implication of that is that it, it's going to uh, spread out um, that transition time in terms of when we get all the other students um, into uh, their first hour class. Uh, fourth, um, we, this model will, will cause us to do a lot of reflecting on uh, when are we able to implement MDH recommendations um, versus uh, doing something less than that. When you look at the guidance from the Department of Education, a lot of that is, uh, uses the term to the greatest extent feasible. And so uh, when are we gonna have to do something less than their recommendations just because logistically that's what we need to do to make it happen? Um, how do we balance the social distancing needs of our students versus the educational interaction needs? Um, kids need to be able to collaborate. Kids need to be able to interact with their teachers. And how do we balance that need with the need to um, create social distancing for safety uh, purposes? Uh, how do we safely feed the students? Again, the logistics of getting kids fed each day are, are significant. And then lastly, um, what does an e-learning option look like and how do we do that in a way that um, is gonna be reasonable for teachers? Um, that is not gonna have an unreasonable expectation for them in terms of uh, teaching their daily in-classroom instruction and then also simultaneously having a e-learning uh, instruction as well. Um, so uh, knowing that knowing that we have uh, uh, time limitations, I think maybe I'll stop there for a second and see what people have for questions or, or follow up. Are we going to do questions in the end? Uh, at the end. Yeah. yeah so we're gonna um, we're gonna hold questions for the discussion end of it, Mr. Demet. So if um, if you want to, if there was anything else, otherwise we could move on to the next. Yeah, like I said, I, you know, I know you guys have read through these things thoroughly. The other thing that, that I guess the last thing I would want to comment on is that um, I think in terms of how we communicate to families, what this model would look like is, is going to be critical because, um, you know, as I've listened to families talk about how they want to have their student back in school, and I've listened to students talk about how, how badly they want to be back in school. They talk about how they want to be with their friends and um, they, they're missing the social components of school. And what I would want them to, to have an accurate picture of is uh, if you come back to school in this model, um, we are not going to be able to provide them with a lot of their traditional um, uh, expectations of social interactions at school. Um, they're not going to be allowed to be able to hang out in the hallway with their friends during passing time. They're not going to be able to sit with their friends at lunch uh, and have a traditional lunch. Uh, they're not going to be able to uh, gather in the media center or gather in the cafeteria. And so I, I really think it'll be critical for us to um, you know, thread the needle in terms of how we communicate on this, because on one level, we want to communicate accurately for parents um, deciding whether they want to send their child to school versus uh, have their child uh, pursue e-learning. We want to have an accurate picture for them about what the at-school option would look like. Um, but the flip side of that is we don't want to be so, um, uh, we don't want to paint a picture that of school being so sterile and so uh, lacking of any uh, personal interaction um, th that we inaccurately um, portray, you know, what actually will be able to be done at school just through the great um, magic of our teachers and their ability to uh, make connections with kids, even, even under these circumstances. So, like I said, uh, threading that needle in terms of how we communicate that out to families, I think is going to be really important. Uh, what I wouldn't want to see is I wouldn't want to see the scenario where uh, we have a lot of families that are excited to, to send their kid back to school um, when this option becomes available. And then after the first week and the student realizes that it's not what they thought it was going to be and that they don't get to hang out with their friends like they thought they were going to, there's 
there's going to be a, a huge spike in requests to switch from in person to online, uh, and and we won't be prepared to handle uh, that big of a of a migration. Um, as I um, mentioned earlier, we're going to hold all the comments. So, board members, if you want to continue um, writing down your your um, questions or comments, and we're going to hold that for the discussion part of it. So, we're going to move along, Dr. Peterson. Option two. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, the next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Paula Hoff. Um, Dr. Hoff uh, has recently retired from the district, but she graciously uh, agreed to come back and help lead the uh, work on improving our um, e-learning, our virtual model. Uh, we know that we did uh, probably the best job of any district in the state in the spring, but still we had parents uh, not happy with it and students not happy with it. So we wanted to make sure that we have more quality control and that we make improvements that will really um, uh, assure parents and students that this will be a high quality option for them to choose. So Dr. Hoff, I'll turn it over to you to uh, describe option two. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I'm also here tonight with Ms. Diana Ortiz Hedges. Um, she's one of the lucky teachers from our amazing group who is here tonight to help present. So I welcome Diana as well. When I was asked to lead option two, I felt fairly confident that we could do this quite easily because we had just finished the school year. And in some ways I was right because it was very fresh in our minds. At the same time, I was wrong because it was so fresh in our minds. Um, what, will you, what you'll see tonight, what you'll hear from us is, is really hard work for some dedicated individuals who have invested a great deal of time and energy based on their own personal experience, as well as the feedback that we've received from our community in the parent survey. So um, we look forward to sharing that with you. Next slide, you will see um, the list of people who worked together to create this, this plan for you. Um, they spent hours um, going over the survey data and talking about all the different options and how important it is to make sure that we are creating as comprehensive a plan is better. On this slide that you're seeing right now, this was our mantra. This is what drove all of our conversations. We knew that we did not want to be the same. We knew we could and will be better. Um, we started together as large groups, often in our meetings, and then we broke apart into small groups and we continued to come back together and ask one another, how can we be better? On the next slide, you will see some threads that continue to be discussed through all of our conversations. We know the things that we learned in the spring of 2020 have to be better in this spring. These are important factors in our planning. We know that to make this happen, our staff will continue to need support and they'll, the, um, the support will need to be ongoing so they continue to learn and grow to best meet the needs of all of our students. One of the most strongest elements that we heard from this parent survey data is that our kids and our staff need more live time together. We also heard that our kids need more live time with one another. So those threads are evident in all of the plans that we have for each grade level. How that looks to the specific detail will be prescribed at each grade level in each building by the building principal. The unique attributes of programs and grade levels are very different and we want that to be addressed at the appropriate level at the building. And on the next slide, you'll see some more um, comments that we continue to discuss and, and make sure that this is happening in all of our schools. The learning of our students is the most important thing that needs to be addressed. We also want to pay very close attention to the social and emotional needs of all of our kids. We know that families are a critical part in helping us make this happen. And to make that happen, staff will continue to provide high quality instruction that meets the needs of the students. 
On the next slide, you'll see some components that we addressed in each level of schooling. And for this level, um, Diane is going to share information with you, and then we'll move on and talk about the middle school and the high school. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Um, as a result of our work together, we really pondered how we could grow from the experience we had in the spring. In elementary education, which is the part I will be sharing with you, we worked on some element, key elements that we wanted to improve on. There needs to be an emphasis on communication and support. Parents are our allies now more than ever. We value that teamwork and wish to empower parents. Before we begin the school year, we have to prepare. And this preparation will include parent training on the use of technology, uh, the learning management system, which in elementary can be either Seesaw from kindergarten to third grade or Schoology fourth and fifth grade, and teacher trainings, which are already uh, scheduled to have sessions in place for August. And there's also uh, online courses that we can work on with more flexibility. Instead of an open house, teachers will have a one-on-one -on -one with families and students to get to know each other. Some assessments like the oral reading fluency and a conversation can be also be done as a one-on-one -on -one with students to boost student-teacher relationships and help teachers know where students are at to design their learning goals. For students entering kindergarten and first grade in immersion, we recommend classroom pairs be present to help bridge any communication necessary between the classroom teacher and the student. Regular scheduled parent meetings are also something that we thought and felt are super important to keep parents informed, connected with our common goals, and to support our families. These would also help update any necessary information that parents need to know or have as a priority. We also uh, agreed that relationships matter. We plan on developing student-teacher relationships through regular check-ins, small group instruction, and one-on-one -on -one interactions. We also feel students need to connect with each other, for which we think a daily morning meeting is also something that should be a staple in the beginning of everyone's day. This leads into one of the key things we agreed upon. Synchronous time is important. We need to be able to teach students during mini lessons, provide them with time to work, and later be able to circle back to check for understanding. This can be highly successful if we develop an online class culture. Teachers rely on routines and procedures to have their space function. The same needs to be said about online teaching. This flows into the creation of classroom agreements that can help us all be on the same page. Beginning the school year, we will need time to develop classroom relationships, culture, and teach the use of technology. The first six weeks is the laying of this foundation. After this foundation is solid, we can begin introducing content and continue to develop student academic goals. Students will be evaluated for progress. We want to prioritize the mastery of Minnesota state standards. This means we need to break down standards into progressions of learning. Learning is a process that needs to be informed by formative assessments, and these will be ongoing and developed to gather the data we need so we can inform our teaching. Feedback is crucial. This can be delivered through audio or written form in our learning management systems. Conferences and virtual parent meetings will be focused through the lens of learning goals. We also think there needs to be a balance between iPad activities and paper pencil assignments. Specials was also something that we talked about and with this I'm referring to art, physical education, music. Um, these courses will focus more on a mixture of online resources, educational videos, and pre-recorded lessons by their teachers. Office hours will be available for students who need extra support in their assignments. Teachers will be researching and developing learning kits 
with basic materials students will need for art, music, and physical education. So they can have these materials to be able to do their work successfully and still enjoy all of the different activities that these courses offer. In immersion, uh, everything we have discussed so far applies to immersion. However, we also raised up the fact that immersion students are learning the same content as students in the regular program, but in a second language. There needs to be a scaffolding for these families in a way in which we can see progress through time. It takes time for them to develop their, their second language knowledge and um, having this time is really important. Uh, and some of these scaffolds can include pairs and teachers working together to support students learning in early elementary grades, training for parents in the process of immersion. Target language needs to be used in systematic, direct, and explicit lessons. Kindergarten through second grade will pay closer attention to academic and basic vocabulary. We will be mindful on the development of stamina for students to continue to grow and extend the amount of time they can work productively. And last but not least, focused teaching will be delivered in small groups and one-on-one, -on -one, depending on student needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. As, as the slide switches to the next screen, um, the first thing I will say is ditto for middle school to everything that Diana said. That was one of our um, wonderful awareness points when we were having these meetings is how consistent the, the strong points were from elementary to middle to high school. Everybody talked consistently about the need for strong instruction, great assessment, ongoing feedback, um, those, are just, those are just ongoing. I'm gonna make a couple of additional comments about the middle school. Um, the relationship piece that Diana talked about we know is so important for middle school kids, especially our sixth graders as they're transitioning to middle school. It is the beginning of their secondary school experience and we know that we need to do this transition carefully, thoughtfully, and we need to do it very well. Um, and the relationship piece of that sixth grade transition is so important. Learning the routines of middle school is very important. And if we're in an early e-learning environment, it's going to be just as important for us to teach them. We had lots of discussion about the middle school schedule. Um, when we look back to last year and we think of the, the constant conversation or the ongoing conversation we had about that, um, we know now that looking at a, a modified schedule for um, the middle school in an e-learning environment will be very important. Some of the benefits for kids will be that they can focus on fewer classes during the day. They'll also be able to spend less time on their screens listening to directions because teachers won't talk for 85 minutes of that class period. We also know that we'll be able to help stretch that energy and sustain it through the end of the day. Part of our experience last spring made it very evident to us that by three o'clock in the afternoon, 12, 13, and 14 year olds were worn out and it was hard for teachers to get a lot out of the kids in that seventh hour of the day. Um, the blocks of scheduling time will also give teachers more opportunities to meet with small groups and provide personalized instruction to help provide support or enrichment, whatever it is that's needed at the time. Um, the beginning of the year, this type of schedule will be especially conducive to being able to afford the time to that relationship building, those team building opportunities, being able to really develop that classroom community. A couple of um, comments about immersion. We know that we want to continue to focus on that authentic language experience and a lot of discussion has happened about what that might look like. Um, pairing students up in different age levels for authentic language experiences was just one of those ways um, that we can help make that happen. And now Mike, if we can go on to the high school, I'm going to highlight just a few more comments that are specific to the high school. Again, everything that Diana talked about also translates to this, but a few additional comments. Before the school year starts, um, there are a few recommendations for high school staff. One of them is that they really want to look at their assessments to make sure that they're accurately assessing what the students know and what the kids can do in relation to all of their essential learnings. 
when teachers are planning their lessons, it's important to remember that every lesson that goes live is recorded for students to access for whatever reason may not be able to be present in class. From that discussion, we also talked a lot about how those processes need to be consistent. They need to be clear. They need to be communicated to both students and parents so that everybody knows the consistent method that this is happening. As e-learning is occurring, um, there was a lot of discussion how to support students who are struggling. With whatever the struggling elements of the high school program may be, having good processes in place to streamline those conversations and get support to the kids, whether it be attendance, whether it be homework, or whether it be some social issues, we want to make sure that the kids are getting the help as needed. And lastly, immersion was also a point of conversation. Um, they talked a lot about the virtual opportunities that exist in our world to have authentic language experiences to really reinforce the conversational aspects of both Chinese and Spanish for our immersion students. And, and when you read the report, um, members of the school board, you probably saw a lot of the specifics that they listed. Um, so it's exciting to see some of those conversations that they're having. And lastly, a, a dominant thread of the com, um, conversation about the high school was continuing to support our students in their um, social and emotional health, whether it's with their peers, whether it's with their families, or just some struggles that they're having with themselves. But that will be a continued area of focus to make sure that our kids are just doing well as we go through an e-learning experience. So our last slide really highlights um, the work that we did as we um, talk about the different things that are important at all school levels, we know that these things have to happen to, for the support of an e-learning environment. We know that our students and parents are so critical to have in terms and have together in terms of understanding and knowing what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and how they can communicate with us. So lastly, in closing, we know that it was very important for us to provide structure, yet allow um, the individuality of teachers. Teaching is a prescribed science. It's not a prescribed science, it's an art. And we want our plan to allow that art to prevail so that teachers are able to do what they do best, yet do it in an e-learning environment to provide the best possible experience for our students. Because we know that in Minnetonka, we have awesome kids, we have amazing teachers and we have families who really care. So our plan is pretty comprehensive in making it better than what it was last spring. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Hobb. Uh, the next uh, presentation is by Tim Alexander, who has uh, just retired from the district as the executive director of uh, human resources and he's been employed for the month of July and August to help us transition our uh, Human Resources Department to the new Executive Director. And uh, Mr. Alexander is gonna cover option three, hybrid A, which is basically students in school one day and then home the next and so forth. So kind of following that pattern. So I'll let him do that explaining, Mr. Alexander. You're still muted, Mr. Alexander. Okay. Should we move to the next option uh, and come back? Uh, would that be all right, Mr. Alexander? Shake, nod your head, yes, yeah. okay. okay. So uh, the next option is option four, hybrid B which has uh, elementary students in school more and secondary students at home more, but still a hybrid model where they're not in school all the time, but they rotate. And the leader of that team is uh, Mr. Joe Walker, who's the principal at Scenic Heights Elementary. 
Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, first, I want to just thank our group that worked on option four and hybrid B. We had about 20 committee members, administrators, teachers, and parents, and they represented elementary, middle, and high school. Um, I really want to organize the presentation um, as we look at it into number one, an overview, and then hit the different levels, elementary, middle, and high school as we move forward. So when we looked at it, we had K through three students um, in the building coming in most of the time. So in our committee, we decided that the K through three kids would come in Monday through Thursday. And with those kids coming in Monday through Thursday, if we had 50% capacity in those days, um, we deduced that um, they could go to their elementary school in their neighborhood. And then on Fridays, uh, the four or five students would also be able to go into the building and focus would be mainly on math and literacy with some science, those things that you just really have to do in-house. Then when we get to the um, middle school, we were looking at having in the high school and the, the rest of the time for those kids mainly in online four through 12, we really wanted to focus on the kids that had the highest need. So we really wanted to focus on the at-risk students and get them into the building as much as possible because we noticed that during the online in the spring that those students suffered the most. So the big overview is again, getting the K through three kids in the, in the building as much as possible, getting four or five in a little bit, and then four through 12, those students that were at risk. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into some of the scheduling at the elementary and some of the um, protocols that we need to do to support that. So again, we talked about some of the schedule already at the elementary. We'd also have an online portion for those parents that weren't comfortable with their students coming in. And again, four or five would be there um, on Fridays. And then again, um, those kids with the highest risk would be there every day in person. And so in our core classes, the priority would be given again to literacy and math, and then science would be added for four or five. Instruction would happen in the target language and immersion, and a classroom teacher would be essentially responsible for their regular size class, but that class would be split up into two pods. Um, and those would be for those kids that are in the building K3. So as the teacher was instructing in one room or pod learning um, space, the other students in that half of the class would also be in a separate room to keep that social distancing. And they'd be supervised with the para. They would have streaming from the teacher's direct instruction to the other class so that they would be getting the instruction from the teacher and they would get supervision from the paraprofessional who would help those students in the other class. And then the next day, the teacher would switch classes. And what this does, one of the advantages of it is that it really minimizes the contact between um, the teacher moving from class to class and between the students. Then as we look at um, some of our specials, art is really difficult at home and so we would have supply boxes. And so we would hand out to parents um, once a week supply boxes and then the um, instruction there would be live streamed or recorded so it allowed some flexibility. Music would need to be delivered via live stream or pre-recorded and it's possible for teachers still to do individual lessons for instruments. And then FIAD would be delivered virtually with an emphasis on giving families menu of options and to accomplish each of the objectives. So as we look at that, um, that's our kind of instruction or in, um, you know, those who are in the classroom. And then online would really focus on a lot of the elements that uh, Dr. Hoff talked about in her instruction. When we go to the middle school, what we really focus on is a block schedule for online. So as we look at our block schedule for online, we have an A day and a B day. It would start out with an advisory for 30 minutes because we really felt it was really important for the mental health of the students to build those relationships. So that would be 30 minutes. And then it would move into their um, first block of the day, which would be a 95 minute block. And then there would be three blocks in a day. So essentially the students over an A and a B day would have six instructional core classes. 
And then they'd have their lunch, and then again, 95 minutes. And in that time, it would start out with uh, the teacher being live and working with them, giving them like five, 15 minutes instructions out of that 95 minutes, and then also allowing those students then to do some practice. And then the teacher would stay online with those students that had questions and helping small groups as they align. Again, this allowed um, the students to focus on only three main classes during the day. And then there would also be during this class, or this uh, A and B day, there'd be a wellness group. And this is again to really focus on their mental health needs. And that would be uh, taught by a combination of the FIED teachers and also the health teachers. And that was really important so that, again, those students can actually start getting those relationships that are so important as we look at the, um, um, the middle school student. And then when we went into the high school students, we had an A day, a B day, and we also had a, a mass day. And that was really important because the mass day would be a day in which um, they can catch up and they can do some assignments. So when we look at it, the A day would be the first period, would be 8.30 to 10 a.m., and then 10.15 to 11.45 would be the second period. Again, it's a block schedule, and then they also have a third period and a lunch. And so then on a B day, you would have that repeated with a fourth period, a fifth period, and a sixth period. But then the C day would be a mass day. And that would be um, 8 to 9.30. They'd be a pre-scheduled in-person mass for students, and that would be by alphabet. And then at 10.30 to 12 o'clock, it would be pre-scheduled in-person mass for students and to Z. And then 12 to 12.30 would be flex time. And then the afternoon uh, provided some time for work and collaboration. Now again, all these le levels, middle, high school, grade four and five, the highest need students that were determined by a committee, we have right now um, student support teams. Those student support teams would um, look at each student case by case and they would bring those students in. Those would also be the students that would need to be transported into the school. So again, the focus on this one, the strength of it is you get the students with the greatest need, the very youngest students, and the students four through 12, and you get them in the buildings. And again, it's based on their risk, risk factor. Because again, the middle and the high school could have 50% capacity still. And again, you bring in those kids that you really need to. You would also focus on the high school and bring in Vantage. You'd also focus on the science research because those things were pretty important as well. So when we look at this again, um, it's got, you know, all these programs have uh, pluses and minuses. I think, again, this strength is, you know, we had a lot of kids that just weren't successful. But at the same time, we do have some kids that were very successful. So it's really trying to, again, get the most help with the kids with the most need. So that's kind of our, our um, hybrid B model for option four. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. You're welcome. Mr. Alexander, do you think your technology is ready? I believe I'm back. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Peterson. So um, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time here just talking about uh, option three or hybrid A. Uh, before I do, I just really need to spend just a couple minutes and talk about the incredible commitment to my from my team. I had 20 people who worked a tremendous amount of time and hours and spent a lot of time just really digging through every aspect of this plan. And just from my perspective, really was inspiring to watch the commitment that they put into working on these things. Um, the model that, that, that we, were, we were faced with was finding a model that would allow for all students to have some face-to-face -face instruction combined with some amount of streamed instruction every single week. And so our group landed on a plan that basically, if it were a 50-50 model, would divide the students basically into two groups. Um, you would have one group of students who would um, be face-to-face -face instruction on Monday and Tuesday, you would have a second group of students who had face-to-face -face instruction on Thursday and Friday. Wednesday would be a what the high school refers to as a mass day um, that would be used for both remediation and enhancement opportunities. So 
the first thing that we that we talked a little bit about was would it be possible for this plan to be rolled out using the current transportation model? And after having conversations with, with Mr. Bourgeois, we decided, yes, that we could do it. That if this were the model that was chosen, we could use the same three-tiered system that we currently have in place. Obviously, the challenge is um, making sure that students very clearly understand which days they're going to be attending school and which days they're going to be staying home doing the streamed instruction. So there's always going to be challenges with that. But in terms of having to, to restructure transportation, um, we really felt strongly that it could work. In terms of the high school side of this model, um, we really kind of looked at the, the, the one piece that we felt was very successful during the spring was the idea of the block schedule and reducing the number of classes each day that they were responsible for. So in this particular model, um, on Mondays, as an example, um, periods one, two, and three would be run. It'd be run on a block schedule type system. On the second day of instruction for those students, they would have periods four, five, and six. Um, the one uh, piece that we felt uh, could work very efficiently in this is that we could start with period one at eight in the morning and we could run those periods straight through and we wouldn't then have a need to um, serve lunch at school but that the students could actually pick up their lunch as they were exiting the building uh, kind of alleviates that issue and 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 just kind of a, a an element that we thought could could work quite well uh, Wednesdays, it was, we decided was an extremely important day. There has to be an opportunity for students to be able to get that additional support, um, either um, when they have a, a lack of understanding from their face-to-face -face instruction or when they're heading into their face-to-face -face instruction to make sure that there's an opportunity for them to be able to connect with their teachers. Um, there's a lot of detail in our plan about entering and exiting the building and how all of those things would work. Um, I'm not going to go into all those. Obviously, we had a lot of discussion about immersion and, and uh, the need to really enhance um, uh, instruction on the, the days when they were face to face and really provide that opportunity for them to still be engaged in that language when they were getting streamed instruction. Um, one of the things that did come up in our discussion, which I, which I thought was kind of unique, was if we were to go with this type of model or maybe some of the other hybrid models, an opportunity to connect um, high school students with middle school students and elementary students in a similar language in order to provide some mentor-mentee opportunities um, to try to continue to, to work on language development. Uh, so as I mentioned, lunch is not really an issue with the high school because we would be providing that on the way out. Probably the biggest concern, and I think we heard about a little bit in some of the comments uh, earlier this evening, was um, space utilization. And even at 50% of the students in the building, um, it is going to be a challenge to put 15 high school students in a classroom and still maintain that social distancing. So. We know that there will be some logistical issues associated with that, but we also felt that there's enough large spaces in the high school at 50% that um, a lot of teachers could find alternative spaces to be able to spread their students out. Um, as far as special ed and ELL, obviously um, there's always gonna be a need to slightly adjust face-to-face -face instruction for those students and provide the opportunity to increase that face-to-face -face instruction if it's necessary. Um, not a lot of difference at the middle school. We would still run a similar model at the middle school with a, a Monday, Tuesday, or a Thursday, Friday. We actually had a, a fair amount of back and forth discussion about um, the idea of block schedule versus the idea of the traditional schedule. And to be quite honest with you, I don't think we ever landed on it. I think. I think we, there's, there's mixed feelings about 
how that should work. Um, I think you've heard some some people indicate that the block schedule probably is is a better direction to go um, to allow them focus on fewer classes on a day. And certainly our model could easily easily work that direction. Um, I think in at all three levels, um, high school, middle school, elementary, there's certainly going to have to be an e-learning opportunity because there are going to be parents that are going to choose that option. Um, it's one of the advantages to building the plans, I think, build the plans that there is a very robust e-learning plan that's been built. And every single one of us who have a hybrid model will be able to use a lot of the work that the e-learning group did to enhance e-learning within, within any one of our plans. At the elementary level, again, we, we talked about a very similar thing with an A-B schedule, um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. One of the biggest changes to the daily schedule for elementaries was the idea was of ending the school day an hour early at elementary. We decided for safety reasons primarily Either, either having the students go to specials or having specialists come in the classroom just added an extra element that we just didn't feel was necessary. We felt that virtual specials, um, e-learning specials that were either um, live streamed or recorded could work very nicely. Um, and that um, the last, this would, this in doing, in, in building, Building the model the way that we, it would provide common planning time for all teachers at the end of the day. There really wouldn't be any, uh, any prep to the day because they would not be going to specials during the day. So having the last hour of the day to prep, um, by the time the students got home, their, their, their special uh, would, would already have been delivered to them and they could choose whatever time of of the day or the evening they chose to complete that lesson, as long as that lesson was completed before the next lesson arrived. Um, we talk a lot about entering and exiting the building at the elementary because it's, we know the challenges of, of uh, social distancing at the elementary. We've heard all those comments already this evening. Um, we also know that we really would have to have individual spaces in every classroom for students to be able to have a safe space for them to have their own materials. Um, we talked about having a laundry tub for every single student to be able to put their materials in every single day and so that they weren't mixing and, and sharing. We also felt that recess was an extremely important part of the elementary and that there needed to be a system to be able to provide recess every single day for students. They need to have that physical activity um, we, we designed some protocols around use of the playground and designing the playground around zones and the important pieces associated with that. And at both the middle school and at the elementary, um, we felt that eating lunch in the classroom was going to be the safest way to do it. Um, and we designed some protocols around that. Um, and, and obviously, then there's, there's all of the pieces associated with um, how do we create a valuable, viable experience um, that is equal to what's happening in the face-to-face -face environment when students are at home having their, having their lessons streamed? So that's just kind of a general overview. If there's questions, certainly I can answer any at the end. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Did you want to say that? Thank you, Mr. Alexander. I appreciate that. Uh, good explanation. Uh, the next option we're going to share with you is uh, option five, which is hybrid C, and that's the one with double session. So uh, morning session and an afternoon session. And uh, uh, the leader on that team is uh, Jeff Erickson, our high school principal. So, Mr. Erickson. All right. Thank you, Deputy. Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board. So tonight I'll walk through a little bit of our, our plan. First, I want to thank all the members that were part of this team. Uh, we really worked at each of the levels to make sure we could have student contact as a priority. And so if you think about this plan overall, just in one sentence, if it were on a bumper sticker, it's just simply the, the kind of the old days of kindergarten where we had the AM and PM session. 
So we would be looking at that model uh, really for all of the levels. So at the elementary level, uh, there would be two different shifts. There'd be one at starting at 7.30 and the AM session, and then the PM session would be starting at 12.30. Uh, it would be a mix of in-person and e-learning. So if you're in the morning session, you would be uh, having e-learning in the afternoon. <clears throat> Math, reading, language arts, social studies, science instruction would, would be from their teacher every day. And as I mentioned, there'd be e-learning in the afternoon. A uh, full day of instruction would be provided. Uh, there'd be a break in the middle of the day to allow for transportation, cleaning, teacher prep. Again, the, really the benefit of this plan is that the students will see their teacher every day. A uh, bag lunch would, would be provided, students would eat in their classroom. Uh, initially, we looked at this plan of having two uh, longer sessions. There'd be staffing implications. Uh, with this plan, there would not be significant staffing implications, and there would be common planning time in the middle of the day for teachers, and it would allow also for a plan for uh, keep special education students for a full day if that were needed. So those are some of the highlights from the elementary level. And really, you'll see some consistency in the plan from as well in the middle school. Same thing, you'd have an AM and PM shift, and you'd have periods one, two, and three on one uh, day and the next day be four, five, and six. It would be a mix of in-person and e-learning as well. So if you had the AM session, you would have e-learning in the afternoon. Uh, there'd be a break in the middle of the day for transportation and cleaning. Um, every other day electives would be in the mix as well uh, for students to have that opportunity. And uh, there would be no additional teachers needed for that. So again, the benefit of this at the middle school is that students are seeing teachers, uh, it's an A day, B day, uh, but uh, they are seeing their teachers and having that direct content. So AM, again, the instructional part, if they're in that in the afternoon would be e-learning. So similarly at the high school, um, there would be uh, half days for the students and you would have AM and PM session. So an example on an A day, you would have the AM session at periods one, starting at 7.30 and then wrapping up at 10.30. And then if you're in the PM session, you'd be starting at 1230 with periods one, two, and three. At the high school level, um, they, if they're in the morning session and the afternoon, they would have specific assignments to be doing. Um, there'd be that alternate A day, B day. Uh, we also built into this that uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday would be those, those specific A day, B days. Uh, then on Wednesdays would be what we traditionally uh, look for in terms of masked there would be distance learning e-learning for all students but there would be office hours uh, there would be a chance for students to be in the building to receive support um, and receive any assistance same thing in this case if they were uh, needing lunch there would be opportunity for a bag lunch or i'm certain some students are wondering if there would be banana bread i'm sure that would still be an option so uh, that would be the option for the high school the a day uh, b day so all these plans in this particular uh, hybrid allow for students to have interactions uh, with their teacher uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So those are the highlights. I wanna thank our team for all of their work and uh, I will turn it back to you, Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Appreciate your leadership on this one. Uh, the next presentation is on option six, which was hybrid D and it has uh, elementary in school uh, more than secondary and uh, secondary at least a day a week. And uh, the leader of this team is Kurt Carpenter, who is the principal at Clear Springs Elementary. Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Dr. Peterson and Madam Chair, members of the board and good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Dronin, I believe will be sharing our presentation we have a Google Doc that he's going to bring up. And as you can see right off the top, we have an amazing team. And I really wanted to share this as part of our presentation to illustrate that uh, these people are just 20 of the amazing people that have uh, helped with teams all over the district. And I'm really, really grateful. Tonight, uh, we have Jonathan Nelson helping with our grade six through eight presentation. He's our lead of that team. And Mr. Dronin, you can just go ahead and and scroll if you would please um, as i as i talk here uh, we have clinton fenner who took the lead with our grade 9 through 12 team we have as you can see many excellent teachers parents 
who all helped. Uh, Cindy Andrus, our grade K through five lead, and Jenny Badurka as our pre-K lead. Uh, we determined early on uh, we were faced with a very challenging model, and so we broke our option down into four groups with Jenny, Cindy, Jonathan, and Clinton taking the lead and uh, great representation on each group. The parameters we faced were really challenging. Monday, high school, in school, using any facility they needed to do, needed to use. Grades six through eight on Tuesday, in school, in person, and elementary students in school, in person, Wednesday through Friday. Again, using any facilities we needed to use to maintain six foot social distancing. When students were not in school in person, they're e-learning in this model. So if you can continue to scroll. Uh, one thing that we uh, did not leave in the presentation tonight were guidelines for community education, health screening, special education, English language learners, section 504 plans, Wilson reading intervention and child nutrition. Uh, those areas apply to all subgroups and we did not include those for tonight, but they are part of our long version of our document. So we're gonna hop to each presenter now. I'm gonna welcome in Jenny Badurka to go next. Good evening, can you hear me? All right, well, I had the opportunity to work with a group to do some planning for preschool. Um, and preschool is unique because it's really already a hybrid in nature. Uh, families choose to register and attend anywhere from two to five days per week for approximately three hours each time they attend. So as we look uh, to operate preschool in a reduced class capacity, we will need to reassign classes, change some class times, and we may need to eliminate some sections of preschool. We do intend to continue offering wraparound junior explorers childcare for families, as we know that is a critical component of their ability to participate. Uh, as we look at making these changes, we recommend giving priority to our four-year-old preschool classes, as this will be their final year before they would start kindergarten. And we also would look in this model at considering using kindergarten rooms at our elementary schools on Monday and Tuesday when they're not being used uh, to have some shorter preschool sessions. Uh, we do wanna acknowledge in regard to virtual preschool that it would be uh, very strongly parent driven. And so figuring out ways to make that most flexible. Uh, we do recommend a lot of frequent small group meetings to help teachers build relationships with students. And we also would recommend curriculum-based activity kits that families could take home uh, and do those with their children, not in a virtual uh, format. Um, parent education support is something that came up a lot that will need to be critical as part of preschool and a hybrid model, uh, helping support mental health and social emotional needs for our young learners and their families. And finally, I'd just like to note um, that our preschool is a fee-based program. So operating at a reduced capacity could have some budget implications for our program. And we may need to seek approval from the school board and Dr. Peterson to increase fees for our preschool programming. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And turning it over to Cindy Andrus, Minnewashta principal. Thank you, Cindy. So the elevator version of our option, uh, there are two concepts that we set out to describe, an online bubble group for Monday, Tuesday, combined with an in-person bubble group for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You can look at the figure that, that kind of helps you pictorially see what we're talking about. And then a parent choice online bubble group for all year long. So a question to answer would be who are bubble group members? And there are adults that will include grade level classroom teachers, special education staff, specialists, uh, paraprofessionals, and other staff along with students. Bubbles of safety um, for the school year include grade level teaching teams for all modalities of teaching, whether we're in person, in a hybrid, or on, in an online model. The hope would be to maximize resources for the benefit of all students minimize the risk of interruption and exposure, maximize the amount of uninterrupted in-person learning, and provide flexibility of staff and students 
for uh, absences. Uh, the bubble model, uh, the bubble group model we propose is a Monday through Friday all day model. Bubble groups, again, are groups of students and staff organized by grade levels across the districts. Uh, we landed on recommending students be grouped heterogeneously. Students stay in the same group with the same adults assigned to a bubble. They remain in designated classrooms. Uh, teachers rotate through those classrooms within the same bubble. And each grade level teaching team will be assigned specific spaces within the school, including classrooms, restrooms, entrances, exits, outdoor spaces, a schedule for using the gym, multi-purpose room, and other out outside spaces that are possible. And when in person, students will stay in those designated spaces and teachers will rotate when that's needed. Uh, when do bubble groups meet and where? Bubble groups meet Monday and Tuesday online and in sc at school in person on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we believe there were some benefits to this type of model. Uh, it focuses on building community. It encourages that strong teacher, parent, and student collaboration increases communication opportunities for all. It meets all the criteria we were provided uh, by Dr. Peterson, and there are many details that I'm not sharing with you now. Addresses in-person and online scenarios with intention. Details are provided in each of those sections. It provides daily contact with teachers for students. Access to teachers is consistent. It shares the academic teaching load, and I'll describe that in just a moment, help students teach or learn the required standards Monday through Friday with intentionality. Learning is able to occur from home without an excessive burden on families, and it limits exposure and travel for our specialists. So the in-person bubble group on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will provide learning opportunities uh, for in-school days that are primarily in math, literacy, social emotional learning, developing friendships and deepening relationships, and opportunities with our specialist via an engaging curriculum. In the full document, you'll see each one of those priorities uh, detailed, and those were the priorities for our committee. Uh, the in-person bubble group, again, will focus primarily on math and literacy, and there are reasons for that and the rationale that we um, laid out. Um, the state is, is planning to assess uh, this year, and so we need we know we need to focus on math, reading, and fifth grade science. Um, both English and immersion will be more effectively taught if they are taught more in depth in person. And we know learning in any language will not be dependent on a parent primarily. The online experience part of the hybrid option on Monday and Tuesdays, um, we thought about that as a way of including experiential learning experiences with social studies science, health taught online, Monday and Tuesday, by a group of teachers that specialize in this content, and suggestions on how that might work are also detailed in the document. Again, the, the benefits of this Monday-Tuesday bubble um, includes, again, daily contact for students, consistent teacher access, a sharing of the academic load, because at school we're focusing on math and literacy and those social emotional things, Online, we're focusing primarily on science, social studies, and health. Um, there's intentionality that will be able to occur Monday through Friday through all the content areas. Learning at home would be able to occur without an extensive burden on the families. And we, be we believe this provides an opportunity for volunteers in uh, this Monday, Tuesday model of parents who might be experts in this area as well. The third, the third thing that we outlined in detail was a parent choice online all year and how a bubble group might apply um, to that. Kurt? All right, thank you, Cindy. Uh, Jonathan Nelson, MME teacher, take it away. MMW, I remember that. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kurt. Um, for the middle school level, I'd like to start by talking about the in-school experience. Um, in this particular model, we teachers only have one in-school day with our students, and we had a lot of discussion about what we wanted that day to look like, and we settled on the fact that we really need this day to be about building those relationships uh, with our students. 
And we also very clearly understood that students were really missing um, just being able to see each other, just having that face-to-face -face interaction with uh, their teachers and their peers. And so uh, down below, we do have a link to multiple types of schedules that we drew up, but pasted here in the document is just an example of that with um, three essentially waves of students coming into the school with 20 minute classes going through their entire schedule and having a 15 minute transition period between um, those waves or cohorts of students. Now, um, this is something that we drew up and it is of course yet to be uh, tested by the fire of reality. And so this is something that we definitely suspect um, would uh, probably have to undergo some changes. Um, down below the schedule, we do have some details about the cohorts and sticking with this nine to one student teacher ratio. Um, this is kind of where we got our initial schedule and having students come in three different ways. Um, in this paragraph detailed here is just a bit of number crunching, uh, but uh, essentially each of these cohorts would be about 150 students in order for it to um, work out with this student teacher ratio. Um, additionally, in the next paragraph here, with regards to space and the buildings, we believe that both East and West could accommodate our space needs, but we would need more research to be done on actual specific size of classrooms, as well as um, ventilation in those classrooms. So those were some questions that uh, we also had about, about space. Another issue that came up that presented a pretty significant challenge for us was the AB schedule at the middle level. Um, if we were to include all of those specials that happen on A days and B days, we would be working with 25 plus different classes. And so we proposed that with the in-school days, uh, we kind of have like an A week and a B week to, to accommodate all of those classes. Lunch, uh, this is another challenge of our particular model this currently does not include a duty-free lunch for teachers and so that is something that we will have to continue to work through as this uh, uh, model gets more detailed uh, of course like every model here it would have to follow the cdc guidelines as well as the health and safety guidelines given out by the minnesota department of health moving on to the online experience um, we believe that we really do need to give teachers that choice of autonomy as to whether or not they're going to choose to conduct any given day synchronously or asynchronously. Regardless of the method, however, we believe that uh, a teacher's agenda, for example, should be posted to their Schoology course page by a set time every morning so that students can appropriately plan out their day. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> based off of uh, feedback that we got, we we clearly heard and understood that a block schedule, I think, was going to definitely improve um, our, our online delivery model at the middle level. And so uh, we do have some schedule examples linked there. We don't have to get into it, but essentially we would be breaking down, of course, a student's schedule in half so that they can more easily focus on um, half of their classes on any given day. Um, and then finally, one thing that we just wanted to really dig into and consider with this situation that we find ourselves in is how can we continue that rigorous and engaging and meaningful instruction. And I would say one of the biggest boons for us in this area is that block schedule. We frequently saw students getting exhausted halfway through the day in the online learning environment. And we strongly believe that a block schedule will uh, lessen those situations and um, help students to remain focused on all of their classes throughout the week. Um, additionally, another piece that we want to see uh, bolstered in, in this model is more student-to-student -student communication tools in the online um, model. So, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, very much. Uh, Clinton Fenner from Minnetonka High School, take it away. Uh, thank you, Kurt. For the high school in the forefront of our minds and discussions was the six feet social distancing and the ratio of 15 students to one teacher in the classroom or approximately 50% capacity. All of our different scenarios led to the same limiting factor, which was the number of qualified licensed teachers that would maintain the required 50% capacity and the high level of academic rigor expected from all stakeholders. The high school's long tradition of allowing students to choose their course, path course pathways throughout their 9-12 experience did not allow for an easy way to group, cluster, or bubble students based on their course schedules. 
Therefore, our group decided to use the high school for instruction on Mondays while students move to meet their teachers per their assigned schedule. The in-person experience would run one day, twice of the block schedule of the six period day. One week would have periods one through three, and the next week periods four through six alternating. The student population would be split in half with a morning and afternoon session. This should keep class size on average to approximately 15 students or less. For larger classes, such as band, orchestra, and FIED, they would continue to use larger classrooms, gyms, or outdoor spaces to keep six feet social distance. All teachers would be encouraged to use outdoor areas for learning when possible, and of course, weather permitting. The expectation for the day is that no new instruction from the teachers, but supplemental enrichment activities that deepen the learning experience could be expected, such as hands-on activities. The in-person time would be viewed as supportive to learning, but not essential. There would not be expectations for the teacher to record and share the in-person classrooms on Monday, but the activities that would occur in this in-person time would include student questions about existing content, hands-on opportunities to enrich learning, labs, culinary labs, metals, arts, physical education, other supplemental enrichment activities for teacher discretion, check out physical textbooks, novels, and materials to be used during e-learning for the rest of the week, community building, and social emotional support. The out-of-school e-learning will have a similar AB block schedule and expectations similar to spring of 2020. With the addition of students that are missing assignments or in need of extra support would be expected to work with the teacher during the work time within the block schedule. Expectations for teachers during the out-of-school time are kind of as followed. Established office hours for students to ask questions of their teachers during the week virtually. These times can be built into the e-learning block schedule or be at the beginning or end of the day. Administrative discretion for consistency purposes throughout the school. And this came from a lot of parents, student, um, uh, and teachers kind of surveys throughout the year. Check in with students during assigned class time, common routine by each teacher, common Schoology formatting, live Google Meets and Schoology groups, and when possible, lessons should be recorded for students to view and review at a later time, along with small group discussions when possible. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Clinton, and back to you, Dr. Peterson and the board. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter and all the other presenters. I appreciate uh, that presentation. So the last option we're going to present to you tonight is option seven, <clears throat> which is hybrid E. And uh, it's having elementary in school most of the time and secondary in uh, school uh, one or two days a week. So uh, Freya Schermacher is the new principal at Minnetonka Middle School West, and she led this team. Rhea? Thank you, Dr. Peterson, and Chair, members of the board. I also want to acknowledge all the community members out there who care enough to watch this uh, live. I mean, this is very important, so I appreciate your patience as we work through this. Um, before we start, I, I too would like to acknowledge uh, the team that worked so hard on this plan, a team of parents, teachers, administrators from all level, really digging in, trying to find the best possible options for your kids. So I just want to acknowledge them, um, and you can move to the next slide, please, um, and their work. One of the things that Governor Wall said last week was that the community is owed the best plan with the best resources, with the best communication. And I think that this process that we've been experiencing the past few weeks is really designed to get the best possible outcome for our students. So thank you all for your patience and for watching along at home. Um, just to start with our plan, there were a few uh, assumptions and considerations when we started. Um, obviously, we're following the guidelines set forth by MDE and MDH. We also took a comprehensive look at all of the space in our district, what our current staffing is, what contractual obligations we have. Um, and then we looked at district-wide services, obviously nutrition services, special education, um, custodial services, transportation, all of those things uh, we considered when designing our plan. So moving forward, this is kind of the 10,000 view of our plan. This is a summary. Essentially, we are a, this is a graduated continuum of in-person instruction moving towards e-learning based on grade level, educational programming, as well as demonstrated need. So just starting with K-3, K-3 students will be in school all of the time at a 50% capacity. 
So they will be using all of the elementary spaces. Students will be in their home schools, following their regular schedule with specials included in the day. Uh, there will be 15 student pods with team teaching, and I'll go more into detail later in the presentation. So moving on to fourth and fifth grade, they will be in school four days per week, again at 50% classroom capacity. They will be at Minnetonka High School. Fridays will be reserved for e-learning days, small group instruction, or individual support. And again, they will be in 50% capacity pods, which at the high school are between 15 and 17 students. So sixth through eighth grade middle school will be split into two teams going to school twice per week. There will be two days live instruction and then two days flip instruction online. And again, one day per week will be reserved for e-learning, small group work, or individual support and intervention. The high school will have four days of e-learning, and this will follow the block schedule that, that they had at the high school in the spring. One day per week will be reserved for face-to-face -face instruction. This could be small group or individual support. And there's also the opportunity for mod modified hybrid options for specialized courses at the high school, which could take place throughout the week. And again, I'll go into that as we proceed. As, as kind of an overall umbrella for all of these options, we have an e-learning option available for all. Um, and that will be a parallel course, which follows the same so scope and sequence of the in-person course with staff support. Um, students can transition to this plan at any time due to health reasons. And families choosing this option can transition quarterly for planning purposes. So that kind of is, is overarching all of our individual grade level plans. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail with K to three. So K to three, as I mentioned, will be in-person instruction every day at their home school. So the classrooms will be at 50% capacity, which is around 15 students per class, and there will be grade level team-based instruction in 15 student pods. And what that means is, so for 15 students, there may be two classroom teachers and one para in 15 pod, in three pods. And if it was a language arts lesson, one teacher may be doing a, a comprehension lesson, one teacher may be doing a guided write, reading activity, and the para may be uh, leading independent reading. So that's kind of how the teachers and para work together in those pods. And like I said, we are using all the spaces in the elementary. So we have confirmed that we will fit. We're using the gyms, media center, uh, specialist spaces, and all the rooms so that students can space out into those 15 student, 50% capacity pods. So there'll be lunch and a recess by room. Uh, immersion students will maintain their current programming. Um, and as I mentioned, there is an e-learning option available. Okay, so for fourth and fifth grade, moving forward, they will be in-person classroom instruction at Minnetonka High School four days per week. So one day per week will be an e-learning day. This will have time for independent learning and assignments, a small group or individual check-ins, also an opportunity for explorers on that day for students who need it. So the English classrooms will be at 50% capacity, and at the high school that's between 15 and 17 students per class. However, Chinese and Spanish classrooms will maintain their current staffing and classroom numbers by use, utilizing some of the larger spaces that are available at Minnetonka High School. Uh, so again, they'll follow the same grade level team-based instruction in those 15 to 17 student pods, which could be a combination of teachers and para uh, guiding the instruction during the day. All right, so at, for fourth and fifth grade, specialists will teach in the classroom, but some will be able to use the specialized spaces that are available in the building, such as the gyms, the auditorium, and the art rooms. And again, as with the other programs, there will be uh, an e-learning option available for all. All right, so moving on to grades six, and, six through eight, the middle school students will have two days in school. So students will be split into groups uh, by alpha. So we'll have a Monday and Wednesday group or Tuesday and Thursday group, and they will be in their home buildings on those days. So all classes essentially will be split 50-50, and students will follow the regular seven period schedule during that day with a guided uh, supervised passing time. And specialists will take, uh, take place in their uh, specific spaces, such as the band room, the wood shop, et cetera. And I also wanted to point out that we are following um, MDH guidelines on choral and instrumental music. We're committed to maintaining 
uh, our music program and we will follow the guidelines that they set forth uh, by the state. So during the e-learning days, students again are going to follow their seven period schedule uh, via a flipped online instruction. So there'll be teacher, teacher and online pair support. We also talked about the option for a block schedule, uh, but because because students have the opportunity to be in person, we thought it would be best to have a seven period day, which means that students would actually see their teachers twice a week. And we know that building relationships with their teachers is so crucial for a middle school student. Um, that's why we opted for a seven period day. Okay, moving on to the high school. The high school will have four days of e-learning and one day of in-person student support via invitation. And like I said earlier, there'll be some options for a modified hybrid courses for specialized programming, such as uh, science research, Vantage music courses, and Momentum. There, there is space in the high school so they could have a modified hybrid uh, schedule for those courses. There's one day a week for in-person instruction. This could be masked, small group instruction, or modified hybrid options. This is an example of the block schedule. There'll be A and B days, similar to the spring. And each class period will incorporate synchronous learning opportunities. And this is an example of how Friday MAST might work. Um, for the month of September, the high school will be meeting with one third of each classroom each Friday so that all students will have a face-to-face -face experience with their teachers. Um, in October and January, it will be an invite only, small group instruction, individual instruction, and other intervention as needed. So just some overall logistics. Our current tiered busing system does work with this model. So we will maintain the same three-tiered system that we have with uh, the same start times. Um, this plan includes integration for pre-K and community ed, including explorers and childcare. And SPED services will continue. Um, younger students will have the IEPs fully implemented in person instruction. And older students will have individual distance learning plans. I also want to point out that there are options for students who are in specialized programs to have increased in person learning. And again, I want to thank my team and thank all of you for listening. Um, and that's Plan 7, Hybrid Option E. Thank you very much. Great presentations for all of you, and uh, appreciate your involving uh, your uh, parents and student, or your parents and uh, uh, teachers who were involved in these uh, different groups. Um, as I said earlier, we had about 600 people involved in creating and critiquing these plans, so uh, they've gone through a lot of the questions that uh, parents are thinking about already, and uh, obviously, uh, we'll take into account other uh, input on that. Uh, before we jump into uh, any discussion on the plans, uh, I want to have an update on safety measures from, first of all, Paul, Paul Bourgeois and then Annie Lombard Benson. So let's start with Paul Bourgeois on the basic uh, uh, package of safety measures that we're putting in place. All right, thank you, Dr. Pearson, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, we've been very busy uh, accumulating a lot of uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, there's a lot of logistics involved in finding the right vendors. We have our, our coordinator of purchasing, Deb Hoffman, has been able to find vendors who can actually deliver. Needless to say, uh, all of these items are in very high demand. So actually getting, uh, getting vendors uh, that can actually deliver is really important. And Deb Hoffman's been doing a very good job of that. I'm going to run down a list of 18 different items that we have in, have, have been ordering. And, and for the most part, we have in stock or it will be here within the next couple of weeks. Uh, what, we've got 80,500 cloth masks uh, for in, in the district. The idea there is that uh, it's a, that's enough for five masks for every employee and every uh, every student, they're reusable and washable. The idea is that they, you can wear them, wear a, a new one, a fresh one every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, wash it on the weekend and have it available again uh, to keep going. So that's enough to give everybody five, uh, plus uh, having you know extras for people who forget or 
we wear, wear out somehow. And, and of course, with all this stuff, we're all we're all kind of uh, building the airplane as we're flying it. So if we need to order more, you know, as as we're starting to get into this, we'll we'll you know, in actual operations, we'll order more. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I also want to add as I, before I get into the next items is. They, list, they listed out a couple of things last Thursday for, at the state level uh, regarding screen our uh, shields and, and some masks. And, and we've actually had all those things ordered in more quantity um, uh, well ahead of that. So those, those supplies will actually augment what we have. But uh, we were anticipating having to go it alone, so to speak. So that's going to be a nice addition. But we, we've been equipped to basically go it alone if we need to. Uh, we have 30,000 disposable masks for visitors or for whoever uh, forgets their uh, you know, mask on a bus or something like that or doesn't come from home with one. 16,500 uh, KN95 masks uh, for nursing staff and employees with Im uh, compromised immune systems. And uh, Dr. Peterson, uh, actually been reading a lot of information about them that they are the equivalent of an N95. And uh, Dr. Peterson actually was able to uh, uh, locate a uh, 3M uh, document that confirms that. Um, we have a uh, 500 communicator disposable masks for special education for uh, people with specific needs, students. Uh, those are a little bit different design than other things. 14,000 face shields. Uh, that's uh, enough for every employee in the district and every student. Uh, we have 1,441 milliliter hand sanitizer dispensers and 40 gallons of refills, uh, 1,000 10 ounce pump bottles of hand sanitizer and 1,016 ounce refills to go with them. And we just realized, you know, as we've uh, gotten plenty of pump sanitizers, we realized, uh, we think that we're going to go through hand sanitizer a lot. Um, and so we, we actually have 255 gallon drums of hand sanitizer on hand and uh, we can actually get cooked delivery of more drums and that will allow us, I think, to stay uh, you know, pretty flush with hand sanitizer as we move ahead. Uh, we have uh, one of the hardest things to find is disinfecting wipes. Uh, I think if you've all been in the stores, you see the kind of the, the paucity of, hand, of sanitizing wipes around. But uh, we've been able to, to uh, get 580 count cartons of disinfecting wipes for smaller uh, instructional areas. And we have 538 800 count buckets of disinfecting wipes. That's one for every uh, classroom in the district, every regular classroom. So between those two, we should be able to get everybody uh, uh, up to snuff with that. And actually what we, we're trying to place orders, uh, I have have asked uh, Deb Hoffman to continue to look. And lots of times you'll go online and you'll try to order hand sanitizer. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, disinfecting wipes, they'll have them on, but they'll say they're out of stock and you can't even place an order. So uh, she's continuing to look and I told her, get, as soon as you find some that are available, order more. Uh, they, you know, if we keep them sealed, they don't wear out. At, hopefully, if this COVID-19 gets uh, comes to pass, uh, 168,000 vinyl gloves in uh, small, medium, large, and extra large. Uh, we have bought 803 touchless trigger thermometers for every instructional space. Uh, so that's every K-12 classroom, every small group instruction classroom, uh, phi ed areas. Um, you know, any place we have students. Um, plus, and activities at the high school coaches and, and uh, those people will have to, uh, you know, make sure that they'll take temperatures. Uh, we also have 12 standalone facial scanning thermometers for main entries at the buildings. So that's one, one for every main entry. Uh, you stand in front of it and it uh, scans your face and gives you a temperature. And, it, and there's a verbal readout that uh, anybody in the, in the main office can hear. So if, it's, if it says, oh, you have a fever of 100 degrees or 105 degrees or 103 degrees, whatever, um, basically uh, office staff will be able to say, You're, you can't come in the building, you need to turn around and go home. Uh, and we have two for MHS, of course, for the front, the front entry and for the west entry. Uh, we've got uh, 3,900 decals for various uh, social distancing reminders, masks, uh, facial coverings in the building reminders and uh, standing locations for high traffic areas. And actually after hearing some of the plans for at the elementary school, we, uh, we just ordered another uh, 1500 because uh, they want to do a lot of six foot distancing on the floors, uh, a considerable amount. And so we went out and we wheeled the elementary school uh, main hallways. We found out we have 1.6 miles of hallways in the elementary schools. Uh, we purchased 206 plexiglass panels for the transaction counters in all the buildings. Uh, 
I, I, I just use the, the uh, comparison to say going to holiday gas station where they have the uh, transaction counter has a shield in front of it. So we've done that and those are deployed around the district. Um, we've ordered, we've heard various pros and cons for these next things, but we've ordered for starters, 2000 plexiglass uh, desk guard U-shaped panels and we'll deploy those around the district as people identify the specific need. Uh, we also bought 12 spray sanitizer machines, uh, one for every school and, and then uh, two for the high school. Uh, these will be used at night. Uh, last thing, after all the wipe downs and everything else, uh, they have a, 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 a sanitizer spray that we basically will fog the rooms and it will basically uh, do another final disinfectant of everything. So that will be done nightly. And then the last one uh, that we're doing, that we just placed the order, but we've been searching around uh, for uh, some really heavy duty uh, medical grade air purifiers. And we found some, um, we found, a, 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 we're, we've ordered a thousand of them. That's enough for every 694 uh, learning spaces, plus all the, um, all the offices and media centers and everything in the district. These are HEPA 13 level medical grade filters. Now, uh, what's HEPA 13? That is a level of filtering that will filter down to 0.1 micron. The COVID-19 virus is 0.125 microns. So uh, COVID-19 virus will get trapped into in these filters. And of course, if if you if the virus is not in a, a living host, it will it'll basically the, the the individual germ will die. So uh, we have these, uh, they're very high powered. Um, the filters are good for uh, 180 days at a time. So basically we'd replace them once a year, but we also look at this as a long-term investment for even after COVID-19 from the standpoint of, they will also trap flu viruses. And flu viruses are six to seven times the size of, of the COVID-19 virus. But uh, the, the, the big deal with these uh, units is that one, one of these units are 22 inches high, uh, but uh, they're very powerful. But you, so you put them in the corner of a classroom, they will purify the air uh, of an of a 840 square foot classroom of which we are, most of our classrooms are plus or minus that in 30 minutes and every 30 minutes. So you just put it in the corner, you run it all day long. Uh, then uh, we, they'll do a 1600 square foot space uh, in in uh, an hour. So some of the larger spaces like media centers will put several about. But the thing about these uh, filters also is that uh, you, you, it's it works on physics. If you put one of these in the corner of a room and they're going to be drawing air towards them and filtering, they're going to be down low, right? So if somebody is speaking and, and we all emit a little bit of spray or emit a little bit of spray when we talk, uh, you can't see it most, you know, unless you have a really good vision, I guess. But um, and uh, or if you sneeze, or you cough, you get these microscopic particles that that the COVID-19 virus has to attach to. But they're microscopic and they go out into the air. Right. So the thing is, is if they're, this, this uh, uh, filtration system will will set up. Uh, a train of air, basically, it, it'll start drawing air, it'll set airflow down towards it. And so what will happen is uh, the airflow in the building, you won't be able to see it, won't necessarily be able to feel it, but if it's microscopic, that's all you need is just a, a steady airflow, but it'll draw anything that's been emitted, it'll uh, draw it immediately down, lower, and away from a person's mouth and nose and, and eyes. So that's just, that's, that's simple physics. Uh, so uh, we think those are kind of going to kind of be our self our stealth bombers in terms of fighting this thing, and uh, have a long term uh, investment on it. And then we also um, have uh, uh, our mechanical engineers going through our buildings and verifying that our buildings, uh, all of our rooms, are in compliance with uh, 15 cubic feet per minute of fresh air. Uh, that's the latest engineering state. That's the engineering standard that they have to meet: 15 cubic feet per minute per occupant, and. Um, uh, the important thing to remember is, yeah, we do have a lot of spaces that are not air conditioned, but air conditioning is not ventilation. Ventilation is the 15 cubic feet per minute uh, that is drawn into a room per occupant, whether the air is conditioned or just fresh air coming in from the outside. So all those things are going on and um, we'll uh, keep looking for uh, wait. We, well, we've got a supply chain set up to re, uh, hopefully continue to replenish these supplies as we start seeing what the the burn rate is on them. Uh, so we've got a significant financial investment in these already. So hopefully the uh, uh, some of the CARES Act funds will be go our, come our way to help uh, offset some of those 
but uh, we're, we're spending what we need to spend to make sure that everybody's safe. So um, that's my input for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bourgeois. Uh, so next I'd like to have uh, Annie Lumbar uh, Benson, who's in charge of our health program in the district, uh, give you uh, uh, kind of a rundown on the measures that we'll use to manage and control for the uh, virus. So, uh, Ms. Benson, please uh, go ahead. Great. Dr. Peterson, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, it's truly an honor to present. And as you can see, when, when you have somebody that you work with like Paul, it, it makes this job a lot easier. So I'm sure all of us never really could have imagined that we'd be in this place right now, but here we are. So um, I have been working diligently with the school nurse leadership staff at the Minnesota Department of he Education and the Minnesota Department of Health to determine next steps, what we need to do in schools to keep kids safe. Uh, I have also been part of the leadership team that is developing guidelines for health services at the schools with the idea that, you know, eventually we'll be, we will be having in-person learning going on in some capacity and determining what we need to do to keep students and staff safe. I continued to be part of a weekly Minnesota Department of Health call that reviews current data, what we've learned, and recommendations as to how we need to adjust our practices. This information is then brought back to Dr. Peterson and district administration where within our district, we really use that multidisciplinary approach to determine what, what pieces we all have and what we need to do for safety. We did have the opportunity over the summer to bring back kids into the buildings in a limited capacity and therefore had the opportunity to test and implement some of our health protocols. And it was a wonderful opportunity. It was successful. It gave us a chance to, to trial some things, see what was successful, maybe what we needed to adapt, but overall it went quite well. I, I truly am confident in our district's ability to have in place health protocols to provide the safest possible environment for students and staff. And I can't reiterate that enough. Uh, as you have, as you were given, there are a number of protocols that we have in place. And I, I often say that these are a work in progress only because oftentimes guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control and the Minnesota Department of Health can and do change. And so we wanna be very clear that we will adapt and adjust our response as needed because um, perfect example is guidelines used to be that people needed to be fever free for three days uh, with, with symptoms and now they changed that to 48 hours, excuse me, 24 hours. So again, we wanna be flexible and able to adapt our response and, and change our protocols accordingly. So the, the items that we have in place right now, and I won't go through them point by point, but really are focusing on those social distancing strategies. How can we try to keep students as separate as possible? Because we know that if we're able to, to space them out as much as feasible, we're providing an extra layer of protection. We're going to work on minimizing exposure. Um, many of that is just in classroom setup. How are we arranging these classrooms to try to minimize exposure of children to each other? And then also focusing on those small group cohorts that when possible, we are going to be limiting kids into succinct and distinct groups so that we don't have large groups of population that are commingling. Uh, the really the reason behind that not only is risk exposure that we again we want to try to minimize that risk, but also that that if we do have a positive case that with contact tracing we have a smaller group that we need to manage versus a large group that they might have been exposed to. Part of the other piece of this that's going to be probably of the utmost importance is just really those health reminders for our staff and families, those messages that we continue to put out on a regular basis about ways that families can help to, and, and staff can help to minimize the risk. And that focuses on good public health hygiene practices, hand washing, potentially incorporating hand washing hygiene into the classroom protocols, making it a part of the classroom routines, reinforcing that students and staff, when they are ill, that they should be staying home. This is not the time to push through and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling okay, not great, but I'll just go. So again, reinforcing those messages that we really have a mutual responsibility to each other to stay home when we're sick and err on the side of caution 
so that we're, again, minimizing risk for others. Another is our system of arrival into the building. We're still working on those procedures. We had the opportunity to pilot it again at our summer programming. We're currently discussing with transportation, what will that look like for kids on the bus? How, how is our most efficient way of doing screening? Is it at the bus stop? Is it having a para on the bus? That's still to be decided, but that whole screening protocol will be in place for not only kids arriving on the bus, but students arriving by car. And also addressing those kids that are late or arriving to school late, that they would also be screened and that we'll have a system in place for that. Another one is just continuing to provide a safe environment. As Paul uh, indicated, we have lots of measures in place. And I think what's important to look at is we are providing layers of protection with all of the things that we're doing with masking, with face shields, with the air purifiers. We are providing layered tiers of protection for our students and staff. And again, there's a number of things that we can do to incorporate those safe environments. I won't get into the specific details, but trying to minimize the sharing of items as much as possible. Um, it, it, it changes how we're doing meals, all of those different pieces that again, we're, we're really focusing on creating a safe environment as possible. And then with excluding for illness, the school nurse will be the, the point of contact for COVID concerns at each building. And then I will support those nurses and then district staff in managing those. At this point, we are um, working very closely with the Minnesota Department of Health and using their exclusion guidelines in terms of what it would look like if we had a COVID positive case, what next steps would need to happen. And I think what's really important to note is that each case needs to be looked at on its own merits because each situation is unique. So MDA, excuse me, the Minnesota Department of Health's recommendations would be based on the very specific unique circumstances of that case. And then they would help us with the next steps about notifications that would need to occur, if any additional in-depth cleaning would need to occur, and would also support us if decisions needed to be made because of a large number of COVID positive cases that are traced back to one source. They may, may make recommendations about closing a classroom or closing a school. So we will work very closely with them on what next steps need to happen when we have a COVID positive case, who needs to be notified and the different pieces that would go with that. And again, we would continue to follow MDH's exclusion guidelines, which can and do change. Um, they're currently in the works of making some revisions on that. And then we've just outlined the process of what would happen if we are informed of a lab confirmed COVID positive case and the steps that would happen, who would be notified and then chain of command and how, how we process that. And then really you know, sharing that information in a timely and appropriate manner on a need to know basis. So that's a, a very brief summary of um, the, the health protocols that we are exploring and they likely will be expanded and added as we find out new information. And again, as the Minnesota Department of Health and Centers for Disease Control make new recommendations for us. But I, I am fully confident in our ability to not only meet those needs, but to adapt and adjust to ensure that we are providing the safest possible environment for students. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Um, all the leaderships on, on the committee, Mr. Dimmitt, Dr. Hoff, Mr. Alexander, Mr. Walker, Mr. Erickson, Mr. Carpenter, um, Ms. Schumacher, and also our presenters this evening, um, Mr. Fenner, Ms. Baderka, um, Mr. Nelson, Ms. Cindy Andres, and Ms. Ortiz. And then really, in addition to all of the administration, the staff, and the parents who were a part of these committees um, um, in putting together the options. Um, thank you to Mr. Bourgeois. Thank you to Ms. Um, Lombard Benson for the information on our um, safety and health guidelines. Um, I know we're going to move on to our next um, discussion and um, possible decision, but before that we do want to take just a five minute break for everybody. I know we've been here since six o'clock, so it right now is currently 910. Um, if everybody, um, anybody needs to get up and um, do what you need to do, we'll be back and we'll adjourn again at 915. Okay?
reconvene, excuse me, reconvene. <laughs> All right, see you at 9.15. <laughs>
Hi, and welcome back. Thank you, everybody, for the short um, break. We are back, and we're going to move to our next agenda item, which is the discussion on options and possible decision. Dr. Peterson. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you about uh, the consolidation of all of this planning and uh, proposal that uh, we've developed for your consideration. Um, <clears throat> after all of the feedback last week from um, the number, huge number of people who gave us feedback, we consolidated all that, refined the plans, and then started to work with all of our administrators to talk about the plans that we thought made the most sense, that would be the most workable, uh, the ones that uh, were tweaked by uh, feedback and so forth. And so we began to focus on one plan. And so we put that together. Uh, it's drawing from uh, all of the plans. And um, so, uh, you know, it's a very comprehensive but extremely workable plan. And we think uh, it'll, it'll work well for our students. So I would say, first of all, it's important for us to conclude that we need to open our schools with safe levels and with complete safety for everyone who wants to be in school. Also, no student should be forced to come to school by the district. We have good choices for everyone. I wanna review the elements of the plan that I am recommending to the board. And it takes, as I said earlier, from all of the options and honors the work everyone has put in Although I'm recommending that we have a hybrid for students whose parents want them in that model, and that we also have a virtual option for those parents who want their students to be at home from school all of the time. However, we will continue to develop a plan that builds uh, on option one, which is the fully open, uh, for the time when we are allowed to open to all students. It is also uh, clear that in the event of option one, school will not be what we remember, It'll, as you saw in option one. There's a lot of modifications to how it's uh, handled. We're also going to refine our virtual model of option two in case we are required to close the hybrid model at any point in the future and return to um, virtual or e-learning only. I would also point out that this model will enable us to have school virtually in the case of a weather-related emergency this winter. So we're now prepared to uh, do uh, e-learning at any given time. Uh, furthermore, many of our students will use the virtual all or part of the time. So it's all part of the, the uh, hybrid aspect of, of hybrid. <laughs> and. Uh, before I get into the specifics of my recommendation, I want to cover some important issues. Uh, first of all, I would say teachers in our district are committed to our students. Some of them may be uneasy about coming back to school, and some may not be able to come back due to their own health risks. But we want them all to know how safe it's going to be to come back to school and work with our students. Education is an essential function of government and we are risking the future of our students and our democracy if you're not doing all we can to educate students. COVID is spreading outside of schools. The closure in the spring was intended to keep school-aged children from infecting grandma and grandpa and vulnerable parents and other family members. How did that work? We still had thousands of grandmas and grandpas get it and get ill and many passed away. The system failed to recognize that students who are not in school go to other places and that others in our society were not careful about their interaction with other people. If family members or students got the virus from those other engagements, they passed it along to older citizens. We know for sure that no student got it from school because they were not in school. The dynamics of online uh, work well for many of our students and not so well for others. We've heard those stories. But we also know that the environment was detrimental to students' well-being and mental health. And other health-threatening issues arose because of the environment. A speaker I listened to at last night's MSBA conference cited the thousands of deaths and other health 
created issues by stay-at-home environment and the research is clear that far more students suffered from the closure than from the coronavirus. Students need what schools provide. We can and will create a safe environment at school and help avoid those mental health issues. Students may get the virus from the community by engaging in unsafe socialization, but they should not be infected at school. We will not only have strong measures in place, but we will enforce them. There's a growing evidence that closures are not the answer. Other countries have successfully navigated the virus and did not close. We also know that students are not as impacted if they are to get the virus and they are not good carriers of the virus. I know there's a recent uh, new argument to the contrary, but that information uh, is, is just unnerving. It's not uh, validated by officials. We know there's been depression from the shutdown. The brain just needs to be socializing and it needs to be engaging with other people. Trauma has increased. Large numbers of mental health fatalities have occurred. We will increase in uh, bad habits due to mental health issues such as alcoholism, child abuse, lots of other uh, issues that were not occurring in the degree they are now before the closure. And we just uh, have to commit to socialization as a part of being a human being. Social, we will take care of social learning and emotional learning and provide support to families. We also know that we have physicians in our community who have communicated to the board urging us to open the schools and they have committed to send their own children. CDC recommends that we get students back in school. State Health Department, the State Health Department is recommending steps and limits for reopening schools. The governor and Minnesota Department of Education support schools that are able to reopen. We are following the governor's approved process. Minnesota Department of Health is also part of that process and will be watching closely uh, what we do and how we do it and the impact it has. And um, we also have other states who are opening schools ahead of us that we'll be able to follow and see what uh, happens in them and of course in other countries as I mentioned. It feels like sometimes the media tends to emphasize those studies that scare people and increase concerns about the threat of the virus. Media has a mission to uh, encourage people to, to stay away from each other and stay away from businesses and schools. Uh, healthcare workers have been on the job throughout the closure and continue to be at work. Others in our economy are back to working with the public. There are probably more risks to our students and their families from the flu than there are from the virus. Our new sanitizers that Mr. Bourgeois described at length will even help prevent the spread of the flu in the future. We've had experiences in Minnetonka with childcare during the closure and we had no cases of the virus during that time. And these were children of essential workers often uh, exposed to parents who were uh, on the job working with the uh, patients. We have used the information from experts to assemble our plan and implement the details. And I realize that every point I make will have someone who disagrees with it. So we'll probably get a ton of emails with every point I make here. We will require a strict mass and shield policy. And I realize that uh, many governors throughout the country are requiring masks of all citizens, including Minnesota. But there are also people who believe masks and shields do not work, and we'll hear from them. We are not going to debate that issue. We're going to have masks and enforce them. As Mr. Bourgeois pointed out, we have also ordered N95 masks, or the KN95 masks, which are equivalent and uh, there's broad agreement that they're effective. They're what's used by physicians and uh, workers in hospitals for uh, working with patients. So they're, they're as close to an absolute answer as there is. And we will have enough of those available and for many of our vulnerable students. And uh, 
So those, those are going to help reassure staff who want to wear that. It's a different mask, of course, than the um, homemade mask or the bought in masks that you just uh, wear with a hook over each ear. We also have enough shields to provide the teachers who need to reveal their mouths at times so students can see their mouths making the words that they, that they need to learn. Then for added protection, we have masks and shields available for everyone who will be in the schools. As I said, we have the uh, KN95 masks that can be worn by medical professionals. So our teachers should be very reassured that the, the mask we're getting is first class if they want to wear that. Um, mask or shields, as I said, will be required for students at all times. There'll be no exceptions. Uh, if a student doesn't cooperate, we'll have to work with a parent to either keep the child out of school or get conformity. We also have uh, soap and water, which is one of the best uh, ways to keep clean if people wash their hands sufficiently. We have sa hand sanitizers, as Paul pointed out. We clean surfaces, we have gloves. Uh, and of course, we have all of the measures in place that uh, Annie Lumbar uh, Benson talked about to uh, have uh, dealing with uh, people who have symptoms, people who think they might have symptoms, whatever. And we'll be taking uh, students and adults temperatures frequently, and we're expecting that parents will also take their child's temperatures before they come to school. So before they get on the bus or come in the school door, we're expecting parents to know what their temperature is and not send them if there's any uh, danger there. And we also realize that there are medical professionals that argue that temperatures are no longer a key symptom. We're still gonna do that. We're gonna use temperature taking because it's an important element of our safety pr pr protocols. As you will see here as I go through this, it, we're, we're making sure we're also going to insist on social distancing at all times. Now that's a challenge for many younger children and middle school students, but we have to do that. Uh, I think we have pretty much general agreement among professionals that social distancing works. And what social distancing means is that if one socially distances, there's little chance that they will get COVID even from someone who has it next to them, but more than six feet away. Some people seem to think that being in the same place as a person who carries the virus despite social distancing means they're gonna get exposed. People are so, uh, so hysterical about uh, that uh, possibility that they don't listen to all of the science. We're gonna have dividers available in some of our classrooms and we'll provide them in all the rooms that we need them for as another precaution so that we will have those uh, shields that are uh, on three sides to them, and uh, we have those on order. We're also going to thoroughly clean surfaces throughout the day and after school. Despite the fact that the virus is airborne, our primary attention needs to be on preventing close contact without a mask or shield for prolonged times beyond 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Our ventilation systems have all been upgraded over the past 15 years. We've spent millions of dollars on that. And our engineers tell us that they're first class, and as Mr. Boudreaux said, they're certifying those for our community. We've also upgraded the system at Excelsior this summer. And another major aspect of the air quality will be the sanitizing units that Mr. Boudreaux described. They are incredible. and. Uh, not very many districts have been buying them yet. Hopefully uh, more will consider it, but we've got, we've got a handle on all of that and uh, it will pull uh, all of the uh, particles out of the air and, and uh, take care of everything uh, the size of a coronavirus and larger. So uh, they're medical grade and as Mr. Boudreaux said, they're pulling air down and away from occupants' faces. So I wanna get into the plan. Uh, and I would note that the, uh, we're within the limits that have been described by the governor and MDE that we have to comply with. I have some people in the community arguing that we don't have to pay any attention to the governor. That's not realistic. We have to follow their guidelines or they can shut our schools down. 
So uh, here's, the, here's the plan. We're gonna have a hybrid with elementary and school more than secondary. And ECFE and preschool, we intend to have in school. We're getting more details worked out on that part of the plan, so I won't go into much of that tonight. There will be a virtual option for parents who want their children to be on the virtual option. And we will uh, implement all those improvements that was described tonight by Dr. Hoff in uh, option two. So we intend to offer a first class in school experience and a first class out of school experience. And so um, there were some questions about are we only gonna be streaming? No, we won't all only be streaming, but that will be an important part of the uh, delivery of instruction, the synchronous uh, delivery of instruction. Uh, that was more applicable to some of the options than others, but we will be using that. Um, so the question of changing models, a parent uh, starts to like what they hear about the hybrid, they're not as nervous about uh, their child being in school, they wanna change to the in-school model. We will allow that each quarter. So they can't just jump in whenever they want to because we're gonna have classrooms organized in a way that will provide instruction to the children whose parents wanted them there. And, uh, but we will we'll work with that. Uh, so there will be some change in the organization of grades and classes. So basically uh, with the elementary students, uh, we'll have a graduated in-person e-learning continuum, progressing from more in-person instruction, instructional time for elementary to more e-learning at high school. So in K through three, We'll have in-person instruction by classroom teachers at neighborhood schools every day. So K through three will be in school every day. Uh, classrooms will be at 50% capacity, uh, basically 15 students per class, although some of our rooms are gonna be rated higher than that. So if we have them in a room that would normally hold 40 students, uh, we could put 20 in there at a time. I do wanna mention at this point that uh, because there were some questions from parents on the call-in about the nine to one and the 50%. We plan for both possibilities because the state was not clear a month ago what they might impose on us. So we've, we've planned with a nine to one maximum in a room and we've also planned for a 50%. So the 50% makes things work a lot better and now the state is allowing that. So we're we're going to use that part of the model and the nine to one for now at least drops off. Uh, we'll have grade level team-based instruction in 15 student pods. So when we talk about a pod or a bubble was talked about, uh, we're, we're grouping students together as much as possible in that 15 student group so that if there are symptoms of COVID uh, or the teacher gets ill or whatever, uh, we're affecting a very small number of students and we can manage that situation with, with those 15 parents. So, uh, and, uh, so that'll be kind of their social group as they, as they take instruction. We're gonna use all spaces in the buildings, including gyms and media centers and specialist rooms and so forth in order to spread kids out and have this 15 student uh, limit. Uh, specials will take place as part of the regular day for K through three. Uh, they'll eat lunch and have recess with home rooms or by home rooms. Uh, we're not clear yet if we'll be eating in the classrooms or if we'll be taking them to the lunchroom with proper social distancing, some of each probably. Uh, we pointed out that immersion students will maintain their, their regular schedule and programming Unfortunately, some people read that to mean that immersion students were getting some kind of a favor. That's just to point out to immersion parents that we are gonna have basically the instruction they've known. English and, and immersion will be the same, same model for instruction. 
Um, and then with the e-learning option, we'll have the synchronous uh, option with online instruction supporting available for students who uh, select the e-learning e option in both, excuse me, in all three, English, Chinese, and Spanish. So as has been pointed out, uh, the e-learning will follow the same scope and sequence and calendar as the in-person model. So no one should feel like somebody else has an advantage depending upon the, or disadvantage based on the model they've chosen. And then we'll have grade level subs available for reserve teachers, available for teachers who need to quarantine. So that's the K through three model. The grades four through five is uh, where we start to see some changes in uh, time of school and in levels. Uh, the four through five will uh, have in-person instruction uh, by a classroom teacher at Minnetonka High School. So all of the fourth and fifth graders will go to Minnetonka High School and they will start uh, basically at eight o'clock in the morning. So that'll be four days a week. On the fifth day, they will be home. K through three is all five days. Four, th four and five is four days and then one day at home. And they'll be on e-learning at that point with uh, in independent learning assignments and small groups and individual instruction. So it'll be a high quality uh, day at home. Uh, explorers are gonna be available on e-learning days for fourth and fifth grade, uh, which will be either at uh, the high school or at one of the middle schools. So we'll get those logistics out to parents. And uh, so uh, all of the uh, classrooms uh, for English students will be at 50% of capacity, which is basically 15 to 17 students. And in Chinese and Spanish classrooms, we will probably try to put them in larger rooms so that the 50% might mean 20 to 21 uh, students in a room and uh, we'll, we'll have to see how all that works out. But basically, they'll, they'll both follow the, the same uh, rules. If anything, English students will have a little bit smaller class size as a result of that. But you, you might imagine that it's gonna be very difficult for us to hire a lot of uh, immersion teachers at the last minute. And so we'll have much better luck uh, filling in with English teachers if we have to add more sections. Um, again, uh, it'll be grade level based, uh, team, team based instruction for the 15 student pods in all languages. And then specialists will teach in their specialized spaces depending upon the class and the capacity of the room. Students will eat lunch in the cafeteria, remember they're at the high school now, in small groups six feet apart at no more than 50% capacity. And then we'll have some outdoor time and recess time and, and so forth for uh, fourth and fifth graders as well. On the synchronous e-learning option, it'll be pretty much as I've described uh, before for the younger children and uh, have been in, uh, described in the other models. So that'll be a powerful program. And again, it'll be used by all of the students who have opted to be out of school all the time, as well as on this fifth day for grades four and five. I may, uh, I probably should make one point uh, clear here at this point uh, because we got some questions about it. I think there's a misunderstanding. There's a statement in the, uh, in the document that said, students can only ask questions on the days they're in school. That obviously does not apply to the students who are e-learning all the time. So they're a different, different situation. That, that uh, statement was made so that we don't have students at home interrupting a class of another, of a teacher who's trying to teach the kids in front of them. So, um, um, and, and I suspect that most teachers are still gonna uh, accommodate t uh, students who have questions, but we don't wanna put them in a spot where they're just overwhelmed by people calling in uh, with questions on the days they're out of school when they'll be back the next day or the next, uh, over the weekend. So grades uh, six through eight will be uh, two days of school uh, each week, 
So you'll have half of the students, uh, like on a Monday or Wednesday, Monday and Wednesday, and maybe the others uh, uh, half on a Tuesday and Thursday, with uh, the fifth day as an e-learning day. So again, we'll have them on e-learning on that day, which will be more uh, robust and there'll be more discussion and so forth. And again, uh, the full class will be divided into two teams and uh, we'll hold those classes down to 50% of the capacity of the room. And they'll be on a AB day uh, uh, with a seven period day. All classes, as I said, will be 50% capacity or less. And then students will transition from class to class within a four minute passing time. But we'll manage all of that so that we don't have bunching up and and students uh, rushing rushing down the hallway. There'll be, uh, there's details in the plan about all of that and we can answer those later. Um, desks, uh, desks will be surfaced, disinfected in between each class. So we'll have a team of custodians cleaning up those, uh, those desks uh, uh, after students have left the room. They'll eat lunch in the, in the cafeteria in small groups that six feet, feet apart. Or if we have to, we'll go to some eating in their classroom if we have to do that. Again, we'll have some outdoor time for middle school kids to be outside. And um, on, on the e-learning days, they'll follow kind of the flipped classroom model. So they will, they will be watching instruction uh, of the students who are there on, on the other two days, or they'll be on e-learning. So that's how they'll do that. And Freya can answer a little bit more of how that will actually be envisioned. Um, again, there'll be e-learning uh, reserved for students who choose that. And uh, there may be few, a few more at the middle school level. Um, then for grades uh, nine through 12, uh, the students will have a full uh, learning uh, on, on virtually for four days a week. And they'll follow a block schedule as we had in the spring. Uh, and then instruction will be primarily synchronous, employing Google Meets, live streamed instruction and other instructional technology tools. Some courses may meet in the uh, in person, depending upon space capacity. Again, this will be the one day a week that grades four and five are not in the high school. So four and five are there four days, nine and 12, if, they, if we have them, will be there on that fifth day. So some courses may uh, meet in person if, we, if, they're, if the quality of the experience really dictates that they should be in school some of the time those students who will come in can do that. Uh, students in the Momentum program or the trades, uh, maybe orchestra and choir, uh, maybe something in Vantage, but some of the programs where they just don't get the experience without maybe lab courses, if they just don't get the experience online that they need to have it in order to complete that course. And then uh, there'll be mast appointments uh, available for students on that uh, one day a week, and uh, those meetings can be small group, they can be individual support, they can be uh, whatever the teachers decide are most appropriate for the students that day. So, um, and then of course the e-learning option uh, is, uh, you know, it doesn't have much meaning anymore because most people will be on the e-learning. If students don't wanna come in at all, they don't need to come in at all. So the other area I wanna mention is early childhood. Uh, we are still developing that plan and we will have that out to parents very soon. Uh, we want to have it in, in person as much as possible. We also realize that there are a lot of complications trying to have uh, younger children wear masks or shields and, and socially distance and all of that. But uh, we're gonna do the best we can to provide a quality experience for ECFE and uh, and our preschool programs. Uh, I know there are questions about how we'll do music. 
Uh, we still don't have good guidance from the state on, on what the best practice for music will be. We do know that they uh, discourage uh, churches, for example, from singing because there's so much more force behind the, the um, you know, whatever comes out of our mouth. I hate to get too descriptive. And, uh, but we'll have, uh, we're going to, we intend to have music and uh, band and, of course, orchestra is a different animal because they don't, they don't uh, uh, blow on as many things in that, uh, in that program. But we'll have to get these, this guidance from uh, see, uh, the Department of Health. And then, of course, we'll have other specials at the elementary schools. I've described the feeding part of it. Uh, transportation. So uh, very quickly, uh, the first tier of busing at roughly 8 o'clock, and again, we'll work with the um, parochial schools that use our transportation so that they can fit into our plan, but those that come in at 8 o'clock will be um, on four days a week, will be grades 4 and 5 at all schools, and continuing to have grades K through 3 at Deep Haven and Excelsior. So that's their usual time. So we'll have enough buses because we won't be uh, transporting high school students during that time. And so we'll be able to do appropriate social distancing on the buses. We should have enough buses, although we, we know we'll work with parents if they want to drive their children and have them not ride the bus. We'll, we'll have to manage the traffic and all that comes with that. And we may have to widen the drop-off times and so forth. So, um, and so the next tier then would be the K through three uh, students for the other four elementary schools. So Scenic Heights, Groveland, Clear Springs, and Minnewashta will be at that second tier. So just the K through three. So there's plenty of room on those because we've pretty much cut the ridership in half and again, we may have families driving their children, and we may, and we'll probably have some who don't who don't have them coming to school at all. So um, we've got a lot of planning to do with parents and communications over the next few days. Then the third tier is middle school. So we'll have half of the middle school students theoretically on each day, uh, each of the four days that they're coming in. So. Um, there should be, uh, the, the requirement is to have not more than 50% of the capacity of the bus. So if you have a 60 passenger bus, you're gonna have 30 students on it. So we believe that, and many of our buses are bigger than that, of course, but uh, we believe that we can get uh, all of that to work out well with uh, that third tier as well. So I think the, the people who've worked on this plan have just really done amazing work. Uh, Freyer Schermacher has really uh, helped us a lot, uh, kind of tying all this together. Uh, we're going to use pairs to some degree to help us with supervision when the teacher isn't in the room. Uh, but there are some legal limits that teachers or that pairs are not teachers; they do, should not be teaching. Uh, again, I, as I said, there will be some outdoor venues used. We'll get more details out on the sports. We just got guidance for the high school athletics and we'll get more out on the middle school athletics, which will probably mirror what we're gonna do with the uh, high school. Child care will be provided to essential workers. And of course, teachers will be essential workers if they're called back to work. So there will be child care for all of the people listed as well as teachers who will be on that. Explorers will continue to function and uh, again, as I said, if we have some taking virtual, then the spacing numbers uh, will be down. We don't anticipate changing the model at all or taking in more students or having them more days if there are so many virtual students that it takes these numbers down because we pretty well planned this all out and uh, those things could change. So we've got to be uh, sure to uh, cover that. We'll have mental health uh, and social and emotional support for all students and all families. Um, again, I've talked about the pods and how they'll work wherever we can use them. So uh, we'll try our best to keep families together and so that'll be a little bit tricky, but uh, 
for the most part, uh, the, the principals and their teams can, can manage that. And um, so um, we'll, of course, uh, have to respond to any cases we have. So we could, the state could tell us we have to shut down at any given time. What they're going to use is a 14-day average of the number of cases divided by 10,000. So it's the number of cases per 10,000, and they have the five tiers. So if you get uh, if you get to 50, you would definitely have to go back on e-learning for everybody. And if it gets lower than what it is now, um, you, you know it. Uh, We'll, we'll have to make decisions about that then. We probably won't be as quick to open it up more. Um, so I think a couple more questions that uh, I was asked to cover uh, will be uh, teachers addressing learning needs only during the days when students are in school. I think I explained that. Um, connecting with those on e-learning. So we'll have a much higher expectation of teachers to be uh, in constant contact with students who are e-learning. Uh, parking passes, uh, Mr. Erickson's working on the details of that for, for primarily for that one day when there's a possibility of having some high school students in. But generally, parking will not be an issue. I've talked about the choir and band, the enforcement of masks, uh, how we're going to make sure that we're dealing equitably with all students. We've had the best plan in the state for having connectivity for every student and devices for every student. We've not had an equity issue there, and we've uh, provided some support over the summer for students who didn't do well during the closure, and we'll continue to do that. So um, hallways and transitions will be very closely monitored and scheduled. Uh, same with restrooms, same with lunch. Um, and then, of course, as Ms. Benson pointed out, when somebody is diagnosed, uh, if that happens, we're intent on not having that happen. But if it, is, it does happen, then there are steps to go through. And we've also had the 15-member pod that we're limiting that. So it's, it should not be a matter of the whole school has to close down if we get a, happen to get a case. Um, can teachers wear a microphone under the mask? Uh, they can. Uh, there are several different kinds of masks that are available, and of course shields are available. I know some people question shields, others say they're better than masks, so uh, we'll have to, uh, to um, get more advice on that. Um, Students refusing to wear masks, as I said, we just are not going to tolerate that. They'll have to wear a mask or not be there because we're not going to have them risk everybody. A little bit on what other schools are doing. Uh, several of the larger schools are doing um, e-learning only, and others are doing a modified uh, um, hybrid plan, probably something similar to Plan C that we had, or excuse me, Plan A that we had. Uh, option three, plan A. Um, testing kits, uh, we're still, uh, you know, right now uh, we're relying on other people to provide the testing, but we'll have to work on that uh, aspect before school starts. And of course, same with notifications. We're very much controlled by the nature of notifications, but the Department of Health will guide us in, in each case. And uh, because they'll tell us whether this child's circumstances were different than the child who had uh, a situation yesterday. And so often they'll say, well, how recently were they exposed to a child or, or an adult? So those are case-by-case -case matters. Um, navigators will be uh, provided, as we said. We'll have students in uh, grades uh, K through five in school uh, four and five will be in school uh, five days a week. All of the special education will be uh, handled. We're planning to do 1,400 IEP meetings before school starts. And of course, we'll be honoring any 504 plans that we have. So our plan is to, um, as soon as the board has adopted uh, a plan, 
that we would begin orienting teachers and other employees to the safety measures and the steps that we're going to take to protect them if they are at work because they're, we want them to be uh, positive about uh, the experience that students are gonna have and that others in the building are gonna have. So we don't want them to be nervous unnecessarily. I think if they can see the great steps we're gonna take to keep everybody safe, they will be more confident. And then we'll have orienting of all students to the safety and other steps. And uh, I hate to promise this, but uh, principals will probably go crazy, but we'll have interested parents who wanna see what measures are gonna be taken. So we'll wanna deal with that. So that's kind of uh, as much as I wanna cover on the plan. And uh, Priya, is there anything else you think we ought to cover? No. Okay. So Frey is here to answer a lot of questions. I'll answer questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, so in order to open up the discussion and conversation, I want to make a motion of a resolution for the adoption of a base learning model for the 2020-21 school year and other COVID-related matters. So um, just keep in mind that this motion can be voted down or tabled, but um, I'd like to read the resolution and then we'll um, continue for conversation. So whereas Minnesota statute section, section 123B.09 vests the care management and control of independent school districts in, in the school board, and whereas the superintendent of Minnetonka Independent School District 276 is responsible for the management of the schools, the administration of all school district policies and, and is directly accountable to the school board, and whereas when responsibilities are not specifically prescribed nor school district policies applicable, the superintendent shall use personal and professional judgment subject to review by the school board pursuant to the school district policy. Whereas on March 13, 2020, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz issued Emergency Executive Order 20-01, which declared a peacetime emergency in Minnesota in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas on July 30th, 2020, Minnesota Governor Twi Tim Walls issued Emergency Executive Order 20-82 and the Safe Learning Plan for 2020-21, um, which has set forth five learning models, in-person learning for all, in-person um, learning for elementary and hybrid learning for secondary, hybrid learning for all students, hybrid learning for elementary students, and a distance learning for secondary, and then a distance learning plan. And authorization all school districts in the state of Minnesota to select and implement an appropriate base learning model in accordance with and subject to the safe learning plan. Whereas the Minnesota Department of Education has issued and may continue to issue written guidance for Minnesota schools on educational issues related to COVID-19. And whereas the Minnesota Department of Health has issued and may continue to issue written guidance for Minnesota schools on public health issues related to COVID-19. And whereas the superintendent and the administration of the school district have conferred with the school board regarding an available learning models and, and the current MDE and MDH requirements for each and other relevant information. Whereas based upon the collective consideration of these factors, the superintendent has recommended to the school board that the Minnetonka reopening plan will be the base learning model to be implemented at the commencement of 2020-21 school district year. Now therefore be it resolved by the school board of Minnetonka Independent School District number 276 as followed, section one. The superintendent is hereby direct, directed to implement the following base learning model to open the 2020-2021 school year hybrid model that allows most students in pre-K in grades K through five to be in school and students in grades six through 12 to be mostly virtual with some days in school. Section two, the superintendent is hereby authorized after consultation with the school board chair and notification to the school board 
school board to select and implement a different learning model for the school district or any specific school building without school board action if the superintendent reasonably belie believes that prompt implementation of the different learning model is necessary. And that constraints of time and public health considerations render it impractical to hold the school board meeting to approve the implementation. The learning model selected and implemented by the superintendent shall continue in effect and until the school board in consultation with the superintendent and appropriate school district staff and public health officials deems it best interest of the school district and its students to implement a different learning model. Section three, the superintendent will provide regular updates to the school board regarding the school district's efforts to implement COVID-19 related educational and public health guidance issued by MDE and MDH respectively. So this is the motion on the table. Do I have, um, um, is there, I'm at a loss of words. Motion. <laughs> Do I have a motion to approve the adoption of the base model? Thank you, Mike. Is there a second? Thank you, John. And so um, are there any comments or questions around the recommendation or any other plan that we heard this evening. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so just a question around the authorization of the superintendent to act uh, before the school board gets together. So as my understanding is, if we have an outbreak where we need to take immediate action, the superintendent has the ability to adopt, uh, change the model um, until we can get the school board together. And when the school board gets together, we can either um, maintain that model or we have the ability to adjust. So it's really in that, it's in that window of time frame for the practicality of running a district and also thinking through trying to get the seven of us together to agree on a, a proposal, if you will. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else have any questions with the recommended model that Dr. Peterson has put forward? Lisa. Um, can we talk a little bit more about, um, Dr. Peterson mentioned special ed, um, which I appreciate, but can we talk a little bit more about how the interventions will work in the recommended model? Well, um, we're going to have special education be as close to what we would have if they had been in se session regularly. But each IEP drives what that model looks like. So it's really hard to describe a general model of special education because each student has a individual learning plan and uh, those teams will be meeting with parents uh, soon. I mean, they're, they're starting that whole process. So uh, in another few weeks, we'll have a, be able to describe a little more what they've worked out. Thank you. Is, does anybody else, Mark? Mark, we can't hear you. Not yet. Nope. All right, Christine, I saw your hand um, as Mark gets his volume. Now, I have a few questions, but I'll just ask one now um, and then Mark can go. This is kind of a follow on to Lisa's question. Um, with the high school model being in person just one day a week, and I see that we're trying to get the classes um, in person where they don't function otherwise, such as Research Vantage, Science Labs, Tech Ed, Music, et cetera. What about the at-risk high school students? Is there a plan to try to get them in more often also? Yeah, I think we'll do as much there as uh, the teacher feels is necessary for the student uh, on those, at least on those, uh, that one day. Um, as we look at the utilization of the high school rooms, and it's a large building, but when you start spreading fourth and fifth graders out, uh, they'll fill up much of that, that building. But it's possible that we could have students in there on other days at, uh, for special needs, a lab or you know, a course that just isn't working without them being physically in the school, part of the time at least. Thank you. A follow on to that is, have we looked at um, possibly using the dome for any sort of classroom space? Yeah, we, we, uh, 
are planning to use the dome. Uh, you know, it's up just part of the year. However, uh, this year with uh, limited uh, uh, use of the field, uh, we may be able to get the dome up sooner. We haven't talked about that yet, but we've definitely talked about using the dome uh, maybe for some of the singing or some other classes that uh, need special uh, distancing where we might want them 15 feet apart to be sure that it's safe and particularly if they're not wearing masks when they sing. Thank you. I do have more questions, but I'll ask later. Okay, Mark. Um, I've got two questions. Um, assuming you can hear me now. Yes. Um, concerning the um, problem with uh, transmission and um, and testing, um, is there a is there a requirement, or can you require? testing for a student that has exhibited symptoms? Yes. Okay, I'll take that simple answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, they have to comply with the, uh, the requirements in order to manage uh, possible spread of the disease. So. All right, and you mentioned um, in this model for the high school on the fourth day, a mass type day, uh, could you talk a little bit more about, um, we heard a lot of students that actually, that had some severe suffering with not having interactions. Can you talk a little bit more about how that could look for these students on that day? Yeah, I can respond to that. So that Friday will be organized into two blocks with six periods in each block um, and they're a half hour each. So potentially a student who's really struggling could see face-to-face -face their teacher, uh, all six teachers, during that Friday mass time because they've scheduled it uh, for that specific reason so students can have that level of intervention if needed. That could be in person also? Yeah, I mean in person or if the student would rather meet online, they could do that as well. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask a follow-up question to that, Freya? Um, what, how will we... Will the signups be limited to 50% capacity of the high school population then? Yes, so the high school used the current MAST app mm -hmm. to invite students. So each teacher then will know that they have a maximum amount of students that they could invite for that session. Okay. Um, up to 15, obviously, but usually MAST is a little bit smaller based on student need. Okay, thank okay. you. Yep. Does anybody else have any questions? Christine. Oh, sorry, I see your hands. Go ahead, Christine. Okay, um, I have a question regarding the flipped classroom for middle school. Can we talk a little bit more about what that looks like? Because it didn't sound like the traditional flipped classroom that I was used to, and that ties into, um, I know some explanation was given on why we didn't do the block schedule, but if the flipped classroom is that the kids are home streaming, that, that's a really long day. So can we talk a little bit more about what that looks like, please? I'll have Ms. Schermacher answer that. So as students are in school two days and e-learning for two days, you, each, each class kind of has a two-day cycle. So the first day is flipped classroom, which is video lessons and um, teacher instruction. It's not live, um, as well as student learning activities. And then the next day is time for the student to be face-to-face -face with the teacher, where they're getting more in-depth instruction. They're getting their questions answered. Um, so it's traditional flipped classroom, which is used for a lot of um, different types of classes. Um, and the reason that we decided not to do necessarily streaming is because we thought it would be difficult for students to follow along um, to what's going on in the classroom via video, and then the next day they may just have more questions. So we feel like the flipped classroom method will be a little bit more uh, productive for students and effective. That's helpful, thank you. Um, do the teachers have enough time to prepare? Do the teachers have time to prepare? To prepare? Yeah, it sounds like they'll be teaching, but then they'll also be having to prepare a flipped classroom presentation. So if you can imagine, it will be the same amount of preparation because they're essentially preparing for, t for two, two lessons, uh, one lesson per day. So they're teaching the same lesson twice, essentially, if that makes sense. Because the, the, the live days will be the same, and then the uh, flipped lesson will be the same as well for those two different days. So it's the same amount of prep and planning. 
Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have a question? John. One, one second. All right, there we go. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Katie? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So one of the things, and this, this is probably, it's a series of comments, but there are a couple of questions in this. So as I sat down, you know, having th thought through the last eight years on the board, understanding that whole, we have. John, your internet's cutting out. Be, it's be not practical to have all of our students. So, um, so as we thought through this around the trade-offs and trying to get a perfect fit for our students and really trying to drive towards that excellence across all classrooms, um, in my mind, there was a couple of things we had to do well. As we think of our most vulnerable populations, like our K-3, so when you think about getting our kids, that when you think about that pivot point between learning to read and reading to learn, right? That was one of the things as I was going through all these things I was looking for, was how are we going to support um, the elementary kids to really get them on the right trajectory. The second thing I was looking for was our vulnerable populations that are in the special programs that needed the IEPs, the 504s, our English language learners, and the reading, among other special programs, and making sure we're, we're really investing in those. Um, and what I heard was that Dr. Peterson put forward, we're going to invest in that. We're going to really keep close tabs of those students to make sure we don't leave them behind. The third thing was making sure that we maximized some in-school aspect um, for our mental health and our students. And I think we, we did really well for the, for the elementary and the middle schools. I think, you know, Jeff, that's going to be one of the things that you're going to want to have to keep your eye on. Um, with the high school kids only coming in one day a year, one day a week, what are the things that we're doing to really drive that? Um, both excellence and education, but also making sure we have the right resources and support for those kids. Um, from a parent's perspective, we heard a lot from our parents around with elementary kids in particular about the life logistics. And I feel like we have a good balanced plan that has the elementary kids going back to school, but also has the ability for, for parents that choose to have their kids fully online learn. That's not the right decision for them. Historically, we've looked at age gradient type approach where we look at as our age increases, so do the responsibility as a student, the class size, and the curriculum complexity. And it feels like we're able to deliver that excellence um, in that escalated way through this particular program. I also feel like we have to build routines. As I was going through those seven different plans, the routines were not consistent day to day, and they felt like it would be really hard as a parent um, to manage my, with my kids. And so when I think about that educational delivery, as I was reading through uh, both Paula's and Freya's recommendation, the, the acknowledgement that last spring was more of a monologue, and the fact is we're going to move towards more cameras on, which I think is great, um, as well as a bi-directional platform. I think that's also going to be super important. I mean, we're also maximizing time in schools. Some of the proposals we looked through um, had kids getting out of school at 1 o'clock, and I felt like if you're going to get kids in school, have them there in school all day and be able to really maximize the interaction with their teachers. So as I go through, so I, so I went through all that, it feels like, you know, the K through K through eight, I think we have a really solid plan. And I think about that really meets the needs of our younger and accelerating learners. But I, you know, Jeff, I think it's going to be really up to you and your staff and having had my two kids just complete four years of high school and I trust your leadership, but keeping your fingers on the pulse with the parents and those kids, to make sure we're delivering the outstanding education curriculum and social emotional support for those high schoolers is going to be super important. So I would just encourage your staff to make sure we create the space and time for kids and parents to reach out to us if they need that additional support throughout the school year. And I really look forward to our school opening report coming in October. It's very specific items. So thank you. Uh, if I might uh, answer yeah. that. Um, I, th I think you've really articulated some of the priorities that the board has always expressed to support all students. And uh, this model for high school would allow uh, high schoolers who need to come into the school to see a counselor or a social worker or other professional to do that on any given day. Uh, so we'd have those protocols set up and they would need appointments. 
as Freya also said, uh, some of that could be delivered online uh, in small groups or individually. So we've gotten, uh, as most districts I think across the country have, gotten very proficient now at using the, uh, the tools that are available through Zoom or Google Meet. And uh, so we can do those uh, meetings with their, whatever number of kids should be collected to have those conversations. Mr. Holcomb, this is Jeff. I would just agree that we're going to need to be creative how we look at the day as well, is what might happen after three o'clock at the high school. How might we have activities meet at different times? And so I, I kind of look at the fact that um, the e-learning day would wrap up in the afternoon, but that doesn't mean we couldn't have lab time for research students in the e early evening or just us really being creative how we have that happen. And so. Um, we have been thinking about what are those creative ways we can continue to support students and also looking at the activities lens with with Ted Schultz and again how do we make sure that happens because as we look at connectivity one of the key ways students get connected is through activities and so we need to find that way for that to happen in person so that students have those connections so that is a critical priority that's a that's a key point uh, Mr. Erickson I appreciate it Mike go ahead yeah, no, I, I think John, um, although was, it, you got cut out there a couple times, but we got the definite gist of what you said, and I think it was well, well stated. Um, as far as the building blocks as these students learn, you know, and then supplementing from a health and wellness, you know, standpoint and from a, from a mental aspect, I think one of the challenges will be in the high school, um, as we met with those student groups, um, it wasn't always the counselor that was the one that they they went out and when they had an issue, they reached out to with certain teachers. And so I think as, as Dr. Hoff um, outlined, um, you know, we, we had a great system set up in, the, in, you know, going in the spring, you know, and, and pivoted quite quickly. But where I think it was called out specifically, you know, in the feedback from parents is when it really, the, the, the best teachers were the ones that were engaged and, and, and with the students. And so I think we have to amp that up to make sure that there's check-ins and, you know, make sure that's a, a critical piece of it, um, you know, going forward because, you know, those um, certain, certain you know, students certainly will, will, uh, will benefit from that. And so I, and I think part of it is, is we're lumped in with Hennepin County, you know, when the COVID case is there and the tierings. And so part of it, um, the focus on the virtual side, and obviously many parents will also choose that. And that was one of the things that, that was critical for me and thinking through different options is, is giving the parents a choice, right? Ultimately, the parents will have the choice if they're going to go virtual. And so we want to make sure that that platform is even more robust as we, than we had last time. And then obviously, you know, with all the safety protocols um, that Paul alluded to, those are critical, right? Um, to make sure that all of us feel as comfortable as possible for, for our students going into the classroom that we've taken all these steps, you know, to make it the best environment possible. So I do, I thought it was amazing the amount of community um, engagement. We saw, you know, over 300 comments that that, uh, that we went through at the beginning of the meeting that were very helpful. And and to see, you know, I saw at one time there was there was close to 1500 people. I don't know what the current number is that, that have been online, but that's part of what makes, you know, Manitoka the number one district in the state is because the parents care so much, they're so supportive, they're engaged, they want what's best, you know, for their students in their specific pathway to success. And so um, I, I think I give a lot of credit too for all the teachers. That's why our teachers are ranked number one in the state too, because they were engaged in every step of this process. Um, and there was no perfect solution, but I think with what uh, what we're dealt with today, I think this path forward and, and what the administration of all the principals were involved in each of these um, reopening, um, you know, seven different proposals. So again, it was a, a hats off to you because it was a lot of good work done by by many, many people and many parents were involved in it. So um, again, it's no one would wish, you know, COVID on their, on their worst enemy. Uh, but I think through these, these difficult times, um, you know, we've got a, a path forward that I think is is as good as we can have for today. Thank you. Lisa? Um, so, you know, I, I uh, really appreciate the recommendation and I appreciate all the amazing work that all of our committees have done. Um, 
I think that we ought maybe just to spend another minute, or I'd, I guess I'd like to understand a little bit more deeply on this recommendation about the high school uh, in particular. And um, you know, I know some of the neighboring districts have gone completely online. Some are going hybrid with a lot more coming and going with kids at different levels. Um, and I understand the learning continuum that you've laid out, but could you just share a little bit more um, with us and the people that are watching about your recommendation, which you know really essentially doesn't have the high schoolers going into the high school much, if at all. Um, I think it's important for people to understand where that recommendation is coming from, and I'd like to understand it um, as well. Well, uh, I'll answer part of it, then I'll ask uh, Ms. Schermacher and uh, Mr. Erickson to weigh in. But part of it is uh, having enough space to spread out for appropriate social distancing and the number of rooms we have and uh, not knowing yet how many students are gonna opt for the uh, virtual learning. So once that's known, uh, we may have uh, more flexibility to bring in more high school students at different times. But for now, this is the best fit that they could come up with for using the high school space with just uh, basically two grades there during the, uh, during the uh, four days. So, uh, Freya, do you wanna answer a little more? Yeah, just to, to respond a little bit. So that Friday time or, or the one day that the, there is access to the building, for example, in all of September, um, classes will be meeting with one third. So each Friday will be dedicated to one third of their class so that by the end of September, um, every student will have met their teacher and they would have had that in-person experience. Um, we also know that high school students, students tend to do better with online learning and they also uh, tend to spread COVID at a higher rate. So I feel like it's kind of a, it was, it's, it's, it's a way to balance out the need for space as well as what makes sense for students. Just dealing with limited I, circumstances. Go ahead, Jeff. No, um, and I would say we, you know, my biggest concern is making sure that we have a number of programs that we do need to have students come in to access the building. You know, I could talk about metals, for example, students are not able to do that work at home. So how can we look at our courses that really need to have access to the building because we're obviously not going to use a metals lab for a fourth grade classroom. Uh, but how can we have those students uh, get into that space? Um, I'll talk about Vantage, for example, health sciences. That's completely offsite at the TSP building. And that's a two hour strand. And using the A day, B day um, block schedule, that's almost a two thirds of their day. And so you could schedule kids to come into the Vantage building so they could still do their CNA and EMR certification. Um, same thing with the, some of the courses at the Welch building. So as I look through it as what classes have to happen in the building so students have that experience. Same thing with Momentum or launching the new physics home renovation class. We need to have students have access to the building to do that. And this model allows us to have that happen. We do have a lot of juniors and seniors. We've talked about e-learning, but I also want to mention, mention Tonk Online. Uh, we have students that are doing completely asynchronous learning through our course. We've got a number of new classes for online. So there might be students that might want that option different than what we would consider e-learning. Um, research is another program that we need to make sure we have students access the building. Otherwise, they would not be successful. Um, so even at the high school, I do look that we have the option for e-learning. We have the option of talk online in certain courses. And then really our goal for them to be in the building. Um, I also think we need to look at just the, the connectivity piece. You know, one, one part that I'm working on is how do we help our ninth graders be welcomed into the high school community? And so what does that look like those first few days? How can we get ninth graders uh, into the building in some way and acclimated? And also looking at our mentoring program with first mates, that might look different. It did look different last um, spring when we had the seniors meet their incoming ninth graders. So, how might some of that happen even outside or how might some of those check-ins happen in those Fridays? So I think it has to be a lot of intentionality around making sure that we are making those connections happen. And that we're also delivering the academic programs we've guaranteed to our students that they're gonna have those experiences. And so there's some ways we can do that successfully online and there's some ways we wanna make sure we do that in person. 
um, and, and make that happen. So that may be, so those, those are some of the key pieces I think we're looking at in terms of programming. Um, and also really the connectivity piece. And as I mentioned before, just the activities program and uh, making sure we find ways for that to happen. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments, Christine? Hi, thanks, yes, I have two. Um, the first one is kind of a follow on to what I could just talk about with getting the ninth graders into the high school, which I think is a fantastic idea. And as much as we can get them in there at the beginning, it is a huge transition. So I look forward to ideas on that. Um, similarly, I have a question for the sixth graders at the middle school. Is there any thought to potentially using that one e-learning day in September to get the sixth graders in a little bit more? That's also a pretty big transition coming from you know fifth grade with one or two teachers to now having six. Well, That's my first question. I'll have Freya answer that, but um, really it's essential for teachers to establish a personal relationship with all of their students, even those who are going to be all virtual. So we're going to work on those uh, measures to get them in and uh, meet their teachers, uh, obviously lots of social distancing and so forth. So everybody needs to build that relationship. The big difference between starting this fall with anybody online and last spring is they'd already established those relationships. So the teachers knew the kids, the kids knew the teacher. So it was a lot more uh, comfortable for everybody to communicate in a different way. Now they're starting out from scratch and it's pretty hard in many cases to build a relationship just virtually. So Fred, you wanna say a little more? Just to talk a little bit about the incoming sixth graders, we have, you know, tossed around some ideas about having some dedicated days just for sixth grade at that first week of school. Um, and those Fridays, I think that's a great idea. Every other Friday in September could be for 50% of sixth graders just dedicated to their time so they'd have some additional face to face time. Um, as well as they will be seeing their teachers two days a week. So that's kind of a little bit of an advantage for sixth graders. They have that opportunity just built into the schedule. But yeah, we are actively thinking of ways to get them connected quicker um, to make them feel more comfortable and connected to the building. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I go ahead and ask my second question, Katie? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit into the detail here. Um, you know, as looking through this plan, it, it does seem that, um, you know, especially in the elementary school where we will probably be splitting the classes and, and they'll be supervised by paras, um, that we have a, a great need for paras. And, and I had read in the plan that we can probably do some shifting around and cover a lot of it, but I'm wondering if that's the case with immersion too, because it would be extremely beneficial for the para in the immersion classroom to, to speak the language. Um, that kind of goes along with my next question in seeing, especially like at the middle school where the custodians are gonna clean really quickly between the classes, it seems like we are going to have to hire a lot of custodians. And then also, I know there's a lot of concern about subs. We we tend to have an issue with um, supply of subs anyway. And if, for example, a middle school teacher gets sick, they could be out for a while with COVID. So what are our plans for staffing in those areas? Uh, again, uh, some of that's going to depend on how many families choose the virtual option. So uh, we're, we're going to be able to staff the plan the way it's been presented. And uh, if some of the, uh, of the uh, students who uh, opt for virtual are more numbers than what we anticipated, uh, we'll be able to shift some staffing around to accommodate that. But uh, yeah, we'll, we're certainly going to uh, welcome volunteers who want to come in and help with uh, making all of this work. But we're also going to be able to hire, uh, you know, custodians and other food service workers and all who can help us uh, kind of beef up the delivery of that. The, the other point I would make with uh, reserve teachers or subs is that we need to look at what day of the week other schools are going to have their high schoolers in school. So if they're gonna be in on Friday, we may wanna avoid a Friday. If they're gonna have them on Wednesday, we might wanna avoid a Wednesday. So we wanna be a little strategic there so that uh, the day that we need subs for the high school, there are more of them available in the region. And so I think we can maybe even work some of that out with other districts. Great, thank you. 
Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Uh, Lisa? Um, can you talk a little bit more um, with the recommended plan? Uh, this is obviously, as is in the resolution, would be the base scenario and kind of how you see the any shifts or changes occurring. I know we don't know a lot about what the state will allow us to do or what the virus might do, but I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to, if, if I'm somebody watching this and I'm trying to understand for myself as well, sort of what type of scenarios people can expect um, as, as how to how things may or may not shift going forward. We, uh, we know two things. One is that the uh, number of cases per 10,000 in Hennepin County has been going up over the last five weeks. Uh, the latest number is like 23 something. It was 21 something for the previous two weeks. Uh, uh, Carver County uh, a few weeks ago had almost no cases. Now their rate is virtually equal to Hennepin County. So there's no advantage to us trying to get our district identified as either a Carver or a Hennepin County district. We're gonna work on trying to get it identified as a Minnetonka entity. There are 11,000 students here and 1,000 employees. So, uh, you know, it's a large enough group that we should get consideration. Uh, presume then that our numbers are lower. And uh, so the, they tell us that the last date before school starts that they will know about is uh, August 20th. So what we have on August 20th, we can start school with as far as a criteria. So, um, you know, uh, we're just subject to whatever the Department of Health uh, concludes at that point. Thank you. Uh, Christine? Is there any guidance on PE for the high school? I know that the Minnetonka has a requirement for a certain amount of PE, but do we have any flexibility with that? I, I didn't hear the first couple words you said. Oh, is is there any guidance on PE as a requirement in the high school? I, I believe Minnetonka has its own requirement for graduation for PE, but do we have flexibility around that? Um, well, I mean, it's, uh, it, it is a local requirement and uh, there are some state expectations to provide physical education. It's not as specific, but, uh, um, you know, uh, there are several ways to satisfy that requirement, as you know from the waivers that you approve each year for uh, graduating seniors. So, well, you've done it once. I'm sorry, the, the, the board does that. So, um, you know, we'll work with that and uh, you know, we want to honor all of the specials uh, at all levels because it's a critical part of the education students get. Okay, thanks. And I do have one more question, if I could ask. Um, you know, I think no matter what option we choose, there's obviously a lot of prep work that needs to be done. And, and the first thing is obviously determining who's going fully dual and, and who will go with whatever plan we choose. Um, and then if fourth and fifth graders are in the high school, then there's a lot of changing around that needs to be done and reconfiguration and logistics, et cetera, um, teacher prep. Is there time for this? Do we need to consider giving a couple extra days for this or how do we plan on getting it all done very quickly? I know we can do a lot, but there's a lot to do. Yeah, I mean, we basically have a month until school opens. So um, uh, we believe it's very doable to get it all done by the time school is scheduled to start. Thanks. I have a question. I'm going to call on myself here for a second. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about the recommendation that you have put forth? Kind of how you came to this recommendation out of all the recommendations, and um, also also with that, um, there was one more point. But start with that, yeah. if, if you please. So uh, after all of the feedback sessions last week, uh, we got the administrators together who have been intimately involved with all of this and ask, you know, are there some of the plans here that are starting to make more sense to you than others? It's 
they all can work, but are there some that would really serve students at all levels better? And so, um, you know, it came down really to um, option four and option seven primarily, but there's obviously a big part of option two. And we also know that we have to create uh, alternatives as we go through the year. So all the plans are gonna stay alive. It's just a matter of when they might be implemented, if, if ever. I would anticipate we spend more time talking with you at the study session on the 20th about some of that work, because obviously the first step needs to be to get the plan and then start talking about alternatives, which aren't gonna be used for weeks or maybe months or maybe never. But uh, so, that's, so that's how we started. We, we, we took some of the good parts out of all of that and, and the other plans that made sense. And we've, we've modified quite a bit of seven, so it's not the same as seven, but it's, it's kind of the framework of uh, seven. So it sounds like you worked with all the principals to come up with Not this only recommendation. Principal, all administration. All administration. Yeah. And so um, also since um, high school is going to be e-learning, um, it's it, we're really leaning on the governor's um, guidelines here of putting K-5 in school as much as possible, um, utilizing our buildings. Um, as our high school students will be e-learning can you again touch on how we're going to support those high school students that have IE, IEPs and 504s will you just clarify that again one more time well again our, our intention is to provide full service to them so uh, if their parents don't want them to be in contact with uh, with the uh, teachers or anyone else then we'll have to work with that mm -hmm. and that'll be written into the IEP that gets done I mean, I talked about 1,400 IEPs. That's not simple. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those meetings run a, a long time. But we've got to get agreement on what the IEP will look like. But our intention is to provide full support for students who are on a 504 or, a, or a IEP, and certainly EL students as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know Freya talked about um, supporting our sixth graders coming into the middle school. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you've um, already had an, uh, uh, like a brainstorm session on what you're going to do with the incoming ninth graders. Yes, I mean, I think we're looking at um, can we do something the, uh, the start of the school year or we get them in the building prior to the start of the school year. I just would say a, a critical part is that they need to be in the building in some way so that they can connect. Um, I, I would not want to do that just virtually like we did this spring as we met them. So that is in the process right now, what that looks like, how many days would it take us to do that um, so that they have a strong start and know all the resources. And obviously a critical part is their connection with their counselor. You know, that we need to have some very intentional plans for whether it be small group meetings with ninth graders, we do that anyway, a seminar at the start of the school year. Uh, those those need to be in person. Um, so uh, we'll be working with counselors to develop what that plan will look like because they do meet, uh, counselors meet with their ninth graders um, by the end of the first month. So that counseling piece is critical so that they know who their counselor is. They understand the role of the counselor that is to support the whole student, not just academics, but social emotional. So uh, we are working on those plans right now. Uh, and making sure they feel a connection. And I also would say, uh, same thing with seniors. You know, last year we worked really hard to make sure that we could have find ways for our seniors to have a strong finish. And uh, I rely on the senior leadership for our school to, to move things along. So we need to be thinking about them as well. It's their last year. And so how do we make that memorable? Certainly not to forget 9th or 10th and 11th, but those are some of our key conversation points right now. But uh, we need to find a way to welcome the ninth graders uh, in person. We need to keep in mind that uh, for ninth graders, there's far fewer ninth graders than there are fourth and fifth graders together. So the plan uh, works for fourth and fifth graders to spread out appropriately in the high school. So ninth graders can easily spread out appropriately and those spaces could be used you know, after the fourth and fifth graders are gone. 
Um, you know, maybe we shorten the days for fourth and fifth grade that first week or something and get them in sooner, but those are kind of details that principals are paid to do. Hmm. Okay, one more question before I call on another board member, because you mentioned fourth and fifth grade. So my question is, when you're moving um, kids into the high school, um, spreading them out, um, will um, taking into consideration Mr. Broughton's comment about supporting staff to get their um, supplies there, will kids be required to bring their things home in the evening since it's ultimately going to be a shared space? It, it, has that been thought through at all? Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to be able to, as the district, move uh, the teachers to the uh, high school from the, where, where they are now. Mm -hmm. And there are probably some new teachers who don't have anything settled yet to move. Mm -hmm. um, and then our, our intention is not to have students carrying things back and forth at that age. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get some kind of a storage uh, place for students to have their materials at school okay. and provide enough security for them. So moving, so my thought is moving those fourth and fifth grade students and, and staff into the high school, we really need to focus on supporting our staff to make sure oh, that Oh, absolutely, they, yeah. You no, know, we, have, we definitely will. Absolutely. And Mr. Bowen's been told that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, okay, I'm, I'm moving on here. I'm happy to ask another board member if you have a question. Christine. I have a question regarding the Navigators program, and this might depend on how many students choose virtual or in person, but with um, four and five being at the high school, does that include the four or five navigators and how does that impact some of the, the classes they have that span multiple grades and multiple levels? They go to the high school. Um, uh, second and third grade navigators will be at their, you know, I think they're gonna be at Excelsior. So they'll be at Excelsior only and the second and third graders. The fourth and fifth graders will have a navigator room at the high school or multiple rooms, obviously. Okay, so if I understand correctly, two and three will no longer be at Scenic, it will be right. at Excelsior? Right. Okay, and then what about some of the third graders who might have math with the fifth or sixth grade or like fifth or sixth grade level math? Are they, how are they going to get that differentiation if they're in two different locations. That's, that's a level of detail that will have to be done in the next couple of weeks. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I know you have them. Um... John. Yeah, so one, not, not a question, just a, well, maybe it is a question. So. You know, we talked a little bit about viruses and the control, the things we're doing in our physical space. And I thought Paul did a nice job of walking through things we're going to be doing from an infrastructure perspective. A lot of outbreak control. And, you know, when we have a positive case and knowing that testing is several days to turn around um, and contract, contact tracing, is difficult even today in a welcome medical environment. How are we going to make sure that we are vigilant around making sure we identify those students early and make sure we, we aggressively um, take those right steps to look right, if you will. And then also I think through the logistics about getting kids in school based on, you know, if they're coming in by car or they're coming in by bus, um, what that's gonna look like as these kids come in, even using the separate entrances that was outlined in the program like, are we going to have enough kids? Are we going to have enough time to get all these students' temperature checked in a socially distant way to start the school day? Um, yeah, so the, the temperature taking, uh, we'll have multiple ways to do that. And, uh, and again, we're going to expect parents to take the temperature before they leave home. And... Um, and work with us to not send a child to school that has a, has a fever. And um, then we'll, it, it's probably gonna be a little rugged for the first day or two, kind of like the learning the new lunch procedures. Uh, it takes a while to get settled in, but kids learn quickly. And, uh, you know, we'll get that uh, temperature taking down quickly. Uh, there'll probably be a little bit of a staggered uh, drop off uh, in the first week or so to make sure that uh, 
we have time to get everybody in without crowding and so forth. Um, so I'd, I was really hard to hear you on the first part of your question. Just tell me a couple of things. Oh, it was just around that. Oh, testing around the checking. Takes, yeah. If we so uh, my oh, understanding yeah. is that it doesn't take that long to get uh, results if we're if we're doing it under under the state's guidance this way. Um, we'll have to see what what they produce for results. But um, part of the logic of the pod is that. Uh, if it's something that happens at school or it's brought to school, it's controlled in that, in that smaller group of students because they're not going to be in the elementary moving around. They're going to be in, in, in one location, basically, um, depending upon how we do lunch and, and so forth. But um, I, think, I think the uh, plans that, that uh, you know, we have will assure that there can be quick identification of a potential problem and the isolation of students who have been in contact with that, with that child. And, uh, you know, the state has protocols that they work with. They, they're the ones who jump in when that happens. So uh, if, if we have a child with a fever, they'll tell us to isolate so long uh, once the child's uh, actual condition is determined, uh, you know, they'll let us know that it's safe for uh, everyone in that pod to be back in school. Uh, my concern is not at all with what happens at school as much as it is with what somebody brings to school if they're not responsible about uh, uh, keeping track of, of temperatures and all. We also know that there has to be a uh, you know, it's not just a passing somebody on the street, you get the, you get the coronavirus. You have to have a little more engagement with the, with the uh, virus itself than that. So, uh, you know, most conditions we're going to have are not going to be really at risk. And except in the minds of uh, people who wanted to stir the pot, that picture in, in Georgia, probably nobody would have gotten exposed with that limited passing in the hallway. Now, we're not going to have that kind of a mess in the hallway, but the reality is, you know, you get some people to the point where they think if there's a coronavirus case across the street, where they're going to get it. So, you know, it's, people have just gotten so scared about this that it's, they've, it's a, a legend now as to how dangerous this is when, in fact, with... Uh, our situation, it's not going to be that dangerous, and we're going to take all the precautions of the world to make sure it doesn't get away from us. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah, could, could you talk a little bit more about um, the tiers? And again, the tiered structure. So today we're, we're limited because with COVID, there's, there was the 23 per 10,000 you know, individuals within Hennepin County, and that's kind of pushed us into, you know, approaching this hybrid model. But what what would it take um, to get it where we would be um, have the option to to go back to um, not not normal? It would be under the the model one, but where the high school students would be going back to the high school, and and you know, we kind of revert back to. Um, a different a different model but uh, is it it would it be less than 10 yeah and you said it, before again i think yeah. it was 50 and above is where we we'd have to all go yeah. online right yeah you've identified the two uh, ends of the scale so uh, clearly the state anticipates and the department of health anticipates that younger children should be in school at a at a higher level than what they would allow secondary kids so you might, some of those middle categories, you have uh, uh, high school and, and middle school uh, on e-learning and elementary could be on a hybrid. And so those three middle levels kind of move that way up to the point where everybody would have to close with 50 or more. Is that, and it, you said that it getting was, there? It was, it was, yeah, and if it was 10, or less, if we yeah. if, if things started to turn the right. corner, it was ten or less. Then we would have the optionality to go back to yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure they would, like an option one. I'm sure they would tell us 
you know, you really need to do that for a sustained period. You can't just do a two week drop and then, you know, because we don't know what's going to happen next. But, you know, they would be they would be the ones to tell us whether we could go that way. No, I, I was just one. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I was just there were activity. There's the Fourth of July and other activities that they, they said were potentially caused and spike. So I was just wondering to the extent that that things did evolve and, and, and things if they were, you know, if things got under control and it was for a period of time, then we'd have more optionality to uh, to get more of the kids back to, uh, and again, look at option one potentially. Yeah. Thanks. Christine? Hi, sorry, I have another detailed question. Um, I see from the plan how lunches will work in elementary. How will it work in middle school and high school? Uh, again, I couldn't hear the first two words you said. How, um, oh. how will the middle yeah, how, school and high school lunches work? Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw that there was the social distancing, of course, but I'm wondering, will, for example, in middle school, will they be required to eat with the people that they had the class with before or right after lunch? That pod um, is going to be, they're going to be tied to that pod. So we don't want to start having pods mix or it undoes all the reasons for having a pod or a bubble. So they'll be tied to that group and then they'll socially distance in the cafeteria. And as I said earlier, um, we might find that we'll have to have some eat in, the room, eat in their rooms and some in the cafeteria to make sure it all works. Okay, and I think I had read also that we're going to try to do prepackaged lunch to eliminate yes. the weight in the lunch lines. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there'll be a, a much more limited menu for students because it'll all be prepackaged. My guess is that over time we'll be able to kind of open that up a little more and find ways to take orders, so to speak. But for the beginning of the year, their menus are going to be pretty limited. You take take the A lunch, or you don't, you know, and we don't have anything. Do you know, will there be at least vegetarian options for those who need that? Sure, yeah, for there'll there have to be dietary uh, limits. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Lisa? Um, my question is around um, communication. Um, as, you know, after a decision is made, whether it's tonight or, or you know, at a future time in the next few days. Um, in terms of, you know, we got a lot of really valuable feedback from our team members, our families, um, and, you know, people out in the community. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit about um, how you expect that to roll out in the coming weeks so that people have an idea of, of what to expect and where they can ask questions and get clarification and you know where they can be pointed to um, this topic is obviously one that's very important to families certainly there's no one solution that's going to make everybody happy but i think information is really key and so i want to understand how you're um, anticipating that to roll out so the commitment is to get the plan out uh, by tomorrow so people know what it what it uh, says so we've we've got it really ready now to go unless the board changes some elements of it and uh, or if you don't pass this one and you do something else so whatever plan you adopt whenever you adopt it we would plan to get it out immediately uh, we're going to be sure that principals are pretty versed in the details so most people should be contacting their principal for questions and not trying to inundate uh, uh, me or, or Jackie Getty or, or the board or whatever for questions because we want to be thorough in answering them. And sometimes if we've got too many of them, it's hard to give them a, the attention and thoroughness that they deserve. So obviously there will be a way to pass those up. If the principal doesn't feel comfortable answering them, uh, we'll be able to answer them. As I said, uh, you know, a couple hours ago, my intention would be to begin to look at the suggestions people have made that are not covered by the plan or are no longer 
uh, meaningful if we haven't adopted a certain plan, and then get them good answers on those. So, and in many cases, we're going to have some suggestions that we should integrate. Uh, you know, most of them are detailed type things, but they're still important and they'll matter to how the plan works. And then next week, we would begin to ask parents, are you going to want to, you know, to come to school? Or are you going to want to keep your child at home? Are you going to stay in Minnetonka? Are you going to do something else? Uh, are you going to need your child to be on the bus? Or can you drive the child? Uh, some of the details on, uh, um, you, you know, um, other aspects of starting school uh, in terms of orientations and all of that. So we'll, uh, I'm missing something that I, I had planned to say there, but uh, in general, getting details from them. And uh, some are going to need more time to decide than others. And... Um, you know, but we've got to we've got to get those data in the hands of principals soon, so they can start to get their pods put together, their class lists, and all of that. And um, again, these four weeks will be used uh, appropriately, but they're going to be busy. And we'll keep up people on, you know, if there's some new information that has to get out, uh, we'll share that. Mark, I want to ask a quick question about the um, opting for the e-learning model for those. You briefly talked about um, if you do the e-learning and you want to come to the school plan, which the proposed recommendation is hybrid, um, that you would need to be quarterly, correct? That's what we're proposing. And so I'm kind of taking a look at some of these community comments, and so those that are e-learning do they have the opportunity um, to still participate in after school um, clubs activities athletics at the high school certainly and yeah. then um, also what was the what was the other one about um, opting out quarterly um, if but you could always move from e I'm sorry from the hybrid to yeah. e-learning that's yeah. that won't be a um, an impact on our staffing issue or no. is that okay no it, it, it will certainly not be simple but it's something we can accommodate okay because we don't want to force a student to be at school if their parent doesn't want them there okay okay um thank you mark sorry i butted ahead of you thank you that's all right you're the boss you can do that um dr peterson just like we have um, parents having uh, their ideas about opting in or opting out, I'm assuming that you've been having discussions and getting a feel for uh, our teachers in the same vein. What kind of sense are you getting from the teachers about the amount of teachers that are going to be uncomfortable with returning to school? And of those, um, what will be the plan? Uh, for their utilization? Well, uh, the uh, MTA has told me that 40% of the teachers are absolutely ready to come back. Another 50% are not sure. They're nervous about it, but they, you know, they need to hear how, what we're going to do. And that's why I prioritize getting them in and showing them how safe it's going to be. So it takes away all of that fear. When people are... Uh, left to create their own uh, details on those things, they may not match up at all with what's actually going to happen. So we want to get that done as quickly as possible so uh, more of our teachers feel comfortable coming in. There are going to be some teachers who legitimately uh, cannot come in. They just have a health uh, risk mm -hmm. that's not going to allow them to come in. Uh, we're hoping that we have a pretty good match of the, uh, the student body, if you will, that's going to be on virtual or e-learning, and the teachers who aren't going to be able to be at school. Now, that's hoping for a lot, but we're, we're hoping to do that. The bottom line is uh, the employer can require people to be at work or make another decision unless they have a... Have a 
uh, you know, a covered disability or issue or risk that is covered by law. So that's not an easy thing to answer. Uh, Tim Alexander and Mike Cyrus are gonna have to work through all of those situations to see whether somebody uh, is just fearful and, and uh, you know, would rather stay home or if they really have a, a legitimate situation. But we're hoping to work with our teachers and other employees. I mean, obviously there are paras, there are, uh, you know, clerical staff, uh, you know, the food service workers and all who might be uh, uncertain about coming back. So we've already started that process to tell, have them tell us what their situation might be. And so the human resources working through that. Okay. Thank you. Christine. To follow on to that question, what happens if we just can't get enough teachers back in the classroom for those who choose hybrid? Would we then have to have more students go virtual than would like to? Uh, I, I don't think that that's likely to happen. Um, you know, we can always hire more teachers if we have to. Um, but that's presuming that all of the teachers who are not going to come to work have a legal reason to not be there. So, um, you, you know, we don't, we don't want to deal with those things until we determine the individual situation. But, um, you know, we, we believe that we're going to be okay on staffing. Go ahead, Christine. Okay, thank you. I did have one more question. It was a different theme though. So if anybody else wants to go in front of me, that's fine. Go for it. No, okay. Um, we, we've we been talking a lot about this hybrid recommended plan. Um, and I know we covered a little bit of the plan for those people who will be choosing the virtual no matter what, but can we get a little bit more detail what that looks like? Um, I'm assuming it's not streaming the whole time? Is it dedicated teachers who have chosen not to be in the classroom will be teaching those classes? Can we just get a little bit more detail on that, please? Yeah, is Paula Hoff still on? She is, she is. Paula, would you, uh, you went over that earlier, but would you go over it again? I sure can. Um, for the students who are choosing to not be um, in school in the physical sense, I go back to what Dr. Peterson said a few minutes ago, where he talked about we're going to have some staff who are not able to be back. Now, in a perfect world, we'll get the right amount of teachers in the right licensure area to match up perfectly with the kids who are not able to do that. Um, that's the first tier of that plan. Under that model, um, the kids would be receiving an e-learning experience where we are following the same essential learnings using similar assessments, but in that e-learning format. Um, with more personalization, more um, lifetime with their teachers, more independent group work, so that that experience is very rich for them and more aligned with what's happening in the classroom, yet in that virtual setting. Thank you, that's helpful. Is it safe to say then, if, if a student was in the classroom in hybrid and chose to go online, completely changed to online, that they would change teachers? Um, that's a great question. I think back to when Pete was giving his presentation the very, as the very first round. Um, we don't know how many kids that may happen to. We are going to have to see, first of all, how many families choose for their students to be in the hybrid environment, how many choose to be in the early environment, and then what shifts occur and at what time they occur. It's hard to have specific answers for them until we have a better sense of what those numbers look like. Thank you. But the other part of that is every year we have schedule changes at the high school. So kids need to change their schedule, which means they maybe have gone two weeks into class and they have to change, uh, you know, for one reason or another, uh, their schedule. And uh, they may get all new teachers. So that's not unusual for high school kids to have to change teachers. Mike? Yeah, just, I, I don't know. Um, I know we, we talked about the, the health strand of Vantage, but are we looking then for the global uh, side of it, global business and those other strands of still using 
um, that other building, uh, at least part time? Yes. I mean, yes, I would say just the global business class is a three hour strand. So on the A day, B day, that's an entire day. And so um, that provides quite a bit of flexibility for the teachers to be able to uh, have small groups. I mean, we plan to use the well space. We obviously need to work out the transportation for that, but um, there's plenty of access to be able to get groups in. Uh, there also is an outdoor, large outdoor patio off the Vantage building that we've actually talked about how you could put a tent there for the fall. Uh, but yes, I mean, we, some of those programs that are double double book or double scheduled or three hours just provides us more flexibility for students to come in. So uh, we look more of a hybrid approach for some of those specific classes. Perfect. Thanks. Lisa? Um, thanks. I'm looking back through my notes and uh, uh, you know, you've asked a lot of, of really good, helpful um, questions for me. Um, one thing you talked about, Dr. Peterson, was about um, some of the safety protocols um, in terms of, in particular, masks and things like that. And I'm wondering, you know, what happens if a staff member or a student or I don't know who anybody that's, that is in the building has a medical exemption and can't wear a mask? What would how would things work for them? Well. Um... You know, we'll just we'll just have to deal with what the specifics of that situation are. So, um, if there's uh, one person that can't wear a mask, uh, that's not a huge deal because everybody else is masked. But uh, you know, there are several options there depending upon the situation of anyone who can't absolutely can't wear a mask or a shield. And uh, you know, we'll we'll just have to work with that individual situation. Uh, if they're just belligerent and aren't refusing to wear a mask, and there are people like that in society, uh, you know, they won't be able to be at school. You know, they, if they're a risk to other people, we can't have them just deciding on their own that they're not going to live with the rules. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? It can't be. Oh, Lisa, go ahead. Sorry, I have, I have one more question. I think, you know, I know it's getting getting late and we've been talking about this for a while, but can you just reiterate one more time what the guideposts are for us right now? I know Mike talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but I just want to have that as I'm thinking through this again at, at top of mind in terms of what we can and can't do. Well, um, the, the uh, calculation is the number of cases in the last 14 days divided by 10,000. And um, that's, that's the, the controlling number. And um, if that factor is um, below 10, you can, everybody can be in school. If it's, I think, 10 to 20, then um, um, every uh, elementary can be in school, high school has to be hybrid. If you're 20 to, tw to 30, then um, I think everybody has to be hybrid. <laughs> I'm, I'm going from memory here, so I, I didn't anticipate this question. So I, uh, and then from 40 to 50, everybody has to be on um, well, no, stu high school students then have to be online and elementary can be on a hybrid up to that level. So the last trip for that is, is elementary because high school has already been pushed to being online only after they get past 30. So, and then that changes, you know, if you look at the, at the every two week breakdown uh, for every county, um, it, it's changing uh, for each county. And uh, of course, there are already some counties that are above 50, so their schools are all going to be virtual. And there are a handful below 10, so they can be open as much as they want to. Is that pretty much what you wanted? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Does 
Does anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> Say it isn't so, really? All right. Oh, Christine, go for it. I can't let it go. I can't let it go. Um, I know it was a while since we had heard about the, the health, um, but can we just kind of walk through what the notification procedures would be again if there was a COVID positive case? Just thinking that, you know, we're all used to getting the emails from the school nurse saying that there was strap in the classroom or something like that. Is is that not going to be the same kind of communication with, with this? Just for clarification. Is Annie, is Annie still on? Yep. I Annie, did see can you Annie. answer that? Annie. She there? Well, I see. No, I know I she, uh, this is an unusual night for her. She really wasn't available and she made herself yeah. available. Yeah. So there will be, uh, I think we've already sent that all out to the board, but I can send it out again tomorrow and it will be sent to the public as well what those different protocols are when there's a case and how we work with the Department of Health in terms of the messaging that has to go home. So there will be conditions where a child has some symptoms and, uh, or maybe even a fever, and the department will say, well, just isolate that child. No one else has to do anything. So all of those are case specific. And <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Thanks for rejoining us. <laughs> so Christine, could you maybe ask your question again so Annie can hear it? Yeah, sure, I would. Um, so I know that we went through the protocols and kind of the notifications of the different, if somebody has a fever or if they're COVID positive, that we're going to be working with the Department of Health. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit more information on that communication, just because we're so used to currently getting, you know, an email that your child is in a classroom where somebody's been diagnosed with strap. And it seems that we would want a similar communication with this. Um, but I so just looking for clarification on, on what people and parents can expect. Yes, and I think what's important to know is this is a little bit different because, again, each situation, if we have a positive COVID test, is going to be looked at on its own merits. Um, and what's important to note is MDH will work with us to determine the different levels of risk. So when somebody has a potential exposure, they're looking at low risk levels, medium risk levels, and high risk levels. And when we have a COVID positive case, we are considering pe people to be symptomatic and, or excuse me, we're considering them to be contagious and, and infectious 48 hours before they have symptoms. So again, each case is going to be looked at on its own merits. So for example, if somebody hasn't been in school because they were out for whatever reason and weren't symptomatic for a period of time when they were still exposed to other students, that notification might look very different than if somebody was in school, developed symptoms, tested positive for COVID. Now we're looking at a different situation. So we're it, it won't be that blanket like you've just had an exposure. It's going to be very specific information about you were a low risk contact, you were a medium risk contact, you were a high risk contact, and here are our recommendations for what you need to do. That may, be, that may include, but might not be limited to quarantining. Um, so there are different components and each, that's where I, I kind of said each case, we really have to look at its own unique merits because it will result in different notifications because of different risk levels. Does that make Thank sense? You. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Annie. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, so seeing none, we have a motion on the table. So we are able to, if, if um, you are ready to go to a roll call vote or if somebody wanted to amend it to table, the current um, plan um, um, I think feel that you all, nobody is looking to make an amendment, so there's a motion on the table. We would be ready to go to a roll call vote. Before we do that, actually, I just want to say thank you one more time. Um, sorry, I'm going to interrupt here. Um, it's getting late, and I um, forgot to say my final thanks to everybody who contributed to all of the plans to help put forth 
the recommendation, the administration working with Dr. Peterson to put together the um, recommendation today. Thank you, Annie, for um, all of the work on our safety guidelines. Uh, it really is the parents and the staff working with all uh, in the seven hybrid, or I'm sorry, the seven school option plans that really help to bring us to the point where we're at today. So it really is the collaboration that we have between staff and parents and our um, administration. So many, many thanks. Um, it's not an easy decision. That is one thing that I will say. So here we are. Um, we have a motion on the table, and um, I, I, I think that we're ready to go to a roll call vote and keeping in mind that we're adopting the base plan learning model um, for 2021, 2020, 2021 school year um, and other COVID-19 related manners. Um, looking at the hybrid model that allows that most students in pre-K in grades K through five be in school and students in grades six through 12 be mostly virtual with some days in schools. So um, we are ready for a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Thank All you. All right, motion thank carries. And Dr. Peterson, I can't forget to say thank you to you for all your leadership um, with with uh, with um, the way we navigated um, collaborating to bring these plans to us today. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank All you, right, Mary. so um, motion carries. I imagine that at our next study session, Dr. Peterson, we will have more um, discussion on what it would look like should um, pl the plans need to be changed and more details worked out from there. So um, we will move on to our next agenda item, a little off on our timing of the agenda. So I apologize for those that um, are still tuning in with us, but we are gonna move on to the discussion of the goals. And that would be me. Give me one second. <laughs> All right, so every um, summer the school board gets together and um, we have our retreat to take a look at what our goals would be. And we um, had two retreat sessions taking a look at um, really what goals we want for 2021. And I am excited to share our draft proposals here today. And I thought we would start out by having um, each um, board or, or individual board members just talking about the four goals. So as of right now, there are four goals that are proposed and um, we have some draft. Um, so I was wondering if maybe Mark Ambrosian, you could start out with goal one, um, talking about uh, student well-being, a little bit about why we came where we are and if you wanted to read the goal as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, goal number one uh, will continue to be student well-being. Um, the board believes that the district has made um, great strides in um, identifying and providing training and supporting our students and families in this goal. Uh, we also realize that this is a goal that will never be finished because we will always be striving to continue to improve, identify gaps, and to take care of our students and parents in well-being. Uh, so that is why, um, overwhelmingly, we voted to return this goal to the number one goal of the district. So I'll read it again. Um, goal number one, student well-being. In pursuit of child-centered excellence, the well being of students is a continuing priority for families in the district. In 2020 2021, the district will continue the development and implementation of a plan that supports families' desires to have their students be socially and emotionally strong and provides the necessary level of support to students for their academic, social, and emotional well being. The district will continue to foster 
and promote positive student well-being efforts and identify leading causes of issues that have a detrimental effect on student well-being. Updates on the implementation and recommendations will be presented to the board in October, January, and May, and will include recommendations from the evaluation of student and family well-being that was completed in 2019-2020. The completion of the student and parent focus groups identified in the evaluation of student and family well-being. Incorporating key recommendations from the Mental Health Advisory Committee. We'll have ongoing staff training to give all staff the support, resources, tools, and training needed. And the district will develop quantifiable measurements to evaluate student well-being and the impact of Minnetonka's efforts within our scope and boundaries as a public institution. Um, does anybody, let's see, I think, um, let's do it goal by goal. Does anybody have any comments on this goal before we move on to the second goal? Does anybody have any uh, questions, comments, tweaking that you wanted, or um, tweaking of the verbiage that you wanted to, to have on goal one? Let's see, do I see all of you? Okay. All right, um, so we can move along to our second goal that we have put together um, this evening, which is excellence and belonging, diversity, equity, and in inclusion. And Lisa Wagner, would you talk a little bit about goal two, please? Um, sure, this is a goal that is very important to us as well. Um, and we talked a lot about how, how um, an important part of well-being is, is also belonging. Hey, Lisa, and you, we you, you're talked cutting about out. The importance of, of delivering excellence to all, all students. Is it coming across like that? On uh, Regardless, of should I have her stop? Hey, Lisa, can you stop for a second? We have to um, reload the meeting. Hey, Lisa, I think it's me. She is, looks like she's talking. And discovering new strategies for closing all achievement gaps. We believe that students who feel a sense of belonging or connectedness to their school are more likely to experience success inside and outside the classroom. Belonging is defined in this goal as a strong feeling of positive connection, acceptance, and importance as a member of the Minnetonka Schools community. We are dedicated to working tirelessly to providing a school environment where all students feel safe, welcome, supported, and accepted. The Minnetonka School Board has developed a series of measurable, meaningful, and intentional action steps below for the district to promote belonging in our school. We are committed to action and to making necessary changes. We look forward to partnering with students, parents, staff, and community members on this important work. It will not be done in isolation and will require thoughtful consideration. The school board and district leadership will listen with compassion, examine our own biases, and determine what we also can do to help ensure all students, families, and staff feel safe and accepted. We will be a part of the solution, lead by example, and continue to listen and learn. Our commitment to belonging and child-centered excellence will be the foundation for all of our efforts. This will be a multi-year endeavor. 
In the 2021 school year, the district will publish the Minnetonka Commitment for Excellence and Belonging, which will detail the district's beliefs and commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence. This will be completed by September of 2020. And this will be our statement to the community about the importance of this effort. The district will publish an action plan, resource guide, and website for these efforts. The initial resources will be available by September of 2020, and updates will be made throughout the school year. This will include, but will not be limited to, sharing the work done through the Barriers to Success and Reimagine Minnesota programs. We will conduct an in-depth review of the board vision and district policies numbers 504, 514, 534, 604, and 607. And I just wanna briefly, for the benefit of people watching at home, because you might not have them, uh, read the titles of these policies. Policy 504 is our student dress and grooming code. Uh, that would be where things like hate symbols and, and, um, and undress would be covered. Uh, policy 514, which is the bullying prohibition policy. Policy 534, which is equal educational opportunity. Policy 604, which is inclusive educational program. And policy 607, which is controversial topics and materials and the school program. And so those will all be reviewed using a lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence. Reports, uh, the next bullet is reports on the efforts of the Committee on Belonging. Reports will be delivered to the school board in October of 2020, February of 2021, and May of 2021. These reports will include recommendations for actions. This will also include an addition of committees for the elementary and middle school levels. The next bullet is to evaluate the curriculum review process and our policy 606, which is instructional material review, selection, and use to ensure it embraces, embraces diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence. This will be completed by December of 2020 and brought to the board for approval. The revised process will be utilized in curriculum review work beginning in January of 2021. We're also directing that materials be added as appropriate where there are gaps in the curriculum in the interim. Um, this allows us to bring in diverse perce perspectives and not just have Eurocentric uh, teachings. We will conduct a minimum of two mandatory training sessions for all staff, students, and school board members. This will be regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence. One session will be completed in each semester. The district will incorporate training in uh, staff and school board onboarding activity. The next bullet is to develop an action plan to partner with students, parents, staff, alumni, and community members. This may include efforts such as listening sessions, surveys, reporting tools, and follow-up mechanisms. A system to report issues and concerns with diversity, equity, and inclusion will also be included. And this is a way for us to have a partnership to create a positive learning environment for all. The next bullet is to determine a staff resource or resources in each building to support belonging initiatives. We will ensure that students are aware and have access to these resources. And the last bullet on this goal is to review hiring activities to further promote hiring staff with diverse backgrounds, particularly people who are BIPOC and LGBTQIA+, to enrich our learning environment for all students by way of diversified perspectives, identities, and experiences. We will conduct a minimum of three recruiting activities aimed specifically at this effort. Thing um, to add to goal to comments, question, any changes in the wording? Okay, no, there was one addition that I wanted to make and I wanted to put it past um, put it past you all for consideration is really when we're talking about that definition of belonging. So it's in that first paragraph, um, second to last sentence that says belonging is defined in the goal in this goal as a strong feeling of positive connection, acceptance and importance as 
importance as a member of the Minnetonka schools community. And I would like to add from there, um, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, um, um, I'm knowing missing, um, I'm sorry, it's 1130. But I would like to define that a, a little bit more here in that belonging uh, goal or in that belonging definition. So I had down race, gender, um, sexual orientation, um, religion, sorry, that, that was um, another one. Does anybody have any other? Country of origin. <laughs> country of origin. Thank you. Socioeconomic status. Go ahead, Lisa. I could, didn't hear that. Socioeconomic status. Okay. Do, do these need to be in a specific order? <laughs> because I'm, my notes are going around in a circle here. Does anybody have anything else to add there? Okay. So, Carrie, for the record here, can we say community, um, Minnetonka schools community, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, country of origin, and socioeconomic status? So, that would be my um, addition there. Um, so, does anybody else have any comments on goal two? Oh, okay, thank you, Lisa, for um, reading and explaining. Um, we had a slight tech uh, glitch in here, so I didn't hear the beginning of it, but I'm, I'm assuming everybody else was able to hear what was going on. Can you nod if you heard the beginning? Okay, okay, great. Um, um, let's move on to goal three, which is the district strategic plan. Um, that, yes, Chris, that was you. Can you go ahead? <laughs> I, re I remember. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, goal three is really a continuation of uh, the 2019-2020 goal uh, that we had last year and really means to deliver on the work that was uh, really completed last year. Uh, this work needs to be compiled into a strategic plan and communicated out to the board to staff, to the community, uh, to everybody. So goal three is a district strategic plan. Create and publish a five-year strategic plan for the district with a specific lens toward the implication of flattening enrollment and the state imposed levy cap. Uh, updates, update will be presented for review by April, 2021, uh, including new learnings. Key components should include space and capacity plans for students, classrooms, and non-instructional spaces, facility upkeep and maintenance plans uh, for education and non-instructional spaces, technology plan for fixed assets or infrastructure, and variable student, staff, vendors, needs, and expenses. Curriculum that uh, demonstrably meets meeting the needs of tomorrow's workforce, uh, a district budget that considers the effects of enrollment trends, facility needs, and provides options that deal with fluctuations of state and local funding and enrollment. Thank you, Chris. Does anybody have any comments, changes to goal three? One thing I should have added, uh, Katie, yep. is um, we, changed a little the, the focus of this goal to be a little more narrow uh, to a five-year plan, I should have noted. Uh, um, I think we looked at a 10-year plan for some of this stuff. And as we've gotten the materials back and really talked uh, at length about this goal, um, it, you know, it was, it, we really decided to, to kind of narrow the scope that projecting five years out, uh, knowing with what we know now is going to be difficult enough uh, and that, that a full 10 years wasn't. So if there was anybody that's looking at last year's goal uh, and comparing, we, we, we did uh, specifically narrow the focus to five years. Thank you, that's a great point. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and the, the only thing too, yeah, that was an excellent point. The only thing I would also just echo is that we, we did um, slot this in for, for April. 
Um, so we, we just because we knew that, you know, implementing the new plan, uh, you know, of, of coming back to school was going to be a significant undertaking with a, with a lot of work that needs to be done. Again, not to say that this strategic plan is significantly important. It was just, again, um, kind of stage gating things. So that was another thing that we discussed at, at length. And uh, again, settled on that uh, April 2021 20, uh, is the kind of a report out of, of progress to be made. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments um, around goal three? All right, let's move to goal four, which is the multimodal learning. John, will you take yeah. this one, please? Absolutely. So knowing that we were going to be in this um, multimodal learning, uh, of, you know, environment this year, we really decided to take an intense um, focus on this and make it one of our key four goals. And so the well, intention of this goal is knowing that we have this um, this very diverse learning environment across all of our grades, we're going to stay close to this board and really continue to work with the administration, the teachers, the parents, and the students to make sure we can deliver an outstanding excellence education and so the specific aspects of this goal there's actually um, I'll read the paper there's actually five specific points of this goal so the goal states in pursuit of child-centered excellence Minnetonka schools will expand the implementation of personalized learning for students and continue to develop ways to personalize instructions to meet unique needs abilities and interests of all our students families and staff The initial implementation and progress report will be presented in the back to school report in October 2020 with additional progress reports as needed. So five points to this goal. Point one is develop a schedule for instruction that encompasses the health and policy directives of the state of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Education. And as a, as a side note, those Goals can be found in the Stay Safe Minnesota um, uh, PDF on the state site. And the second goal is adapt the Minnetonka curriculum to enable students to achieve their highest potential while adapting the learning environment to meet the needs of both the educational process and the needs of the families while best supporting child-centered excellence. Point three. Edu educational content should be expected to be delivered in a multimodal fashion, leveraging the success of the Tonka online system, which is in its sixth year, as well as blended in-person model and taking into consideration the needs and abilities of all educational process constituents. Point four, the district will have plans in place to quickly identify student learners who need additional educational or mental health support and will create alternative methods to support their educational achievement. And point five, the district will adapt current plans and support structures to take into consideration students' unique needs across academics, social, emotional, belonging, and mental health aspects of the educational process. John? John? Yes. Oops. There's a delay in here. Sorry, are you done? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments, questions, or changes on goal four? No. All right. Oh, go ahead, Christine. I don't have a comment on goals one through four, but I did, I did have a comment um, about another thing. Am I able to say that now, or should I wait? No, go for it. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to say, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion on the goals and given what this year is going to look like, um, you know, we, we obviously had to narrow, narrow down some of those. We had a lot more that weren't or aren't going to be officially included as goals. And I just wanted to address the communication because that was something that we had talked a lot about was having communication as a goal. But given the situation of what school looks like this year and some other very important things that came up that we decided needed to be official goals. I just did want to not let go the work that we did on communication and we're talking about, um, for example, you know, 
communication is very important and we think it's even more important in this upcoming year due to all the uncertainty and the potential changes with school. I mean, we talked in depth about having a communication goal, but given the challenges of this year, we made it thought it made sense to concentrate on other areas. That said, as a board, we continue to be committed to improving how we communicate. That's what we talked about in our goal setting session. Um, you know, we hope to be intentional in promoting and ensure and ensuring timely, relevant and respectful communication to the target audiences. In addition, I hope we can create additional opportunities to encourage community participation, such as listening sessions. So because we did spend a lot of time talking about that, but it didn't make it to the official goals, I just wanted to be sure that, that we had that out there. Absolutely, thank you. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and so just one um, additional comment. So in the spirit of multimodal learning, I would just like to thank and recognize our sign language leaders for being with us for six hours tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Christina, I wanted to piggyback off what you what you said um, in regards to communications. When we drafted the goals, there were six goals that we had, but just due to the gravity of this year and knowing that we're there's a very good chance that we're not going to stick with one learning model this year. We really needed to par it down. So even with all of those points that you had in communication, um, we as a board are committed to um, really standing by and do implementing those things. It, it just didn't um, elevate to board goal level. In addition to the other goal that we drafted was around our strategic programs that were um, um, Tonka Online and, oh, we're getting, oh, experiential Momentum. learning and inquiry-based learning, all the way, all, all the things that we do in Minnetonka and um, that is that that momentum behind those programs are not going to stop but we decided that um, and we know that six goals would be way too much to operate in this year so we really parted it down to four which are four hefty goals and we um, we are uh, we're not going to stop our commitment to the strategic programs and communication. So absolutely, um, it's good to point out and we're committed to it. It just, it didn't reach board goal level this year. And does anybody else have any comments? The only other thing that I wanted to say is in, in building these goals, um, student well-being, um, our belonging goal, and um, um, the multimodal learning, and and even we can say the strategic plan the the board has met with multiple groups and individuals community members stakeholders staff everybody has given us input and really it is that input um, and those conversations that we had to really help draft and write and guide the goals so we also want to thank those individuals that have reached out to us in this um, I, unless there's anything else that anybody would like to add in tonight's goals, I think we can move to adopt the goals with that one change that we have on goal two. Does anybody else have anything before we move to a roll call vote? Lisa, go ahead. Um, we need a motion. Thank you. <laughs> can I? <laughs> Hi, Mike, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay so Mike's our motion. I saw, I saw. Or do you have a question? I, I, I think I made the motion. I was just going to say I so. <laughs> I was just going to say I so move uh, the the goals as stated with the amendum uh, amendum that you added to it. Okay, thank you. So that Lisa, you're our second now. Thank you, thank you. So now we can move to a roll call vote. Oh boy. <laughs> Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board Member Becker. Aye. Board Member Holcomb. Aye. Board Member Lesage. Aye. Board Member Ritchie. Aye. Board Member Vitali. Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. All, all right, motion carries. I'm very excited to have our board goals put together for this year. Um, 
So thank you. So, um, moving on, and hopefully I'll get my motions and my um, roll call vote here on, as we go on this roll. So um, Dr. Peterson, let's move along to the approval of AP, IB, supplemental, and new course materials. Dr. Madam Peterson. Chair, members of the board, uh, you've reviewed these materials, and I know Mr. Urbanski is waiting to present, but I don't see any reason to have a presentation. You just uh, uh, you, you need to approve the materials you've already seen. All right, so may I have a motion to approve the APIB supplemental and new course materials as presented? Uh, Mark, thank you. Chris, second, thank you. Um, any comments, questions, uh, or discussion for Mr. Urbanski? Okay, seeing none, thank you for sticking around with us this entire night, <laughs> Mr. Urbanski. <laughs> um, we're gonna move to a roll call vote. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye, oppose nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Board Member Holcomb. Aye. Board Member Lesage. Aye. Board Member Ritchie. Aye. Board Member Vitale. Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. Um, we can move along to the acceptance of a uh, bid for Colstead property demolition, Dr. Peterson. Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm going to have Mr. Bourgeois just say something briefly on this item. Uh, Mr. Bourgeois. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peterson. I'll uh, dispense with uh, reading the uh, whole lease document. Um, we have the acceptance of bid for the Colstead uh, property demolition, and uh, we received actually nine bids uh, at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, July 28th. And we got an incredibly low bid from H&T Trucking in, in the amount of $48,000. So the good news about that is the $1,250,000 that we issued uh, for acquisition and then uh, site demolition or site work is, uh, we'll, we'll basically have spent uh, just under a million dollars on it. We'll have spent about um, 1,097,000, or sorry, we'll have spent about 976,000. So we'll have about 224 to, $225,000 left over in bond proceeds. And uh, that can be used based on the covenants of the bonds uh, for, a few, you know, for future work on the site. Uh, so whether that's for a future uh, building construction, we have three years to do that, uh, to use up the bond proceeds by uh, uh, fiscal, by the end of uh, fiscal year 23. So June 30th of 23. So we recommend that you would uh, approve the uh, little bit of H&T trucking in the amount of $48,000 for demolition of the structures on the uh, Colstead property at 5735 County Road 101. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the bid for Colstead property demolition as presented? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, John, for the second. Any comments or questions for Mr. Bourgeois? Go ahead, just, Chris. Just, with such a span in the bids, is there any reason to believe that they missed some sort of scope of work or something like, like that. I mean, I, I realize they're bound to a contract and you give them the same scope of work. But, you know, we, I just haven't seen such a huge span in, in something like this. Uh, yeah, we were very surprised. You notice that the, there was a group of bids between 69.9 uh, and 86.7, so a little bit tighter. But uh, we called, and, and when we have a, a, a low bid that's out of uh, what seems to be unusually low, we typically, even though we don't have to because they have to put a bid bond in, we typically will call the vendor and just say, are you sure your numbers are good? And uh, so on, on occasion on other bids, when we were building things, we had a few things like that and they, were, they said, oh, we missed something. In this situation, we call them, they said, no, we're good to go. And in fact, they have a, uh, they have a, a, a loader on, or a, a backhoe on site and they're ready to go. So, um, I, uh, I, I, I don't know how it was kind of uh, Riley saying that um, maybe they're going to avoid the tipping fees by loading up their dump truck and then driving as fast as they can around 494 and 694. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, regardless, $48,000 and they say they can do it for that. And so we'll take it. That's great. Thanks, Paul. That's great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? 
All right, let's move to a roll call vote, please. When I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board Member Ambrosen? Aye. Board Member Becker? Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitali? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. Have fun demoing, Mr. Bourgeois. <laughs> 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 All right, let's move on to the authoriz authorization of sale of 2020 G general obligation long term facilities maintenance bonds. Dr. Peterson? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm going to have Mr. Bourgeois explain the uh, bids on that quickly. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peterson, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, this uh, $4,950,000 bond is the, um, uh, is the, is the uh, it's not the OPEB bonds that came up on screen. It's this is the long term facility maintenance bonds that uh, we're issuing for work on next uh, next summer uh, for the projects that are approved in a long term facility maintenance plan. So uh, we'll be selling these uh, really quickly, and then because um, we're actually starting to work on on design of the of the lot of the major projects to try to get some good pricing out there because construction is actually slowing down. Uh, but we're, we're estimating that we should be able to sell these at 1.95%. So uh, we'll see how things hold out with the interest rates. So we'd ask for your approval to sell these bonds. Uh, thank you. Great. Can I have a motion, please, to approve the authorization of sale of 2020 G general obligation long-term facilities maintenance bonds as presented? Thank you, Mark. Is there a second? Lisa, thank you. Um, any comments or questions for Mr. Bourgeois? All right, okay, so we can move on to a roll call vote, please. Your name, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board Member Ambrosen. Aye. Board Member Becker. Aye. Board Member Holcomb. Aye. Board Member Lesage. Aye. Board Member Ritchie. Aye. Board Member Vitali. Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. Let's move Thank along you. to the authorization of reimbursement resolution for 2020 D general obligation long-term facilities maintenance bonds. Dr. Peterson. Madam Chair, members of the board, I'll have Mr. Bourgeois explain this one. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Madam Chair, members of the board, this is actually a companion board item to the one that you just approved. Uh, what this is, is uh, uh, it allows us to utilize the bond proceeds to incur, uh, to pay for any of the costs that are incurred before the actual sale date. Uh, and basically what, what that allows us to do is make sure that the architect and engineering costs for the work that's being done on our roofing projects, our mechanical projects, our paving projects, those larger projects that are in process right now, um, we basically can pay for them out of the bond proceeds. We, it's a technicality that we have to have it to comply with uh, federal regulations regarding uh, um, tax exempt bonds. All right, thank you. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the authorization of reimbursement resolution for 2020 G general obligation long-term facilities maintenance bonds as presented? Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Thank you, Mike. Uh, any comments or questions for Mr. Bourgeois? No, I see shaking heads, no. All right, we can move to a roll call vote. When I call your name, if in favor, please say aye, oppose nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board Member Becker? Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitali? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. So we're going to move along to the next authorization, which is the sale of 2020 I certificates of participation refunding bonds. Dr. Peterson? Madam Chair? The board. Uh, I'll have Mr. Bourgeois explain this one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pearson, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, we're asking you for authorization to refund the 2014 B certificates of participations. Uh, uh, they were initially issued to as one tranche of two to pay for all the kindergarten uh, editions back in 2014. And uh, uh, so they're coming up to their call date. And this is actually the smaller of the two tranches. Uh, uh, actually, a year from now, we'll be doing the 2014 Cs. Uh, but we're, we asked for the opportunity to refund them based on uh, current interest rates 
Um, it's a it's a smaller issue, but we're going to have a net present value savings of one hundred thousand eight hundred and twenty dollars, uh, and we're going to be dropping the interest rates from an estimated from well, from the current three point nine four percent down to two point five three percent. So uh, we ask that you approve that so that we can hopefully sell and, and accrue those savings for the uh, for for the district and the taxpayers. All right, thank you. May I have a motion to approve the authorization of of sale of 2020 I certificate certificates of participation refunding bonds. Um, boy, John, I think was the first and Lisa, you'll be the second. Thank you. Any comments or questions? All right. Oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment to thank Paul. I mean, I really appreciate how he keeps track of all these bonds. You know, we go through that ladder schedule, I think once or twice a year, and there's gotta be 40 or 50 bonds out there that you keep track of and really making sure you manage those call dates uh, closely to find ways to refund and resell those bonds in a way that saves, in this case, as you said, $100,000 of taxpayer money, uh, which is just great. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely, Thank you. absolutely. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the challenge. <laughs> All right, let's move on to a roll call vote, please. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye, oppose nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board Member Becker? Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitali? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right. Motion carries. Moving on to the authorization of sale for 2021A OPEB. Um, no, OP, yeah. A general obligation refunding bonds, Dr. Peterson. So, uh, Mr. Holcomb, I would tell you that uh, some people dream of sheep jumping over a fence. Mr. Bourgeois dreams of bonds shifting around and his color charts changing colors. So. <laughs> right. Uh, I need to get along. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, <laughs> I would like to have Mr. Bourgeois uh, talk to you about uh, the authorized sale of the uh, OPEB bonds. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Madam Chair, members of the board, I just have a really short uh, presentation on this one because this one's a little complicated. It's actually the second time we're refunding the original OPEB bonds from 2009. So next slide, please, Mike, quickly. Um, we originally issued our OPEB bonds in the middle of the financial meltdown uh, before the Great Recession. And uh, we got we issued the bonds at 6.83% and 6.24% to fund our OPEB trust. And that's been a really uh, a, a big positive for the district. We've actually been able to have the OPEB trust so far pay for about $7.5 million of expenses that otherwise would not have been, have, would have had to been paid out of the general fund. So, uh, you know, it, I know it's a lot of things that shift around, but you can look at part of our fund balance in the general fund as being the fact that we have seven and a half million dollars paid uh, picking up some of these uh, other post-employment benefit charges over the years. Um, but we were able to refund uh, the, uh, the bonds actually in 2013 and 2016, we uh, dropped the payments down from those interest rates you see there down to cut them and cut it in, into about half. When we did the 2013 e-refunding, we actually saved, had a net present value savings of 2.251 million uh, and, and about 100,000 on the 2016 J's there. So. Now we actually are able to come around again and refund the 2013 E. So if you go to the next slide, Mike, please. Um, this was our this was the bond structure that was originally set up back in 2008, 2009. And, and we had this unusual structure for a couple of reasons. Uh, people wanted the maturities at that point in time that way, but also um, we were we we continually work to layer in bonds. Uh, within our existing debt so that we kind of basically keep our, our long-term debt payments relatively flat. And um, and so the intention has always been to restructure these bonds when we get got up to the call date. We're actually going to be doing an advance refunding as opposed to a current refunding. Uh, so we're, we're refunding a year ahead of the call date. Uh, but the thing is, is right now interest rates are the lowest they've been in a long, long time. Like the 10-year treasury was at 0.59% and with inflation, it actually has a negative return. Um, and so rates are really low, so it made uh, made it uh, judicious for us to look at an advance refunding. And so the the uh, the other thing about this is, if we did did not do a refunding, you'd see that the uh, uh, 
the on the 23 um uh, i'm sorry the 22 pay 23 levy for fiscal 24 i'm sorry i, I got that wrong on the 23 pay 24 levy for fiscal 25 we'd be having about a million and a half dollar increase which would be about a, a five about a three percent increase on the overall levy by itself um so that that's another reason to do it but it's but we're doing it because we originally planned to do this um and so it's the time to do it and so mike if you go to the last slide please so when we finish with this restructuring we'll, we'll just keep the payments flat but uh this bond structure will actually be a four hundred eleven thousand dollars net present value savings and we've got another call date in here um 20 2006 2026 five years out and so um we're going to get one more bite at the apple on this yet so uh we'd ask you to allow us to uh, uh receive or re let us uh restructure this we're hoping to drop the interest rate from 3.09 percent to an estimated 1.99 with a net present value savings of four hundred eleven thousand dollars I have a motion to approve the authorization of sale of 2021 a OPEB general obligation refunding bonds way too many hands um, Lisa I think you were first um, Mark I think you were second thank you very much and um, any comments or question for Mr. Bourgeois? Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say that oh. Paul's been working so hard. He, he may want, do you want a, you probably want a glass like this, don't you, Paul, just to, to celebrate all your hard work? <laughs> I'd actually rather have a hat with the horns and the braids. <laughs> that, that could be arranged. <laughs> um, Paul, if you'll wear it, I'll buy it. <laughs> Paul, quick question. Um, so by doing the advance re refunding before the call date, is there any penalty to that? Or can we always uh, do it? Well, that's a good question. question. Um, we have to do taxable as opposed to tax exempt. Okay. Uh, to do an advance refunding. Yeah. So but the thing is, is if we, it's kind of like a bird in hand on this one versus one of the bush. The rates are so low that even though we're doing taxable, we're getting a huge drop. Yeah. And I mean, you never know. There, I mean, there's nothing to say that we couldn't wait a year and do a taxable, but we might end up in the same spot or worse. Sure. So it's kind of kind of like let's take this and and you know put it in the bank and uh, call it a win. Absolutely, and I just want to echo John's uh, point from from, from the, the last one and just publicly thank you for uh, really staying on top of this. Uh, you know, the innovative and, and you, you always being on top of of all of these bonds and all of our finances is really. Uh, a huge uh, test to the district and, and a huge benefit. So thank you. Well, thank you. Just rolling the boat. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, um, we can move to a roll call vote. Please, Carrie. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitale? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the resolution of, uh, resolution approving joining opioid lawsuit. Dr. Peterson? Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, I provided you with the uh, details on this uh, lawsuit. Uh, it's a national uh, firm that's representing several clients that are, uh, you know, they're trying to get uh, damages for educational costs and all, and uh, that have resulted from, uh, uh, you know, parents having students affected by op op opioid uh, uh, abuse, uh, perhaps employees. Uh, we think there are damages in the district, and there's no upfront cost to the uh, district if there's uh, success in gaining uh, a favorable judgment. Uh, the attorneys would be paid, and then uh, district, along with other clients, would receive some proceeds. All right. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the resolution approving joining opioid lawsuit as presented? Christine, thank you. Lisa, thank you for the second. Are there any comments or questions for Dr. Peterson? All right. Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, just, you know, Dr. Peterson, we typically join these types of things. You always sort of give us 
to guidance about how long, you know, sort of where's the windy road through the legal process. And so about, where do you think this is? Like, give us the next 6, 12, 24 months. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard to know what the timeline will be. You know, judges always set those. And uh, with this, uh, you know, the current pandemic, why I think courts have really slowed down how they're handling cases. So it's kind of hard to guess at that. Okay. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Oh, seeing none, we can move to a roll call vote. Please, Carrie. Board member, do I call your name? If in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Motion carries. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Lisa, thank you. Can we move to a roll call vote, please, Carrie? Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Do we have any board reports this evening? Christine? Don't hate me. I know we all want to go, but I did want to just say that I listened into the um, the seek meeting notes, and I just wanted to commend the job that everybody's been doing this summer and last spring. They continued out evaluations throughout e-learning and through the summer. Um, they finished all the speech evaluations. They did a lot more, um, and they were really integral in a lot of the planning for what the fall would look like to make sure that our special ed students aren't at. So I wanted to recognize that. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Does anybody else have any other board updates? Okay. Um, Dr. Peterson, the superintendent's report. Uh, I have a brief report. Obviously, you're aware now that we're getting ready for next year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have those plans and plus the uh, goals. So we pretty well have uh, the way to start our school year. Um, We've actually had our administrative retreat today and tomorrow. So we're running that uh, again tomorrow. And the MSBA uh, conference is going on in the evenings virtually this week. And next week will be the uh, Commissioner of Education's conference virtually. So doing those and of course we'll be doing a ton of uh, planning now to get the details of the plan all put together. That's great. Great, and we'll look forward to that communication. You bet. I know the, I know the community will too. Yep. Wonderful. Um, does anybody have any announcements this evening? Mike. Yeah, this is, I'd like to just thank Carrie for reading all those community comments. Um, she did it flawlessly and announced all the names properly. So I think we have a new candidate for if we need a graduation um, speaker, you know, she can, she can read the names after in graduation too. So hats off. Cause that was a long list of community comments that you went through. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the kind words. <laughs> you did a great job. Thank Christine. You. I just wanted to thank everybody for all the work, um, on these options and, and to everybody who's, who helped with the feedback and stuff like that. And then I also wanted to thank Jeff, although I don't see him online anymore. Um, I thought the graduation ceremony was amazing and got so many comments about how thankful a lot of the seniors families were for the closure and I think pulling that off was was really great and I was glad we were able to do that. So although Jeff's not online. Thank you, Jeff and everybody else who who helped make that happen. 
Thanks, Christine. That was a that was the announcement that I wanted to add into also. So I also, in addition to graduation, Jeff and his team at the high school, I really want to um, say thank you to Andy and John and Julie. The the, the crew behind the production of the event was above and beyond. So um, I I actually heard comments from fr f friends saying what an amazing production. So really, hats off to the team, and I wanted to say thank you to them as well. Does anybody else have any announcements this evening? All right, well, I also, one last one before we adjourn, I wanna extend a big thank you to our two outstanding interpreters this evening. We really appreciate that they were able to be here tonight to help interpret for our uh, staff and families. So thank you to them also. Yes, bravo, bravo. All right, so may I have a motion to adjourn? Lisa, thank you. Uh, Christine, a second. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Last one. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right, meeting adjourned. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Katie. Peterson. Thanks, Dr. Peterson. Yeah, thank you. Way to go, board members.